Chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 5 of Junior Classics, Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 5. The Story of Arion, by Sir George W. Cox. A long time ago, in the great city of Corinth, there lived a man whose name was Arion, and he made beautiful music on a golden harp, which all the people flocked to listen to. Men and women, boys and girls, all came to hear Arion play and sing. And when his songs were ended, they gave him money, and Arion became a rich man. When he had lived for a long time in the house of Periandros, who was called the tyrant of Corinth. He thought that he would like to see some new places, which he had never seen before. So he went into a ship and asked the sailors to take him to Sicily and Italy. They sailed over the blue sea a long way for many days and weeks, and came to many towns where Arion played and sang and got more money, till at last he came to Terras where he stayed a long time, because it was a rich and beautiful city, and all the people who came to hear him gave him plenty of money. By and by, Arion thought that he had enough, and he began to wish to see Corinth and his friend Periandros once more. He went down to the beach and said that he wanted a ship to take him back to Corinth, and that he would only go with Corinthians because he thought the men of Corinth better than the men of any other place. Just then there was drawn up on the beach a ship which had come from Corinth, and the sailors told him that they were Corinthians and would take him home again. So Arion promised to go with them, and he sent down his harp and all his boxes full of fine clothes and gold and silver to be put on board the ship. When the sailors saw the boxes and felt how heavy they were, they said to each other, What a rich man he must be! Would it not be pleasant to have only a little of all this money, which has been given to Arion, for playing on a harp? The next day, Arion came down to the shore and went into the ship. It was a beautiful day. There was scarcely a cloud in the sky, and there was a fresh breeze, just strong enough to fill the sails and move the ship gently through the water. The waves danced and shone like gold in the bright sunshine, while the ship tossed up the white foam as she sailed merrily on towards Corinth. So they went on many days, for Arion sat at the head of the ship to see how it cut through the water, and as they passed, one place after another, he thought that they would soon reach Corinth. But the sailors in the ship were wicked men. They had seen the large boxes full of money which Arion had brought with him into the ship, and now they made up their mind to kill him and take his gold and silver. So one day, while he was sitting at the bow of the ship and looking down on the dark blue sea, three or four of the sailors came up to him and said that they were going to kill him. Now Arion knew that they said this because they wanted his money, so he promised to give them all that he had, if they would spare his life, but they would not. Then he asked them to let him play once more on his harp, and sing one of the songs which he loved the best, and he said that when it was finished he would leap into the sea. When they had given him leave to do this, Arion put on a beautiful dress, took his harp in his hand, and stood up to sing. And as he sang, 
the sailors began to feel sorry that they were going to kill him, because they would have no more of his sweet music when he was dead. But when they thought of all the gold and silver which Arion was taking to Corinth, they made up their minds that they would not let him live. And Arion took one last look at the bright and sunny sky, and then leaped into the sea, and the sailors saw him no more. The ship sailed on merrily over the dark water, just as though it were not carrying so many wicked men to Corinth. But Arion was not drowned. A great fish called a dolphin was swimming by the ship when Arion leaped over, and it caught him on its back and swam away with him towards Corinth, much faster than the ship could sail. On and on the great fish swam, cutting through the foam of the sea which was tossed up over Arion. And by and by he saw at a distance the high cliffs and peaks, which he knew were the cliffs and peaks above Corinth. So presently the fish came close to the shore and left Arion on the beach and swam away again into the deep sea. Arion was cold and tired with being so long in the water, and he could hardly crawl up into the city as far as the house where Periandros the tyrant lived. At last he reached the house and was taken into the great hall where Periandros was sitting. And when he saw Arion, Periandros rose up and came to meet him and said, Why, Arion, what is all this? Your clothes are dripping with water. I thought you were coming to Corinth from Sicily in a ship, but you look more as if you had been in the sea than in a ship. Did you swim here through the water? Then Arion told him all the story, how he had left Terrace in a ship with Corinthian men whom he had hired to bring him home, how they had tried to kill him that they might take his money and how the dolphin had brought him to the shore when they made him leap from the ship into the sea. But Periandros did not believe this story, and said to Arion, You cannot make me think that this strange tale is true. Who ever swam on a dolphin's back before? So he told his servants to give Arion all that he wanted, but not to let him go until the ship in which he had left Terrace came to Corinth. Two days afterwards, Arion was standing by the side of Periandros and looking out over the sea. Presently he saw the white sails of a ship which was sailing into the harbor with a gentle breeze from the west. As it came nearer and nearer, Arion thought that it looked very like his own ship until at last he was able to see from the colors on its prow that it was the very ship in which he had been sailing. Then he said to Periandros, See, they are come at last, and now go send for these sailors, and see whether I have not told you the truth. So Periandros sent down fifty soldiers with swords and spears and shields to bring up all the sailors from the ship. The ship was sailing in merrily towards the shore, and the soft west wind filled out its white sails as it cut through the water. As they looked on the beautiful land to which they were coming, they thought of all the things which they should be able to buy with Arion's gold and silver, and how they would do nothing but eat and drink and be merry as soon as they got out of the ship. So when they came to the beach, they let down the sails, lowered the masts, and threw out ropes from the stern to fasten the ship to the shore. They never thought that the fifty soldiers, whose spears and shields were shining gaily in the sunshine, had been sent on purpose to take them, and they could not make out why it was. As soon as they came out from the ship upon the dry land, the soldiers said that they must all go as quickly as they could to the house of Periandros. Ten of the soldiers stayed behind to guard the ship, while the rest led the sailors to the palace. When they were brought before him, Periandros spoke to them kindly, and asked them from what place they had come, and the sailors said that they had come from Italy, from the great city of Terrace. When Periandros said, 
If you have come from Italy, perhaps you can tell me something about my friend Arion. A long time ago he left Corinth, and said that he was going to Sicily and Italy, and I cannot think why he should be away so long, for if the people have given him as much money for his music as they did here, he must now be a very rich man. Then the sailors said, Yes, we can tell you about Arion. We left him quite safe in Terrace, where everyone wanted to hear him sing. But he said that he should not come to Corinth until they had given him more gold and silver and made him a richer man. Just as they were telling this lie, the door of the room was open, and Arion himself walked in. And Periandros turned round to the sailors and said, See, here is the man whom you left quite safe and well at Terrace. How dare you tell me so great a lie? Now I know that Arion has told me the truth, and that you wished to kill him, and made him leap into the sea. But the dolphin caught him as he fell, and brought him here on his back. And now listen to me. Of all Arion's gold and silver, you shall have none. Everything that was his, you shall give back to him and I shall take away your ship, and everything in it, which belongs to you, because you wish to rob and kill Arion. Then the soldiers came, and turned these wicked sailors into the street, and drove them on, calling to the people to come, and see the men who had sought to murder Arion. And all came out of their houses, and hooted at the sailors as they passed by until they were ready to sink down with fear and shame. So Periandros took their ship, and gave back to Arion all his gold and silver, and what he loved better than his riches, his golden harp, and every one came to hear the wonderful tale of Arion and the dolphin. And Arion made a large statue out of stone to look like a man on a dolphin's back, and placed it on Cape Teneron, that the people might never forget how the dolphin saved Arion when he leaped into the sea. End of chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome Part 5 Recording by Peter Strom in Sabetha, Kansas June 12, 2018「Chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome Part 6 of Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton Chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome Part 6 The Battle of the Frogs and the Mice by Sir George W. Cox A thirsty mouse, who had just escaped from a weasel, was drinking from a pool of water when a croaking frog saw him and said, Stranger, when hast thou come to our shore? And who is thy father? Tell me the truth and deceive me not, for if thou deservest it, I will lead thee to my house, and give thee rich and beautiful gifts. My name is Puffcheek, and I rule over the frogs who dwell in this lake, and I see that thou too art an excellent prince and a brave warrior, so make haste, and tell me what race thou dost belong. The mouse answered and said, Friend, why dost thou ask me of my race? It is known to all the gods and to men, and to all the birds of heaven. My name is Crumfilter, and I am the son of the great-hearted Brednar, and my mother is Lickmill, the daughter of King Hamnibbler. I was born in a hovel, and fed on figs and nuts, and on all manner of good things. But how can we be friends? We are not at all like each other. You frogs live in the water, we feed on whatever is eaten by man. 
no dainty escapes my eye, whether it be bread or cake or ham or new-made cheese or rich dishes prepared for feasts. As to war, I have never dreaded its noise, but going straight into it have taken my place among the foremost warriors, nor do I fear men, although they have large bodies, for at night I can bite a finger or nibble a heel without waking the sleeper from his pleasant slumber. But there are two things which I dread greatly, a mouse trap and a hawk, but worse than these are the weasels, for they can catch us in our holes. What then am I to do? For I cannot eat the cabbages, radishes, and pumpkins which furnish food for the race of frogs. Then Puff Cheek answered with a smile, My friend, thou art dainty enough, but we have fine things to show on the dry land and in the marsh, for the son of Cronus has given us the power to dwell on land or in the water, as it may please us. If thou wouldst see these things, it is soon done. Get on my back and hold on well, so that thou mayest reach my house with a cheerful heart. So he turned his back to the mouse, who sprang lightly on it, and put his arms round his soft neck. Much pleased he was at first to swim on the back of Puff Cheek, while the haven was near. But when he had got out into midwater, he began to weep and to curse his useless sorrow. He tore his hair and drew his feet tightly around the frog's stomach. His heart beat wildly, and he wished himself well on shore, as he uttered a pitiful cry and spread out his tail on the water, moving it about like an oar. Then in the bitterness of his grief he said, Surely it was not. Thus the bull carried the beautiful Europa on his back over the sea to Crete. Surely! But before he could say more, a snake, of which frogs and mice alike are afraid, lifted up his head straight above the water, down dived Puff Cheek when he saw the snake, never thinking that he had left the mouse to die. The frog was safe at the bottom of the marsh, but the mouse fell on his back and screamed terribly. Many times he sank, and many times he came up again, kicking hard, but there was no hope. The hair on his skin was soaked and weighed him down, and with his last breath he cried, Puff Cheek, thou shalt not escape for thy treachery. On the land I could have beaten thee in boxing, wrestling, or running, but thou hast beguiled me into the water, where I can do nothing. The eye of justice sees thee, and thou shalt pay a fearful penalty to the great army of the mice. So the crumb filcher died, but Lick Platter saw him as he sat on the soft bank, and uttering a sharp cry went to tell the mice. Then was there great wrath among them, and messengers were sent to bid all come in the morning to the house of Brednar, but father of the leckless crumbfilcher, whose body could not even be buried because it was floating in the middle of the pond. They came at dawn, and Brednar, rising in grief and rage, said, Friends, I may be the only one whom the frogs have sore injured, but we all live a poor life, and I am in sad plight, for I have lost three sons. The first was slain by a hateful weasel who caught him outside his hole, the next one cruel men brought to his death by a newfangled device of wood which they call a trap. Now my darling Crumbfilcher has been drowned. Come and let us arm ourselves for war and go forth to battle. So they each put on his armor. For greaves around their legs they used the beans on which they fed at night. In their breastplates they made cunningly out of the skin of a dead weasel. For spears they carried skewers and the shell of a nut for a helmet. So they stood in battle array, and the frogs, when they came to hear of it, rose from the water, and summoned a council in the corner of the pond, as they wondered what might be the cause of these things. There came a messenger from the mice, who declared war against them, and said, Ye frogs, the mice bid you arm yourselves and come forth to battle, for they have seen Crumbfilcher, whom your king Puffcheek drowned, floating dead on the water. Then the valiant frogs feared exceedingly and blamed the deed of Puff Cheek. But the king said, Friends, I did not kill the mouse or see him die. Of course he was drowned while he amused himself in the pond by trying to swim like a frog, and the wretches now bring a charge against me, who am wholly guiltless. But come, let us take counsel how we may destroy these mice, and this, I think, is the best plan. Let us arm ourselves and take our stand where the bank is steepest, and when they come charging against us, let us seize their helmets 
and drag them down into the pond. Thus we shall drown them all and set up a trophy for our victory. So they each put on his armor. They covered their legs with mallow leaves and carried radish leaves for shields, rushes for spears, snail shells for helmets. Thus they stood in array on the high bank, brandishing their spears and shouting for battle. But Jupiter summoned the gods to the starry heaven and pointed to the host of the frogs and mice, mighty as the armies of the centaurs or giants. He asked who would aid each side as it might be hard-pressed in the strife. He said to Minerva, daughter, Thou wilt go surely to the aid of the mice, for they are always running about thy shrine, and delight in the fat and the morsels which they pick from the sacrifices. But Minerva said to the son of Cronus, Father, I go not to help the mice, for they have done me grievous mischief, spoiling the garlands and the lamps for the sake of the oil. Nay, I have great their cause for anger, for they have eaten the robe which I wove from fine thread, and made holes in it. And the man who mended it charges a high price, and worse still, I borrow the stuff of which I wove it, and now I cannot pay it back. Yet neither will I aid the frogs, for they are not in their right senses. A little while ago I came back tired from war and wanting sleep, but they never let me close my eyes with their clatter, and I lay sleepless with a headache till the cock crew in the morning. But, O oh ye gods, let us aid neither side, lest we be wounded with their swords or spears, for they are sharp and strong, even against gods. Let us take our sport by watching the strife in safety. The gods did as Minerva bade them, and went all to one place. The gnats, with their great trumpets, gave the signal for battle. And Jupiter thundered out of the sky because of the woes that were coming. Mighty were the deeds which were done on both sides, and the earth and the pond were reddened with the blood of the slain. As the fight went on, Crumb Stealer slew Garlic Eater before he came to land, and Mudwalker, seeing it, threw at him a clod of earth, and hitting him on the forehead almost blinded him. In his fury, Crumb Stealer seized a great stone and crushed the leg of the frog so that he fell on his back in the dust. Then Brednar wounded Puffcheek in the foot and made him limp into the water. But among the mice there was a young hero with whom none could be matched for boldness and strength, and his name was Bitstealer. On the bank of the pond he stood alone and vowed a vow to destroy the whole race of frogs, and the vow would have been accomplished, for his might was great indeed, had not the son of Cronus pitied the frogs in their misery and charged Minerva and Mars to drive Bitstealer from the battle. But Mars made answer and said, O Jupiter, neither Minerva nor Mars alone can save the frogs from death. Let us all go and help him, and do thou, son of Cronus, wield thy mighty weapons with which thou didst slay the titans and the wild race of giants, for thus only can the bravest of them be slain. So spake Mars, and Jupiter hurled his scathing thunderbolts, and the lightnings flashed from the sky, and Olympus shook with the earthquake, the frogs and mice heard and trembled, but the mice ceased, not yet for the battle, and strove only the more to slay their enemies, until Jupiter, in his pity, sent a new army to aid the frogs. Suddenly they came on the mice, with mailed backs and crooked claws, with limping gait and mouths like shears. Their backs were hard and horny, their arms were long and lean, and their eyes were in their breasts. They had eight feet and two heads and no hands. Men called them crabs. With their mouth they bit the tails and feet and hands of the mice, and broke their spears, and great terror came on all the mice, so that they turned and fled. Thus the battle was ended, and the sun went down. End of chapter 8 Myths of Greece and Rome Part 6 Recorded by Peter Strom, Sabetha, Kansas On June 3rd 2018Chapter 8, Part 7 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is the LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 7, Orpheus the Sweet Singer. 
by Sir George W. Cox. In the pleasant valleys of a country which was called Thessaly, there lived a man whose name was Orpheus. Every day he made soft music with his golden harp and sang beautiful songs such as no one had ever heard before. And whenever Orpheus sang, then everything came to listen to him, and the trees bowed down their heads to hear. Even the clouds sailed along more gently and brightly in the sky when he sang, and the stream which ran close to his feet made a softer noise to show how glad his music made him. Now Orpheus had a wife who was called Eurydice, who he loved very dearly. All through the winter when the snow was on the hills, and all through the summer when the sunshine made everything beautiful, Orpheus used to sing to her, and Eurydice sat on the grass by his side while the beasts came round to listen, and the trees bowed down their heads to hear him. But one day when Eurydice was playing with some children on the bank of a river, she trod upon a snake in the long grass, and the snake bit her. And by and by she began to be very sick, and Eurydice knew that she must die. So she told the children to go to Orpheus, for he was far away, and say how sorry she was to leave him, and that she loved him always very dearly. And then she put her head down upon the soft grass and fell asleep and died. Sad indeed was Orpheus when the children came to tell him that Eurydice was dead. He felt so wretched that he never played upon his golden harp, and he never opened his lips to sing. And the beasts that used to listen to him wondered why Orpheus sat all alone on the green bank where Eurydice used to sit with him, and why it was that he never made any more beautiful music. All day long he sat there, and his cheeks were often wet with tears. At last he said, I cannot stay here any more. I must go and look for Eurydice. I cannot bear to be without her. And perhaps the king of the land where people go after they are dead will let her come back and live with me again. So he took his harp in his hand and went to look for Eurydice in the land where the sun goes down into his golden cup before the night comes on, and he went on and on a very long way, till at last he came to a high and dark gateway. It was bared across with iron bars and was bolted and locked so that nobody could open it. It was a wretched and gloomy place because the sunshine never came there, and it was covered with clouds and mists. In front of this great gateway there sat a monstrous dog with three heads six eyes and three tongues and everything was dark round except his eyes which shone like fire and which saw every one that dared to come near now when orpheus came looking for eurydice the dog raised his three heads opened his three mouths and gnashed his teeth at him and roared terribly but when orpheus came nearer the dog jumped up on his feet ready to fly at him and tear him to pieces then Orpheus took down his harp and began to play upon its golden strings, and the dog, Cerberus, for that was his name, growled and snarled and showed the great white teeth in his three mouths, but he could not help hearing the sweet music, and he wondered why it was that he had no longer wished to tear Orpheus to pieces. Soon the music made him quiet and still, and at last it lulled him to sleep. Then Orpheus passed by him and came upon the gate and found it wide open, for it had come open of its own accord while he was singing. He was glad when he saw this, for he thought now that he should see Eurydice. So he went on and on a long way until he came to the palace of the king, and there were guards placed before the door who tried to keep him from going in, but Orpheus played upon his harp and they could not help letting him pass. So he went into the great hall, where he saw the king and queen sitting on a throne, and he came near. The king called out to him with a loud and terrible voice, "'Who are you, and how dare you come here? Do you not know that no one is allowed to come here till after he is dead? I will have you chained and placed in a dungeon from which you will never be able to get out.' Orpheus said nothing, but took his gold harp in his hand and began to sing more sweetly and gently than ever. And as he sang, the face of the king began to look almost glad, and his anger passed away. Then the king said, You have made me feel happy with your sweet music, although I have never felt happy before. And now tell me why you have come, because you must want something, for otherwise no one would come before he was dead to this sad and gloomy land for which I am the king. Then Orpheus said, O king, give me back my dear Eurydice, and let her go from this gloomy place, and live with me on the bright earth again. So the king said that she could go. And the king said to Orpheus, I have given you what you wanted, because you sang so sweetly. And when you go back to earth from this place, your wife, whom you love, shall go up after you. But remember that you must never look back until she has reached the earth. For if you do, Eurydice will be brought back here, and I shall not be able to give her to you again. 
even if you should sing more sweetly and gently than ever. Now Orpheus was longing to see Eurydice, and he had hoped that the king would let him see her at least once, but when the king said that he must not try to see her till she had reached the earth, he was quite content, for he said, Shall I not wait patiently a little while, that Eurydice may come and live with me again? So he promised the king that he would go up to the earth without stopping to look behind him and see whether Eurydice was coming after him. Then Orpheus left the palace of the king, and he passed through the dark gateway, and the dog Cerberus did not bark or growl, for he knew that Orpheus would not have been allowed to come back if the king had not wished it. So he went on and on a long way, and he became impatient, and longed more and more to see Eurydice. At last he came near to the land of the living of the men, and he saw just a little streak of light where the sun was going to rise from the sea, and presently the sky became brighter, and he saw everything before him so clearly that he could not help turning around to look at Eurydice, but ah, she had not yet quite reached the earth, and so he lost her again. He saw something pale and white which looked just like his own dear wife and he heard a soft and gentle voice which sounded like the voice of eurydice and it all melted away and still he thought that he saw that pale white face and he heard that soft voice which said oh orpheus orpheus why did you look back how dearly i love you and how glad i should have been to live with you again but now i must go back because you have broken your promise to the king and i must not even kiss you and say how much i love you Orpheus sat down at the place where Eurydice was taken from him. He could go no further. There he stayed day after day, and his cheeks became paler, and his body weaker and weaker, till at last he knew that he must die. And Orpheus was not sorry, for although he loved the bright earth, with all its flowers and grass and sunny streams, he knew that he could not be with Eurydice again until he had left it. So at last he laid his head upon the earth and fell asleep and died. And then he and Eurydice saw each other in the land which is far away, where the sun goes down at night into his golden cup, and were never parted again. End of chapter 8, part 7Fog Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2 Fog Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 8 Myth of Greece and Rome. Part 8 Niobe, a Victim of Latona's Jealousy by Thomas Bullfinch. Niobe, the queen of Thebes, had much to be proud of, but it was not her husband's fame, nor her own beauty, nor their great descent, nor the power of their kingdom that elated her. It was her children, and truly the happiest of mothers would Niobe have been, if only she had not claimed to be so. It was an occasion of the annual celebration in honor of Latona and her offspring, Apollo and Diana. When the people of Thebes were assembled, their brows crowned with laurel, bearing frankincense in the altars, and paying their vows, that Niobe appeared among the crowd. Her attire was splendid with gold and gems, and her aspect beautiful as the face of an angry woman can be she stood and surveyed the people with haughty looks what folly said she is this to prefer beings whom you never saw to those who stand before your eyes why should latona be honored with worship and none be paid to me my father was Tantalus, who was received as a guest at the table of the gods. My mother was a goddess. My husband built and rules this city, Thebes, and Phrygia is my paternal inheritance. Wherever I turn my eyes, I survey the elements of my power, nor is my form and presence unworthy of a goddess. 
to all this let me add i have seven sons and seven daughters and look for sons-in-law and daughters-in-law of pretensions worthy of my alliance have i not cause for pride will you prefer to me this latona this titan's daughter with her two children i have seven times as many fortunate indeed am i and fortunate i shall remain will any one deny this my abundance is my security i feel myself too strong for fortune to subdue she may take from me much i shall still have much left were i to lose some of my children i should hardly be left as poor as latona with her two only away with you from these solemnities put off the laurel from your brows have done with this worship the people obeyed and left the sacred services uncompleted the goddess was indignant on the thynthian mountain top where she dwelt she thus addressed her son and daughter my children i who have been so proud of you both and have been used to hold myself second to none of the goddesses except juno alone begin now to doubt whether i am indeed a goddess i shall be deprived of my worship altogether unless you protect me she was proceeding in this strain but apollo interrupted her say no more said he speech only delays punishment so said diana also darting through the air veiled in clouds they alighted on the towers of the city spread out before the gates was a broad plain where the youth of the city pursued their warlike sports the sons of niobe were there with the rest some mounted on spirited horses richly caparisoned some driving gay chariots Ismenos, the first-born as he guided his foaming steeds struck with an arrow from above cried out ah oh, me dropped the reins and fell lifeless another hearing the sound of the bow like a boatman who sees the storm gathering and makes all safe for the port gave the reins to his horses and attempted to escape the arrow overtook him as he fled two younger boys just from their tasks had gone to the playground to have a game of wrestling as they stood breast to breast one arrow pierced them both they uttered a cry together cast a parting look around them and together breathed their last alphenor an elder brother seeing them fall hastened to the spot to render assistance and fell stricken in the act one only was left Ilioneus. he raised his arms to heaven to try whether prayer might not bail spare me ye gods he cried addressing all and apollo would have spared him but the arrow had already left the string and it was too late the terror of the people and grief of the attendants soon made niobe acquainted with what had taken place she could hardly think it possible she was indignant that the gods had dared and amazed that they had been able to do it her husband Amphion, overwhelmed with the blow destroyed himself alas how different was this niobe from her who had so lately driven away the people from the sacred rites and held her stately course through the city the envy of her friends now the pity even of her foes she knelt over the lifeless bodies and kissed now one now another of her dead sons raising her pallid arms to heaven cruel latona said she feed full your rage with my anguish 
satiate your hard heart while i follow to the grave my seven sons yet where is your triumph bereaved as i am i am still richer than you my conqueror scarce had she spoken when the bow sounded and struck terror into all hearts except niobe's alone she was brave from excess of grief the sisters stood in garments of mourning over the biers of their dead brothers one fell struck by an arrow and died on the corpse she was bewailing another attempting to console her mother suddenly ceased to speak and sunk lifeless to the earth a third tried to escape by flight a fourth by concealment another stood trembling uncertain what course to take six were now dead and only one remained whom the mother held clasped in her arms and covered as it were with her whole body spare me one and that the youngest oh spare me one of so many she cried and while she spoke that one fell dead desolate she sat among sons daughters husband all dead stunned with grief the breeze moved not her hair no color was on her cheek her eyes glared fixed and immovable there was no sign of life about her her very tongue cleaved to the roof of her mouth she was changed to stone yet tears continued to flow and borne on a whirlwind to her native mountain she still remains a mass of rock from which a trickling stream flows a tribute of her never-ending grief End of chapter eight part eight chapter eight myth of greece and rome part nine of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton chapter eight myth of greece and rome part nine the sad story of pyramus and tisbe by thomas bulfinch pyramus was the handsomest youth and tisbe the fairest maiden in all babylon where semiramis reigned their parents occupied adjoining houses and acquaintance ripened into love they would gladly have married but their parents forbade one thing however they could not forbid that love should glow with equal ardour in the hearts of both they conversed by signs and glances and the fire burned more intensely for being covered up in the wall that separated the two houses there was a crack no one had remarked it before but the lovers discovered it it afforded a passage to the voice and messages used to pass backward and forward through the gap cruel wall they said why do you keep us apart but we will not be ungrateful we owe you the privilege of transmitting loving words to willing ears such words they uttered on different sides of the wall and when night came and they must say farewell they pressed their lips upon the wall she on her side he on his as they could come no nearer next morning when the sun had melted the frost from the grass they met at the accustomed spot then after lamenting their hard fate they agreed that next night when all was still they would sleep away from watchful eyes leave their dwellings and walk out into the fields and to ensure a meeting repair to a well-known edifice standing without the city's bounds call it 
the tomb of Ninus, and that the one who came first shoot away the other at the foot of a certain tree. It was a white mulberry tree, and stood near a cool spring. All was agreed on, and they waited impatiently for the sun to go down beneath the waters and night to rise up from them. Then cautiously Tispe stole forth, unobserved by the family, her head covered with a veil, made her way to the monument and sat down under the tree. As she sat alone in the dim light of the evening, she descried a lioness, her jaws stained with recent slaughter, approaching the fountain to slake her thirst. Tisby fled at the sight and sought refuge in the hollow of a rock. As she fled, she dropped her veil. The lioness, after drinking at the spring, turned to retreat to the woods, and seeing the veil on the ground, tossed it and rent it with her bloody mouth. Pyramus, having been delayed, now approached the place of meeting. He saw in the sand the footsteps of the lion, and the color fled from his cheeks at the sight. Presently he found the veil all rent and bloody. Oh, hapless girl, said he, I have been the cause of thy death. Thou, more worthy of life than I, has fallen the first victim. I will follow. I am the guilty cause, in tempting thee, forced to a place of such peril and not being myself on the spot to guard thee. Come forth, ye lions, from the rocks, and tear this guilty body with your teeth. He took up the veil, carried it with him to the appointed tree, and covered it with kisses and with tears. My blood also shall stain your texture, said he, and drawing his sword, plunged it into his heart. The blood spurted from the wound, and tinged the white mulberries of the tree all red, and sinking into the earth reached the roots, so that the red color mounted through the trunk to the fruit. By this time Tisby, still trembling with fear, yet wishing not to disappoint her lover, stepped cautiously forth, looking anxiously for the youth, eager to tell him the danger she had escaped. When she came to the spot and saw the changed color of the mulberries, she doubted whether it was the same place. While she hesitated, she saw the form of one struggling in the agonies of death. She started back, a shudder run through her frame as a ripple on the face of the still water, when a sudden breeze sweeps over it but as soon as she recognized her lover she screamed beat her breast and embraced the lifeless body oh pyramus she cried what has done this answer me pyramus it is tisby that speaks hear me dearest and lift that drooping head at the name of tisby pyramus opened his eyes then closed them again she saw her veil stained with blood, and the scabbard empty of its sword. Thy own hand has slain thee, and for my sake, she said, I too can be brave for once, and my love is as strong as thine. I will follow thee in death, for I have been the cause, and death, which alone could part us, shall not prevent my joining thee. And ye, unhappy parents of us both, deny us not our united request, as love and death have joined us, let one tomb contain us, and thou, tree, retain the marks of slaughter. Let thy berries still serve for memorials of our blood. So saying, she plunged the sword into her breast. Her parents ratified her wish the gods also ratified it 
the two bodies were buried in one sepulchre and the tree ever after brought forth purple berries as it does to this day end of chapter eight part nine the sad story of pyramus and tisbe chapter eight part ten of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by emma stays junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton chapter eight myths of greece and rome part ten the twelve labors of hercules by thomas bullfinch hercules was the son of jupiter and alcamina as juno was always hostile to the offspring of her husband by mortal mothers she declared war against hercules from his birth she sent two serpents to destroy him as he lay in his cradle but the brave infant strangled them with his own hands he was however by the arts of juno rendered subject to eurythreus and compelled to perform all his commands eurythreus gave him a succession of desperate tasks which are called the twelve labors of hercules the first was to fight with the nemean lion the valley of nemea was infested by a terrible lion eurythreus ordered hercules to bring him the skin of this monster after using in vain his clubs and arrows against the lion hercules strangled the animal with his hands he returned carrying the dead lion on his shoulders but eurythreus was so frightened at the sight of it and at this proof of the prodigious strength of the hero that he ordered him to deliver the account of his exploits in the future outside of the town his next labor was the slaughter of the hydra this monster ravaged the country of argos and dwelt in a swamp near the well of amimoni this well had been discovered by amimoni when the country was suffering from drought and the story was that neptune who loved her had permitted her to touch the rock with his trident and a spring of three outlets burst forth here the hydra took up his position and hercules was sent to destroy him the hydra had nine heads of which the middle one was immortal hercules struck off its heads with his clubs but in the place of the head knocked off two new ones grew forth each time at length with the assistance of his faithful servant iolaus he burned away the heads of the hydra and buried the ninth or their immortal one under a huge rock another labor was the cleaning of the aegean stables aegeus king of elis had a herd of three thousand oxen whose stalls had not been cleansed for thirty years hercules brought the rivers alpheus and peneus through them and cleansed them thoroughly in one day his next labor was of a more delicate kind admeta the daughter of eurythreus longed to obtain the girdle of the queen of the amazons and eurythreus ordered hercules to go and get it the amazons were a nation of women they were very warlike and held several flourishing cities it was their custom to bring up only the female children the boys were either sent away to the neighboring nations or put to death hercules was accompanied by a number of volunteers and after various adventures at last reached the country of the amazons hippolyta the queen received him kindly and consented to yield him her girdle but juno taking the form of an amazon went and persuaded the rest that the strangers were carrying off their queen they instantly armed and came in great numbers down to the ship hercules thinking that hippolyta had acted treacherously slew her and taking her girdle made sail homeward another task then joined him was to bring to erythrith the oxen of gerion a monster with three bodies who dwelt in the island of erythria the red so called because it lay at the west under the rays of the setting sun this description is thought to apply to spain of which gerion was king after traversing various countries hercules reached at length the frontiers of libya and europe where he raised two of the mountains of calpi and abila as monuments of his progress or according to another account rent one mountain into two and left half on each side forming the strains of gibraltar the two mountains being called the pillars of hercules the oxen were guarded by the giant Eurytion and his two-headed dog but hercules killed the giant and his dog and brought away the oxen in safety to eurythreus 
The most difficult labor of all was getting the golden apples of Hesperity, for Hercules did not know where to find them. These were the apples which Juno had received at her wedding from the goddess of the earth, and which she had entrusted to the keeping of the daughters of Hesperus, assisted by a watchful dragon. A celebrated export of Hercules was his victory over Antaeus. Antaeus, the son of Terra, the earth, was a mighty giant and a wrestler, whose strength was invincible so long as he remained in contact with his mother earth he compelled all strangers who came into his country to wrestle with him on condition that if conquered as they all were they should be put to death hercules encountered him and finding that it was of no avail to throw him for he always rose with renewed strength from every fall he lifted him up from the earth and strangled him in the air Caucus was a huge giant who inhabited a cave on Mount Aventine and plundered the surrounding country. When Hercules was driving home the oxen of Geryon, Caucus stole part of the cattle while the heroes slept, that their footprints might not serve to show where they had been driven. He dragged them backwards by their tails to his cave, so that their tracks all seemed to show that they had gone in the opposite direction. Hercules was deceived by the stratagem and would have failed to find his oxen if it had not happened that in driving the remainder of the herd past the cave where the stolen ones were concealed those within began to low and were thus discovered caucus was slain by hercules the last exploit we shall record was bringing cerberus from the lower world cerberus was the three-headed dog that guarded the entrance to hades hercules descended into hades accompanied by mercury and minerva he obtained permission from pluto to carry cerberus to the upper air provided he could do it without the use of weapons and in spite of the monster's struggling he seized him held him fast and carried him to Eurythrius, and afterwards brought him back again when he was in hades he obtained the liberty of theseus his admirer and imitator had been detained a prisoner there for an unsuccessful attempt to carry off proserpine hercules in a fit of madness killed his friend iphitus and was condemned for this offence to become the slave of queen omphale for three years while in this service the hero's nature seemed changed he lived effeminately wearing at times the dress of a woman spinning wool with the handmaidens of omphale while the queen wore his lion skin when the service was ended he married dejanira and lived in peace with her three years on one occasion as he was travelling with his wife they came to a river across which the centaur nessus carried travellers for a stated fee hercules himself forded the river but gave dejanira to nessus to be carried across nessus attempted to run away with her but hercules heard her cries and shot an arrow into the heart of nessus the dying centaur told de Genera to take a portion of his blood and keep it, as it might be used as a charm to preserve the love of her husband. De Genera did so, and before long fancied she had occasion to use it. Hercules, in one of his conquests, had taken prisoner a fair maiden named Iole, of whom he seemed more fond than de Genera approved. When Hercules was about to offer sacrifices to the gods in honor of his victory, he sent to his wife for a white robe to use on the occasion. De Genera, thinking it a good opportunity to try her love spell, seeped the garment in the blood of Nessus. As soon as the garment became warm on the body of Hercules, the poison penetrated into all his limbs and caused him the most intense agony. In his frenzy he seized Lichus, who had brought him the fatal robe, and hurled him into the sea. He wrenched off the garment, but it stuck to his flesh, and with it he tore away whole pieces of his body. In this state he embarked on board a ship, and was conveyed home. De Genera, on seeing what she had unwittingly done, hung herself. Hercules, prepared to die, ascended Mount Eta where he built a funeral pyre of trees, gave his bows and arrows to Philetetes, and laid himself down on the pile, his head resting on his club, and his lion's skin spread over him. With a countenance as serene as if he were taking his place at a festival board, he commanded Philetetes to apply the torch. The flame spread apace, and soon invested the whole mass. The gods themselves felt troubled at seeing the champion of the earth so brought to his end but jupiter with cheerful countenance thus addressed them 
fear not. He who conquered all else is not to be conquered by those flames which you see blazing on Mount Eta. Only his mother's share in him can perish. What he derived from me is immortal. I shall take him, dead to earth, to the heavenly shores, and I require of you all to receive him kindly. Jupiter enveloped him in a cloud and took him up in a four-horse chariot to dwell among the stars. End of chapter 8 Part 10 Chapter 8, Part 11 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 11. Hercules' Search for the Apples of Hesperides by Nathaniel Hawthorne Did you ever hear of the golden apples that grew in the garden of the Hesperides? Ah, those were such apples as would bring a great price by the bushel, if any of them could be found growing in the orchards of nowadays. But there is not, I suppose, a graft of that wonderful fruit on a single tree in the wide world. Not so much as the seed of those apples exists any longer, and, even in the old, old, half-forgotten times, before the garden of the Hesperides was overrun with weeds, a great many people doubted whether they could be real trees that bore apples of solid gold upon their branches. All had heard of them, but nobody remembered to have seen any. Children, nevertheless, used to listen, open mouthed to the stories of the golden apple tree, and resolved to discover it when they should be big enough. Adventurous young men, who desired to do a braver thing than any of their fellows, set out in quest of this fruit. Many of them returned, no more. None of them brought back the apples. No wonder they found it impossible to gather them. It is said that there was a dragon beneath the tree, with a hundred terrible heads, fifty of which were always on the watch, while the other fifty slept. In my opinion, it was hardly worth running so much risk for the sake of a solid golden apple. Had the apples been sweet, mellow, and juicy, indeed that would be another matter. There might then have been some sense in trying to get at them, in spite of the hundred-headed dragon. But, as I have already told you, it was quite a common thing with young persons, when tired of too much peace and rest, to go in search of the Garden of the Hesperides. And once, the adventure was undertaken by a hero who had enjoyed very little peace or rest since he came into the world. At the time of which I am going to speak, he was wandering through the pleasant land of Italy, with a mighty club in his hand and a bow and quiver slung across his shoulders. He was wrapped in the skin of the biggest and fiercest lion that had ever been seen, and which he himself had killed, and though on the whole he was kind and generous and noble, there was a good deal of the lion's fierceness in his heart. As he went on his way, he continually inquired whether that were the right road to the famous garden, but none of the country people knew anything about the matter, and many looked as if they would have laughed at the question if the stranger had not carried so very big a club. So he journeyed on and on, still making the same inquiry, until, at last, he came to the brink of a river where some beautiful young women sat twining wreaths of flowers. "'Can you tell me, pretty maidens,' asked the stranger, "'whether this is the right way to the Garden of the Hesperides?' The young women had been having a fine time together, weaving the flowers into wreaths and crowning one another's heads, and there seemed to be a kind of magic in the touch of their fingers that made the flowers more fresh and dewy, and of brighter hues and sweeter fragrance, while they played with them, than even when they had been growing on their native stems. But, on hearing the stranger's questions, they dropped all their flowers on the grass and gazed at him with astonishment. The Garden of the Hesperides, cried one, we thought mortals had been weary of seeking it, after so many disappointments, and pray, adventurous traveller, what do you want there? 
A certain king, who is my cousin, replied he, had ordered me to get him three of the golden apples. Most of the young men who go in quest of these apples, observed another of the damsels, desire to obtain them for themselves, or to present them to some fair maiden whom they love. Do you, then, love this king, your cousin, so very much? Perhaps not, replied the stranger, sighing. He has often been severe and cruel to me, but it is my destiny to obey him. Do you know, asked the damsel who had first spoken, that a terrible dragon with a hundred heads keeps watch under the golden apple tree? I know it well, answered the stranger calmly, but from my cradle upwards it has been my business and almost my pastime to deal with serpents and dragons. The young woman looked at his massive club and at the shaggy lion skin which he wore, and likewise at his heroic limbs and figures, and they whispered to each other that the stranger appeared to be one who might reasonably expect to perform deeds far beyond the might of other men. But then, the dragon with a hundred heads! What mortal, even if he possessed a hundred lives, could hope to escape the fangs of such a monster? So kind-hearted were the maidens that they could not bear to see this brave and handsome traveler attempt what was so very dangerous, and devote himself, most probably, to become a meal for the dragon's hundred ravenous mouths. "'Go back!' cried they all. "'Go back to your own home. Your mother, beholding you safe and sound, will shed tears of joy. And what can she do more, should you win ever so great a victory?' No matter for the golden apples, no matter for the king, your cruel cousin, we do not wish the dragon with the hundred heads to eat you up. The stranger seemed to grow impatient at these remonstrances. He carelessly lifted his mighty club and let it fall upon a rock that lay half buried in the earth nearby. With the force of that idle blow, the great rock was shattered all to pieces. It cost the stranger no more effort to achieve this feat of a giant strength than one of the young maidens to touch her sister's rosy cheek with a flower. "'Do you not believe,' said he, looking at the damsels with a smile, "'that such a blow could have crushed one of the dragon's hundred heads?' Then he sat down on the grass and told them the story of his life, or as much of it as he could remember, from the day he was first cradled in a warrior's brazen shield." While he lay there, two immense serpents came gliding over the floor and opened their hideous jaws to devour him, and he, a baby of a few months old, had gripped one of the fierce snakes in each of his little fists and strangled them to death. When he was but a stripling, he had killed a huge lion, almost as big as the one whose vast and shaggy hide he now wore upon his shoulders. The next thing that he had done was to fight a battle with an ugly sort of monster called a hydra, which had no less than nine heads, and exceedingly sharp teeth in every one. "'But the dragon of the Hesperides, you know,' observed one of the damsels, "'has a hundred heads!' "'Nevertheless,' replied the strangers, "'I would rather fight two such dragons than a single hydra. For, as fast as I cut off a head, two others grew in its place.' And besides, there was one of the heads that could not possibly be killed, but kept biting as fiercely as ever, long after it was cut off. So I was forced to bury it under a stone, where it is doubtless alive to this very day. But the hydra's body and its eight other heads will never do any further mischief. The damsels, judging that this story was likely to last a good while, had been preparing or repasts of bread and grapes that the stranger might refresh himself in the intervals of his talk. They took pleasure in helping him to the simple food, and now and then one of them would put a sweet grape between her rosy lips, lest it should make him bashful to eat alone. The traveler proceeded to tell how he had chased a very swift stag for a twelfth month together, without ever stopping to take breath, and had at last caught it by the antlers and carried it home alive and he had fought with a very odd race of people, half horses, half men, and had put them all to death from a sense of duty, in order that their ugly figures might never be seen any more. 
Besides all this, he took to himself great credit for having cleaned out a stable. Do you call that a wonderful exploit? asked one of the young maidens with a smile. Any clown in the country has done as much. Had it been an ordinary stable, replied the stranger, I should not have mentioned it. But this was so gigantic a task that it would have taken me all my life to perform it if I had not luckily thought of turning the channel of a river through the stable door. That did the business in a very short time. Seeing how earnestly his fair auditors listened, he next told them how he had shot some monstrous birds and had caught a wild bull alive and let him go again, and had tamed a number of very wild horses and had conquered Hippolyta, the warlike queen of the Amazons. He mentioned, likewise, that he had taken off Hippolyta's enchanted girdle and had given it to the daughter of his cousin, the king. Was it the girdle of Venus, inquired the prettiest of the damsels, which make women beautiful? No, answered the stranger. It had formerly been the sword belt of Mars, and it can only make the wearer valiant and courageous. An old sword belt, cried the damsel, tossing her head, then I should not care about having it. You are right, said the stranger. He informed the maidens that as strange an adventure as ever happened was when he fought Jirian, the six-legged man. This was very odd and frightened sort of figure, as you may well believe. Any person looking at his tracks in the sand or snow would suppose that three sociable companions had been walking along together. On hearing his footsteps at a little distance, it was no more than reasonable to judge that several people must be coming. But it was only the strange man Jirian clattering onwards with his six legs. Six legs and one gigantic body. Certainly, he must have been a very queer monster to look at. And, my stars, what a waste of shoe leather! When the stranger had finished the story of his adventures, he looked around at the attentive faces of the maidens. Perhaps you may have heard of me before, he said modestly. My name is Hercules. We had already guessed it, replied the maidens, for your wonderful deeds are known all over the world. We do not think it strange any longer that you should set out in quest of the golden apples of the Hesperides. Come, sisters, let us crown the hero with flowers. Then they flung beautiful wreaths over his stately head and mighty shoulders, so that the lion's skin was almost entirely covered with roses. They took possession of his ponderous club, and so entwined it about with the brightest, softest, and most fragrant blossoms that not a finger's breadth of its oaken substance could be seen. It looked all like a huge bunch of flowers. Lastly, they joined hands and danced around him, chanting words which became poetry of their own accord, and grew into a choral song in honor of the illustrious Hercules. And Hercules was rejoiced, as any other hero who had been, to know that these fairer young girls had heard of the valiant deeds which it had cost him so much toil and danger to achieve. But still, he was not satisfied. He could not think that what he had already done was worthy of so much honor, while there remained any bold or difficult adventure to be undertaken. Dear maidens, said he, when they paused to take breath, now that you know my name, will you not tell me how I am to reach the Garden of the Hesperides? Ah, must you go so soon, they exclaimed. You that have performed so many wonders and spent such a toilsome life can you not content yourself to repose a little while on the margin of this peaceful river? Hercules shook his head. I must depart now, said he. We will then give you the best directions we can, replied the damsels. You must go to the seashore and find out the old one and compel him to inform you where the golden apples are to be found. The old one, repeated Hercules, laughing at this odd name. And pray, who may the old one be? Why, the old man of the sea, to be sure, answered one of the damsels. He has fifty daughters, whom some people call very beautiful, but we do not think it proper to be acquainted with them, because they have sea green hair and taper away like fishes. You must talk with this old man of the sea. He is a seafaring person and knows all about the Garden of the Hesperides. 
for it is situated in an island which he is often in the habit of visiting. Hercules then asked whereabout the old one was most likely to be met with. When the damsels had informed him, he thanked them for all their kindness, for the bread and grapes with which they had fed him, the lovely flowers with which they had crowned him, and the songs and dances wherewith they had done him honor. And he thanked them, most of all, for telling him the right way, and immediately set forth upon his journey. But before he was out of hearing, one of the maidens called after him, Keep hold fast of the old one when you catch him, she cried, smiling and lifting her finger to make the caution more impressive. Do not be astonished at anything that may happen. Only hold him fast, and he will tell you what you wish to know. Hercules again thanked her and pursued his way, while the maidens resumed their pleasant labor of making flower wreaths. They talked about the hero long after he was gone. "'We will crown him with the loveliest of our garlands,' said they, when he returns hither with three golden apples after slaying the dragon with a hundred heads. Meanwhile, Hercules traveled constantly onward, over hill and dale, and through the solitary woods. Sometimes he swung his club aloft, and splintered a mighty oak with a downright blow. His mind was so full of the giants and monsters, with whom it was the business of his life to fight, that perhaps he had mistook the great tree for a giant or a monster. And so eager was Hercules to achieve what he had undertaken, that he almost regretted to have spent so much time with the damsels, wasting idle breath upon the story of his adventures. But thus it always is with persons who are destined to perform great things. What they have already done seems less than nothing. What they have taken in hand to do seems worth toil, danger, and life itself. Persons who have happened to be passing through the forest must have been affrighted to see him smite the trees with his great club, but with a single blow. The trunk was riven by the stroke of lightning, and the broad boughs came rustling and crashing down. Hastening forward, with ever pausing or looking behind, for he by and by heard the sea roaring at a distance, and the sound he increased his speed, and soon came to a beach, where the great surf waves tumbled themselves upon the hard sand in a long line of snowy foam. At one end of the beach, however, there was a pleasant spot where some green shrubbery clambered up a cliff, making its rocky face look soft and beautiful. A carpet of verdant grass, largely intermixed with sweet-smelling clover, covered the narrow space between the bottom of the cliff and the sea. And what should Hercules espy there but an old man, fast asleep? But was it really and truly an old man? Certainly, at first sight, it looked very like one, but on closer inspection it rather seemed to be some kind of creature that lived in the sea, for on his legs and arms there were scales such as fishes have. He was web-footed and web-fingered, after the fashion of a duck, and his long beard, being of a greenish tinge, had more the appearance of a tuft of seaweed than of ordinary beard. Have you never seen a stick of timber that has been so long tossed about the waves and has gotten all overgrown with barnacles and, at last drifting ashore, seems to have been thrown up from the very deepest bottom of the sea? Well, the old man would have put you in mind of just such a wave-tossed spare. But Hercules, the instant he set eyes on the strange figure, was convinced that it could be no other than the old one, who was to direct him on his way. Yes, it was the self-same old man of the sea whom the hospitable maidens had talked to him about, thanking his stars for the lucky accident of finding the old fellow asleep. Hercules stole on tiptoe towards him and caught him by the arm and leg. Tell me, cried he, before the old one was well awake, which is the way to the garden of the Hesperides? As you may easily imagine, the old man of the sea awoke in a fright, but his astonishment could hardly have been greater than was that of Hercules the next moment. For, all of a sudden, the old one seemed to disappear out of his grasp, and he found himself holding a stag by the fore and hind leg. But still he kept fast hold. Then the stag disappeared, and in its stead there was a seabird fluttering and screaming, while Hercules clutched it by the wing and claw. 
But after the bird could not get away, immediately afterward, there was an ugly three-headed dog, which growled and barked at Hercules and snapped fiercely at the hands which held him. But Hercules would not let him go. In another minute, instead of the three-headed dog, what should appear but Giron, the six-legged man-monster, kicking at Hercules with five of his legs in order to get the remaining one at liberty. But Hercules held on. By and by, no Jirion was there but a huge snake, like one of those which Hercules had strangled in his babyhood, only a hundred times as big, and it twisted and twined about the hero's neck and body, and it threw its tail high into the air, and it opened its deadly jaws, as if to devour him outright, so that it was really a very terrible spectacle. But Hercules was no whit disheartened and squeezed the great snake so tightly that he soon began to hiss with pain. You must understand that the old man of the sea, though he generally looked so much like the wave-beaten figurehead of a vessel, had the power of assuming any shape he pleased. When he found himself so roughly seized by Hercules, he had been in hope of putting him into such surprise and terror by these magical transformations that the hero would be glad to let him go. If Hercules had relaxed his grasp, the old one would certainly have plunged down to the very bottom of the sea, once he would not soon have given himself the trouble of coming up in order to answer any impertinent questions. Ninety-nine people out of a hundred, I suppose, would have been frightened out of their wits by the very first of his ugly shapes, and would have taken to their heels at once. For one of the hardest things in this world is to see the difference between real dangers and imaginary ones. But, as Hercules held on so stubbornly, and only squeezed the old one so much the tighter at every change of shape, and really put him to no small torture, he finally thought it best to reappear in his own figure. So there he was again, a fishy, scaly, web-footed sort of personage, with something like a tuft of seaweed at his chin. "'Pray, what do you want with me?' cried the old one as soon as he could take breath, for it is quite tiresome affair to go through so many false shapes. "'Why do you squeeze me so hard? Let me go, this moment, or I shall begin to consider you an extremely uncivil person.' "'My name is Hercules,' roared the mighty stranger, "'and you will never get out of my clutch "'until you tell me the nearest way to the Garden of Hesperides.' "'When the old fellow heard who it was that had caught him, "'he saw, with half an eye, "'that it would be necessary to tell him everything that he wanted to know. "'The old one was an inhabitant of the sea, you must recollect, "'and roamed about everywhere, like other seafaring people.' Of course, he had often heard of the fame of Hercules, and of the wonderful things that he was constantly performing in various parts of the earth, and how determined he always was to accomplish whatever he undertook. He, therefore, made no more attempts to escape, but told the hero how to find the Garden of the Hesperides, and likewise warned him of the many difficulties which must be overcome before he could arrive thither. You must go on. Thus and thus, said the old man of the sea, after taking the points of the compass, till you come in sight of a very tall giant, who holds the sky on his shoulders. And the giant, if he happens to be in the humor, will tell you exactly where the gardens of the Hesperides lie. And if the giant happens not to be in the humor, remarked Hercules, balancing his club on the tip of his finger, Perhaps I shall find means to persuade him. Thanking the old man of the sea and begging his pardon for having squeezed him so roughly, the hero resumed his journey. He met with a great many strange adventures which would be well worth your hearing if I had leisure to narrate them as minutely as they deserve. It was in this journey, if I mistake not, that he had encountered a prodigious giant who was so wonderfully contrived by nature that every time he touched the earth, he became ten times as strong as he ever had been seen before. His name was Zinteus. You may see, plainly enough, that it was very difficult business to fight with such a fellow, for, as often as he got a knock-down blow, up he started again, stronger, fiercer, and abler to use his weapons than if his enemy had let him alone. 
Thus, the harder Hercules pounded the giant with his club, the further he seemed from winning the victory. I have sometimes argued with such people, but never fought with one. The only way in which Hercules found it possible to finish the battle was by lifting Antaeus off his feet into the air, and squeezing and squeezing and squeezing him, until, finally, the strength was quite squeezed out of his enormous body. When this affair was finished, Hercules continued his travels and went to the land of Egypt, where he was taken prisoner and would have been put to death if he had not slain the king of the country and made his escape. Passing through the deserts of Africa and going as fast as he could, he would arrive at last on the shore of the great ocean. And here, unless he could walk on the crest of the billows, it seemed as if his journey must needs be at an end. Nothing was before him, save the foaming, dashing, measureless ocean. But, suddenly, as he looked towards the horizon, he saw something, a great way off, which he had not seen the moment before. It gleamed very brightly, almost as you may have beheld the round, golden disk of the sun, when it rises or sets over the edge of the world. It evidently drew nearer, for, at every instant, this wonderful object became larger and more lustrous. At length, it had come so nigh that Hercules discovered it to be an immense cup or bowl, made of either gold or burnished brass. How it had gotten afloat upon the sea is more than I can tell you. There it was, at all events, rolling on the tumultuous billows, which tossed it up and down and heaved their foamy tops against its sides, but without ever throwing their spray over the brim. I have seen many a giant in my time, thought Hercules, but never one that would need to drink his wine out of cup like this. And, true enough, what a cup it must have been. It was as large, as large, but, in short, I am afraid to say how immeasurably large it was. To speak within bounds, it was ten times larger than a great mill wheel, and, all of the metal as it was, it floated over the heaving surges more lightly than an acorn cup down the brook. The waves tumbled it onwards until it grazed against the shore, within a short distance of the spot where Hercules was standing. As soon as this happened, he knew what was to be done, for he had not gone through so many remarkable adventures without learning pretty well how to conduct himself whenever anything came to pass a little out of the common rule. It was just as clear as daylight that this marvelous cup had been set adrift by some unseen power, and guided hitherward in order to carry Hercules across the sea, on his way to the Garden of the Hesperides. Accordingly, without a moment's delay, he clambered over the brim and slid down on the inside, where, spreading out his lion skin, he proceeded to take a little repose. He had scarcely rested until now, since he bade farewell to the damsels on the margin of the river. The waves dashed with a pleasant and ringing sound against the circumference of the hollow cup. It rocked lightly to and fro, and the motion was so soothing that it speedily rocked Hercules into an agreeable slumber. His nap had probably lasted a good while, when the cup chanced to graze against the rock, and, in consequence, immediately resounded and reverberated through its golden or brazen substance a hundred times as loudly as ever you heard a church bell. The noise awoke Hercules, who instantly started up and gazed around him, wondering whereabouts he was. He was not long in discovering that the cup had floated across a great part of the sea, and was approaching the shore of what seemed to be an island, and, on that island, what do you think he saw? No, you'll never guess it, not if you were to try 50,000 times. It positively appears to me that this was the most marvelous spectacle that had ever been seen by Hercules, in the whole course of his wonderful travels and adventures. It was a greater marvel than the hydra with nine heads, which kept growing twice as fast as they were cut off, greater than the six-legged man-monster, greater than Antaeus, greater than anything that had ever beheld by anybody before or since the days of Hercules, or anything that remains to be beheld by travelers in all time to come. It was a giant. But such an intolerably big giant, 
a giant as tall as a mountain, so vast a giant, the clouds rested about his mist like a girdle, and hung a hoary beard from his chin, and flitted before his huge eyes so that he would never see Hercules nor the golden cup in which he was voyaging. And most wonderfully of all, the giant held up his great hands and appeared to support the sky, which, so far as Hercules could discern through the clouds, was resting upon his head. This does really seem almost too much to believe. Meanwhile, the bright cup continued to flow onward and finally touched the strand. Just then, a breeze wafted away the clouds from before the giant's visage, and Hercules beheld it with all its enormous features, eyes each of them as big as yonder lake, a nose a mile long, and a mouth of the same width. It was a countenance terrible from its enormity of size, but disconsolate and weary, even as ye may see the faces of many people nowadays who are compelled to sustain burdens above their strength. What the sky was to the giant, such are the cares of earth to those who let themselves be weighed down by them. And whenever men undertake what is beyond the measure of their abilities, they encounter precisely such a doom as had befallen this poor giant. Poor fellow! He had evidently stood there a long while. An ancient forest had been growing and decaying around his feet, and oak trees of six or seven centuries old had sprung up from the acorn and forced themselves between his toes. The giant now looked down from the far height of his great eyes, and, perceiving Hercules, roared out in a voice that resembled thunder, proceeding out of the cloud that had just flitted away from his face. Who are you? Down at my feet there. And whence do you come in that little cup? I am Hercules, thundered back the hero, in a voice pretty nearly, or quite as loud as the giant's own. And I am seeking of the garden of the Hesperides. Ho, 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 roared the giant in a fit of immense laughter. That is a wise adventure, truly. And why not? cried Hercules, getting a little angry at the giant's mirth. Do you think I am afraid of the dragons with a hundred heads? Just at this time, while they were talking together, some black clouds gathered about the giant's middle and burst into a tremendous storm of thunder and lightning, causing such a bother that Hercules found it impossible to distinguish a word. Only the giant's immeasurable legs were to be seen, standing up into the obscurity of the tempest, and now and then a momentary glimpse of his whole figure mantled in a volume of mist. He seemed to be speaking most of the time, but his big, deep, rough voice chimed in with the reverberations of the thunderclaps and rolled away over the hills like them. Thus, by talking out of season, the foolish giant expended an incalculable quantity of breath to no purpose, for the thunder spoke quite as intelligibly as he. At last the storm swept over as suddenly as it had come, and there again was the clear sky and the weary giant holding it up, and the pleasant sunshine beaming over his vast height and illuminating it against the background of the sullen thunder clouds. So far above the shower had been his head that not a hair of it was moistened by the raindrops. And when the giant could see Hercules still standing on the seashore, he roared out to him anew, I am Atlas, the mightiest giant in the world, and I hold the sky upon my head. So I see, answered Hercules, but can you show me the way to the garden of the Hesperides? What do you want there? asked the giant. I want three of the golden apples, shouted Hercules, for my cousin, the king. There is nobody but myself, quoted the giant that can go to the garden of the Hesperides and gather the golden apples. If it were not for this little business of holding up the sky, I would make half a dozen steps across the sea and get them for you. You are very kind, replied Hercules, and can you not rest the sky upon a mountain? None of them are quite high enough, said Atlas, shaking his head, but if you were to take your sand on the summit of that nearest one, your head would be pretty nearly on a level with mine. You seem to be a fellow of some strength. What if you should take on my burden on your shoulders while I do your errand for you? Hercules, as you must be careful to remember, was a remarkably strong man, and though it certainly requires a great deal of muscular power to uphold the sky, yet, if any mortal could suppose capable of such an exploit, he was the one. Nevertheless, it seems so difficult an undertaking 
that, for the first time in his life, he hesitated. Is the sky very heavy? he inquired. Why? Not particularly so, at first, answered the giant, shrugging his shoulders. But it gets to be a little burdensome after a thousand years. And how long a time, asked the hero, will it take you to get the golden apples? Oh, that will be done in a few moments, cried Ellis. I shall take ten or fifteen miles at a stride and be at the garden and back before your shoulders begin to ache. Well then, answered Hercules, I will climb the mountain behind you there and relieve you of your burden. The truth is, Hercules had a kind heart of his own and considered that he should be doing the giant a favor by allowing him this opportunity for a ramble, and, besides, he thought it would be still more for his own glory if he could boast of upholding the sky than merely to do so ordinary a thing as to conquer a dragon with a hundred heads. Accordingly, without more words, the sky was shifted from the shoulders of Atlas and placed upon those of Hercules. When this was safely accomplished, the first thing the giant did was to stretch himself, and you may imagine what a prodigious spectacle he was then. Next, he slowly lifted one of his feet out of the forest that had grown up around it, then the other. Then, then, at once he began to caper, and leap, and dance, for joy at his freedom, flinging himself nobody knows how high into the air, and floundering down again with a shock that made the earth tremble, and he laughed. Ho, 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 with a thunderous roar that echoed from the mountains, far and near as if they and the giant had been so many rejoicing brothers. When his joy had a little subsided, he stepped into the sea, ten miles at the first stride, which brought him mid-leg deep, and ten miles at the second, when the water came just above his knees, and ten more at the third, which by then he was immersed nearly to his waist. This was the greatest steps of the sea. Hercules watched the giant as he still went onward, for it was really a wonderful sight, this immense human form, more than thirty miles off, half hidden in the ocean, but with his upper half as tall and misty and blue as the distant mountain. At last the gigantic shape faded entirely out of view, and now Hercules began to consider what he should do, in case Atlas should be drowned in the sea, or if he were to be stung to death by the dragon with a hundred heads, which guarded the golden apples of the Hesperides. If any such misfortune were to happen, how could he ever get rid of the sky? And, by the by, its weight began to already be a little irksome to his head and shoulders. I really pity this poor giant, thought Hercules. If it wearies me so much in ten minutes, how must it have wearied him in a thousand years? Oh, my sweet little people, you have no idea what a weight there was in the same blue sky which looked so soft and aerial above our heads. And there, too, was the bluster of the wind and the chill and watery clouds and the blazing sun, all taking their turns to make Hercules uncomfortable. He began to be afraid that the giant would never come back. He gazed wistfully at the world beneath him and acknowledged to himself that it was a far happier kind of life to be a shepherd at the foot of the mountain than to stand on its dizzying summit and bear up the firmament with his might and mane. For, of course, as you easily understand, Hercules had an immense responsibility on his mind, as well as a weight on his head and shoulders. Why, if he did not stand perfectly still and keep the sky immovable, the sun would perhaps be put ajar, or, after night fell, a great many of the stars might be loosened from their places and shower down, like a fiery rain, upon the people's heads. And how ashamed would the hero be if, owning to his unsteadiness beneath its weight, the sky should crack and show a great fissure across it. I know not how long it was before, to his unspeakable joy, he beheld the huge shape of the giant like a cloud on the far-off edge of the sea. At his nearer approach, Atlas held up his hand, in which Hercules could perceive three magnificent golden apples, as big as pumpkins, all hanging from one branch. I am glad to see you again, shouted Hercules, when the giant was within hearing. So you have gotten the golden apples? Certainly, certainly, answered Alice, and very fair apples they are. I took the finest that grew on the tree, I assure you. Ah, it is a beautiful spot, that garden of the Hesperides. 
Yes, and the dragon with hundred heads is a sight with any man seeing. After all, you had better have gone for the apples yourself. No matter, replied Hercules. You had had a pleasant ramble and have done the business as well as I could. I hardly thank you for your trouble. And now, as I have a long way to go, and am rather in haste, as the king, my cousin, is anxious to receive the golden apples, will you be kind enough to take the sky off my shoulders again? Why, as to that, said the giant, chucking the golden apples into the air twenty miles high, or thereabouts, and catching them as they came down. As to that, my good friend, I consider you a little unreasonable. Cannot I carry the golden apples to the king, your cousin, much quicker than you could? As his majesty is in such a hurry to get them, I promise you to take my longest strides, and besides, I have no fancy for burdening myself with the sky just now. Here Hercules grew impatient, and gave a great shrug of his shoulders. It was being now twilight. You might have seen two or three stars tumble out of their places. Everybody on earth looked upward in a fright, thinking that the sky might be going to fall next. Oh, that will never do, cried Giant Atlas with a great roar of laughter. I have not let fall so many stars within the last five centuries. By the time you have stood there as long as I did, you will begin to learn patience. What? shouted Hercules, very wrathfully. Do you intend to make me bear this burden forever? We will see about that. One of these days, answered the giant. At all events, you ought to not complain. If you have to bear it the next hundred years, or perhaps the next thousand, I bore it a good while longer, in spite of the backache. Well, then, after a thousand years, if I happen to feel in the mood, we may possibly shift about again. You are certainly a very strong man, and can never have a better opportunity to prove it. Prosperity will talk of you. I warrant it. Pish! A fig for its talk, cried Hercules, with another hitch of his shoulders. Just take this guy upon your head one instant, will you? I want to make a cushion of my lion's skin for the weight to rest upon. It really chafes me and will cause unnecessary inconvenience in so many centuries as I am to stand here. That's no more than fair, and I'll do it, quoteth the giant, for he had no unkind feeling towards Hercules and was merely acting with too selfish consideration of his own ease. For just five minutes, then, I will take back the sky. Only for five minutes, recollect. I have no idea of spending another thousand years as I have spent the last. Variety is the spice of life, say I. Ah, the thick-witted old rogue of a giant. He threw down the golden apples and received back the sky from the head and shoulders of Hercules upon his own, where it rightly belonged. And Hercules picked up the three golden apples that were as big or bigger than pumpkins, and straightway set out on his journey homeward, without paying the slightest heed to the thundering tones of the giant, who bellow after him to come back. Another four sprang up around his feet and grew ancient there, and again might be seen oak trees of six or seven centuries old, that had waxed thus aged betwixt his enormous toes. And there stands the giant to this day, or, at any rate, there stands a mountain as tall as he, and which bears his name, and when the thunder rumbles about its summit, we may imagine it to be the voice of the giant Atlas, bellowing after Hercules. End of chapter 8, part 11 Chapter 8, part 12 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Stays. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part 12, The Story of Cupid and Psyche, by Thomas Bullfinch. A certain king and queen had three daughters. The charms of the two elder were more than common, but the beauty of the youngest was so wonderful that the poverty of language is unable to express its due praise. The fame of her beauty was so great 
that strangers from neighboring countries came in crowds to enjoy the sights and look on her with amazement paying her that homage which is due only to venus herself in fact venus found her altars deserted while men turned their devotions to this young virgin as she passed along the people sang her praises and strewed her away with chaplets and flowers this gave great offence to the real venus shaking her locks with indignation she exclaimed am i then to be eclipsed in my honours by a mortal girl she shall not so quietly upsert my honours i will give her cause to repent of so unlawful a beauty thereupon she calls her winged son cupid mischievous enough in his own nature and rouses and provokes him yet more by her complaints she points out psyche to him and says my dear son punish that obstinate beauty give thy mother a revenge as sweet as her injuries are great infuse into the bosom of that haughty girl a passion for some low mean unworthy being so that she may reap a mortification as great as her present exultation and triumph cupid prepare to obey the commands of his mother there are two fountains in venus's garden one of sweet waters the other of bitter cupid filled two amber vases one from each fountain and suspended them from the top of his quiver hastened to the chamber of psyche whom he found asleep he shed a few drops he shed a few drops from the bitter fountain over her lips though the sight of her almost moved him to pity then touched her side with the point of his arrow at the touch she awoke and open eyes upon cupid himself invisible which so startled him that in his own confusion he wounded himself with his own arrow heedless of his wound his whole thought now was to repair the mischief he had done and he poured the balmy drops of joy over all her silken ringlets psyche henceforth frowned upon by venus derived no benefit from all her charms true all eyes were cast eagerly upon her and every mouth spoke her praises but neither king royal youth nor plebeian presented himself to demand her in marriage her two elder sisters of moderate charms had now long been married to two royal princes but psyche in her lonely apartment deplored her solitude sick of that beauty which while it procured abundance of flattery had failed to awaken love her parents afraid they had incurred the anger of the gods consulted the oracle of apollo and received this answer the virgin is destined for the bride of no mortal lover her future husband awaits her on the top of the mountain he is a monster whom neither gods nor men can resist this dreadful decree of the oracle filled all the people with dismay and her parents abandoned themselves to grief but psyche said why my dear parents do you now lament me you should rather have grieved when the people showered upon me undeserved honours and with one voice called me a venus i now perceive that i am a victim to that name i submit lead me to that rock which my unhappy fate has destined me accordingly all things being prepared the royal maid took her place in the procession which more resembled a funeral than a nuptial prompt and with her parents amid the lamentations of the people ascended the mountain on the summit of which they left her alone and with sorrowful hearts returned home while psyche stood on the ridge of the mountains panting with fear and with eyes full of tears the gentle zephyr raised her from earth and bore her with an easy motion into a flowery dale by degrees her mind became composed and she laid herself down on the grassy bank to sleep when she awoke refreshed with sleep she looked round and beheld near by a peasant of tall and stately trees she entered it and in mist discovered a fountain sending forth clear and crystal waters and fast by a magnificent palace whose august front impressed the spectator that it was not the work of mortal hands but by the happy retreat of some god drawn by admiration and wonder she approached the building and ventured to enter every object she met filled her with pleasure and amazement golden pillars supported the vaulted roof and the walls were enriched with carvings and paintings representing beasts of the chase and rural scenes 
Proceeding onward, she perceived that besides the apartments of state, there were others filled with all manner of treasures, and beautiful and precious productions of nature and art. While her eyes were thus occupied, a voice addressed her, though she saw no one, uttering these words, Sovereign lady, all that you see is yours. We, whose voices you hear, are your servants, and shall obey all your commands, with our utmost care and diligence. Retire, therefore, to your chambers, and repose on your bed of down, and when you see fit, repair to the bath. Supper awaits you in the adjoining alcove when it pleases you to take your seat there. Psyche gave ear to the admonitions of her vocal attendants, and after the repose, the refreshments of the bath, seated herself in the alcove, where a table had mainly presented itself without any visual aid from waiters or servants, and covered with the greatest delicacies of food. Her ears, too, were feasted with music from invisible performers, of whom one sang, another played on the lute, and all closed in the wonderful harmony of a full chorus. She had not yet seen her destined husband. He came only in the hours of darkness and fled before the dawn of morning, but his accents were full of love and inspired a like passion in her. She often begged him to stay and let her behold him, but he would not consent. On the contrary, he charged her to make no attempt to see him, for it was his pleasure, for the best of reasons, to keep concealed. "'Why would you wish to behold me?' he said. "'Have you any doubt of my love? Have you any wish ungratified? If you saw me, perhaps you would fear me, perhaps adore me, but all I ask of you is to love me. I would rather you would love me as an equal than adore me as a god.' This reasoning somewhat quieted Psyche for a time, and while the novelty lasted she felt quite happy, but at length the thought of her parents, left in ignorance of her faith, and of her sisters, preyed on her mind, and made her begin to feel her palace as but a splendid prison. When her husband came one night, she told him her distress, and at last drew from him an unwilling consent that her sister should be brought to see her. So, calling Zephyr, she acquainted him with her husband's commands, and he, promptly obedient, soon brought them across the mountains down to their sister's valley. They embraced her, and she returned their caresses. Come, said Psyche, enter with me my house, and refresh thyself with whatever your sister has to offer. Then, taking their hand, she led them into her golden palace, and committed them to care of her numerous train of attendants' voices, to refresh them in her baths, and at her table, and to show them all her treasures. The view of these celestial delights caused envy to enter their bosoms, at seeing their young sister possessed of such state and splendor, so much exceeding their own. They asked her numberless questions, among others what sort of a person her husband was, Psyche replied that he was a beautiful youth, who generally spent the daytime in hunting upon the mountains. The sisters, not satisfied with this reply, soon made her confess that she had never seen him. Then they proceeded to fill her mind with dark suspicions. "'Call the mind,' they said, "'the Pythian oracle that declared you destined to marry a dreadful and tremendous monster.' The inhabitants of this valley say that your husband is a terrible and monstrous serpent who nourishes you for a while with dainties, that he may by and by devour you, take our advice, provide you with a lamp and a sharp knife, put them in concealment that your husband may not discover them, and when he is sound asleep, slip out of bed, bring forth your lamp, and see for yourself whether what they say is true or not. If it is, hesitate not to cut off the monster's head, and thereby recover your liberty. Psyche resisted these persuasions as well as she could, but they did not fail to have their effect on her mind. And when her sisters were gone, their words and her own curiosity were too strong for her to resist. So she prepared her lamp and a sharp knife, and hid them out of sight of her husband. When he had fallen asleep, she silently rose and covering her lamp beheld not a hideous monster, but the most beautiful and charming of the gods, with golden ringlets wandering over his snowy neck and crimson cheek, with two wings on his shoulders, 
whiter than snow, and with the shining feathers like the tender blossoms of spring, and she leaned over to have a nearer view of his face, a drop of burning oil fell on the shoulder of the god, startled with which he opened his eyes and fixed them full upon her. Then, without saying one word, he spread his white wings and flew out the window. Psyche, in vain, endeavoring to follow him, fell from the window to the ground. Cupid, beholding her as she lay in the dust, stopped his flight for an instant and said, "'Oh, foolish Psyche, is it thus you repay my love? After having disobeyed my mother's commands and made you my wife, will you think me a monster and cut off my head? But go, return to your sisters, who advice you seem to think preferable to mine. I inflict no other punishment on you than to leave you forever.' Love cannot dwell with suspicion. So saying, he fled away, leaving poor Psyche prostrate on the ground, filling the place with mournful imitations. When she had recovered some degree of composure, she looked around her, but the palace and gardens had vanished, and she found herself in the open field not far from the city where her sisters dwelt. She prayed thither and told them the story of her misfortunes, at which, pretending to grieve, those spiteful creatures inwardly rejoiced. For now, they said, he will perhaps choose one of us. With this idea, without saying a word of her intentions, each of them rose early the next morning, and ascended the mountain, and having reached the top, called upon Zephyr to receive her, and bear her to his lord. Then, leaping up, and not being sustained by Zephyr, fell down the precipice, and was dashed to pieces. Psyche, meanwhile, wandered day and night, without food or repose, in search of her husband, casting her eyes on a lofty mountain, having on its brow a magnificent temple, she sighed and said to herself, Perhaps my lord inhabits there, and directed her steps thither. She had no sooner entered than she saw heaps of corn, some in loose ears and some in sheaves, with mingled ears of barley, scattered about lay sickles and rakes, and all the instruments of harvest, without order, as if thrown carelessly out of the weary reaper's hands in the sultry hours of the day. This unseemly confusion Psyche put an end to, by separating and sorting everything to its proper place and kind, believing that she ought neglect none of the gods, but endeavor by her piety to engage them all in her behalf. The holy Ceres, whose temple it was, finding her so religiously employed, thus spoke to her, O oh, Psyche, truly worthy of our pity, though I cannot shield you from the frowns of Venus, yet I can teach you how to best allay her displeasure. Go, then, and voluntarily surrender yourself to your lady and sovereign, and try by modesty and submission to win her forgiveness, and perhaps her favor will restore you the husband you have lost. Psyche obeyed the command of Ceres, and took her way to the temple of Venus, endeavoring to fortify her mind and ruminating on what she should say and how best to propitiate the angry goddess, feeling that the issue was doubtful and perhaps fatal. Venus received her with angry countenance, most undutiful and faithless of servants, said she. Do you at least remember that you really have a mistress? Or have you rather come to see your sick husband laid up on the wound given him by his loving wife? Are you so ill-favored and disagreeable that the only way you can marry your lover must be by dint of industry and diligence? I will make trial of your housewifery. She then ordered Psyche to be led to the storehouse of her temple, where it was laid upon a great quantity of wheat, barley, millet, vetches, beans, and lentils, prepared for food for her pigeons, and said, Take and separate all these grains, putting all of the same kind in a parcel by themselves, and see that you get it done before evening. Then Venus departed and left her to her task. But Psyche, in a perfect consternation at the enormous work, sat stupid and silent, without moving a finger to the inextricable heap. While she sat despairing, Cupid stirred up the little ant, a native of the fields, to take compassion on her. The leader of the ant hill, followed by whole hosts of his six-legged subjects, approached the heap, and with the utmost diligence, taking grain by grain, they separated the pile, 
sorting each kind to its parcel, and when it was all done, they vanished out of sight in a moment. Venus, at the approach of twilight, returned from the banquet of the gods, breathing odors and crowned with roses. Seeing the task done, she exclaimed, This is no work of your own, wicked one, but his, whom to your own and his misfortune you have enticed. So saying, she threw her a piece of black bread for her supper and went away. Next morning, Venus ordered Psyche to be called, and said to her, Behold, yonder grove which stretches along the margin of the water, there you will find sheep feeding without a shepherd, with golden shining fleeces on their backs. Go, fetch me a sample of that precious wool gathered from every one of their fleeces. Psyche obediently went to the riverside, prepared to do her best to execute the command. But the river god inspired the reeds with harmonious murmurs, which seemed to say, O maiden, severely tried, tempt not the dangerous flood, nor venture along the formidable rams on the other side. For as long as they are under the influence of the rising sun, they burn with a cruel rage to destroy mortals with their sharp horns or rude teeth. But the shade and the serene spirit of the flood has lulled them to rest. You may then cross in the safety, and you will find the woolly golden sticking to the bushes and the trunks of the trees. Thus the compassionate river god gave Psyche instructions how to accomplish her task, and by observing his directions she soon returned to Venus with her arms full of golden fleece, but she received not the approbation of her implacable mistress who said, I know very well that it is by none of your own doing that you have succeeded in this task, and I am not satisfied yet that you have any capacity to make yourself useful. But I have another task for you. Here, take this box, and go your way to the infernal shades, and give this box to Prosperine, say, My mistress Venus desires you to send her a little of your beauty, for intending her sick son, she had lost some of her own. Be not too long on your errand, for I must paint myself with it to appear at the circle of the gods and goddesses this evening. Psyche was now satisfied that her destruction was at hand, being obliged to go with her own feet directly down to Erebus, wherefore to make no delay of what was not to be avoided. She goes to the top of a high tower to precipitate herself headlong, thus to descend the shortest way to the shades below. But a voice from the tower said to her, Why, poor unlucky girl, dost thou design to put an end to thy days in so dreadful a manner? And what cowardice makes thee sink under this last danger, who has been so miraculously supported in all thy former? And then the voice told her how, by a certain cave she might reach the realms of Pluto, and how to avoid all the dangers of the road, to pass by Cerberus, the three-headed dog, and prevail upon Charon, the ferryman, to take her across the black river and bring her back again. But the voice added, When Proserpine has given you the box filled with her beauty, of all things this chiefly to be observed by you, that you never once open or look into the box, nor allow your curiosity to pry into the treasure of the beauty of the goddesses. Psyche, encouraged by this advice, obeyed it in all things, and taking heed to her ways travelled safely to the kingdom of Pluto. She was admitted to the palace of Proserpine, and without accepting the seat or delicious banquet that was offered her, but contented with coarse bread for her food, she delivered her message from Venus. Presently the box was returned to her, shut and filled with the press's commodity. Then she returned the way she came, and gladly was she to come out once more into the light of day. But having got so far successfully through her dangerous task, a longing desire seized her to examine the contents of the box. What, said she, shall I, the carrier of this divine beauty, not take the least bit to put on my cheeks to appear to more advantage in the eyes of my beloved husband? So she carefully opened the box but found nothing there of any beauty at all, but an infernal and truly Stygian sleep, which thus set free from its prison, took possession of her, and she fell down in the midst of the road, without sense or motion. 
but Cupid, being now recovered from his wound, and not able longer to bear the absence of his beloved Psyche slipping through the smallest crack of the window of his chamber, which happened to be left open, flew to the spot where Psyche lay, and gathering up the sleep from her body, closed it again in the box, and waked Psyche with the light touch of one of his arrows. Again, said he, hast thou almost perished by the same curiosity, but now perform exactly the task imposed on you by my mother, and I will take care of the rest. Then Cupid, as swift as lightning, penetrating the heights of heaven, presented himself before Jupiter with his supplication. Jupiter lent a favoring ear and pleaded the cause of the lovers so earnestly with Venus that he won her consent. On this he sent Mercury to bring Psyche up to the heavenly assembly. And when she arrived, handing her a cup of ambrosia, he said, Drink this, Psyche, and be immortal, nor shall Cupid ever break away from the knot in which he is tied, but these nuptials shall be perpetual. End of chapter 8, part 12Chapter 8, Part 13 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 8, Myths of Greece and Rome. Part 13, How Phython Drove the Sun by Thomas Bilfinch. Phython was the son of Apollo and the nymph Clymene. One day, a schoolfellow laughed at the idea of his being the son of the god, and Phython went in rage and shame and reported it to his mother. If, said he, I am indeed of heavenly birth, give me, mother, some proof of it, and establish my claim to the honor. Clymene stretched forth her hands towards the skies and said, I call to witness the sun which looks down upon us, that I have told you the truth. If I speak falsely, let this be the last time I behold his light. But it needs not much labor to go and inquire for yourself. The land whence the sun rises lies next to ours. Go and demand of him whether he will own you as a son. Phython heard with delight. He traveled to India, which lies directly in the regions of sunrise, and, full of hope and pride, approached the goal whence his parent begins his course. The palace of the sun stood reared aloft on columns, glittering with gold and precious stones, while polished ivory formed in the ceilings, and silver the doors. Upon the walls, Vulcan had represented earth, sea, and skies with their inhabitants. In the sea were the nymphs, some sporting in the waves, some riding on the backs of fishes, while others sat upon the rocks and dried their sea-green hair. The earth had its towns and forests and rivers, over all was carved the likeness of the glorious heaven, and on the silver doors the twelve signs of the zodiac, six on each side. Clymene's son advanced up the steep ascent, and entered the halls of his father. He approached the paternal presence, but stopped at a distance, for the light was more than he could bear. Phoebus, arrayed in a purple vesture, sat on a throne, which glittered as with diamonds. On his right hand and his left stood the day, the month and the year, and, at regular intervals, the hours. Spring stood with her head crowned with flowers, and summer with a garland formed of spares of ripened grain, and autumn with his feet stained with grape juice, and icy winter with his hair stiffened with hoar frost. Surrounded by these attendants, the sun, with the eye that sees everything, beheld the youth dazzled with the novelty and splendor of the scene, and inquired the purpose of his errand. The youth replied, O light of the boundless world, Phoebus, my father, if you permit me to use that name, give me some proof, I beseech you by which I may be known as yours. He seized, and his father, laying aside the beams that shone all around his head, bade him approach, and embracing him, said, My son, you deserve not to be disowned, and I confirm what your mother has told you. To put an end to your doubts, ask what you will, the gift shall be yours. 
I called to witness that dreadful lake, which I never saw, but which we got swear by in our most solemn engagements. Phaethon immediately asked to be permitted for one day to drive the chariot of the sun. The father repented of his promise. Thrice and four times he shook his radiant head in warning. I have spoken rashly, said he. This request only I would deny. I beg you to withdraw it. It is not a safe boon, nor one, my Phaethon, suited to your youth and strength. Your lot is mortal, and you ask what is beyond a mortal's power. In your ignorance, you aspire to do that which not even the gods themselves may do. None but myself may drive the flaming car of day. Not even Jupiter, whose terrible right arm hurls the thunderbolts. The first part of the way is steep. And such as the horses, when fresh in the morning, can hardly climb. The middle is high up in the heavens, whence I myself can scarcely, without alarm, look down and behold the earth and sea stretched beneath me. The last part of the road descends rapidly and requires most careful driving. Tethys, who is waiting to receive me, often trembles for me lest I should fall headlong. And to all this, the heaven is all the time turning round and carrying the stars with it. I have to be perpetually on my guard, lest that movement, which sweeps everything else along, should hurry me also away. Suppose I should lend you the chariot, what would you do? Could you keep your course while the earth was revolving under you? Perhaps you think that there are forests and cities, the abodes of gods, and palaces and temples on the way. On the contrary, the road is though the midst of frightful monsters. You pass by the horns of the bull. In front of the archer, and near the lion's jaws, and where the scorpion stretches its arms in one direction and the crab in another. Nor will you find it easy to guide those horses with their breasts full of fire that they breathe forth from their mouths and nostrils. I can scarcely govern them myself when they are unruly and resist the reins. Beware, my son, lest I be the donor of a fatal gift. Recall your request while yet you may. Do you ask me for a proof that you are sprung from my blood? I give you a proof in my fears for you. Look in my face. I would that you could look into my heart. You would there see all a father's anxiety. Finally, he continued, look round the world and choose whatever you will of what earth or sea contains most precious. Ask it and fear no refusal. This only I pray you not to urge. It is not honor, but destruction you seek. Why do you hang round my neck and still entreat me? You shall have it if you persist. The oath is sworn and must be kept. But I beg you to choose more wisely. He ended, but the youth rejected all admonition and held to his demand. So, having resisted as long as he could, Phoebus at last led the way to where stood the lofty chariot. It was of gold. The gift of Vulcan, the axle was of gold, the pole and wheels of gold, the spokes of silver. Along the seat were rows of chrysolites and diamonds, which reflected the brightness of the sun. While the daring youth gazed in admiration, the early dawn threw open the purple doors of the east and showed the pathway strewn with roses. The stars withdrew, marshaled by the day star, which last of all retired also. The father, when he saw the earth beginning to glow. And the moon preparing to retire, ordered the hours to harness up the horses. They obeyed and led forth the steeds from the lofty stalls and attached the reins. Then the father bathed the face of his son with a powerful ointment and made him capable of enduring the brightness of the flame. He set the reins on his head and, with a foreboding sigh, said, "If my son, you will in this at least heed my advice." Spare the whip and hold tight the reins; they go fast enough of their own accord. The labor is to hold them in. You are not to take the straight road directly between the five circles, but turn off to the left. Keep within the limit of the middle zone and avoid the northern and southern alike. You will see the marks of the wheels, and they will serve to guide you. And that the skies and the earth may each receive their due share of heat, go not too high. Or you will burn the heavenly dwellings, nor too low, or you will set the earth on fire. The middle course is safest and best. 
And now I leave you to your chance, which I hope will plan better for you than you have done for yourself. Night is passing out of the western gates, and we can delay no longer. Take the reins, but if at last your heart fails you, and you will benefit by my advice, stay where you are in safety, and suffer me to light and warm the earth. The agile youth sprang into the chariot, stood erect, and grasped the reins with delight, pouring out thanks to his reluctant parent. Meanwhile, the horses filled the air with their snortings and fiery breath, and stamped the ground impatiently. Now the bars are let down, and the boundless plain of the universe lies open before them. They dart forward and cleave the opposing clouds, and outrun the morning breezes which started from the same eastern goal. The steeds soon perceive that the load they drew was lighter than usual, and as a ship without ballast is tossed hither and thither on the sea, so the chariot, without its accustomed weight, was dashed about as if empty. They rush headlong and leave the travelled road. Phaethon is alarmed, and knows not how to guide them, nor, if he knew, has he the power. Then, for the first time, the great and little bear were scorched with heat, and would fain, if it were possible, have plunged into the water. And the serpent which lies coiled up round in the North Pole, torpid and harmless, grew warm, and with warmth felt its rage revive. When Phaethon looked down upon the earth, now spreading in vast extent beneath him, he grew pale and his knees shook with terror. In spite of the glare all around him, the sight of his eyes grew dim. He wished he had never touched his father's horses, never learned his parentage, never prevailed in his request. He is borne along like a vessel that flies before a tempest, when the pilot can do no more. What shall he do? Much of the heavenly road is left behind, but more remains before. He turns his eyes from one direction to the other, now to the goal whence he began his course, now to the realms of sunset which he is not destined to reach. He loses his self-command and knows not what to do. Whether to draw tight the reins or throw them loose, he forgets the names of the horses. He sees with terror the monstrous forms scattered over the surface of heaven, here the scorpion extended his two great arms, with his tail and crooked claws stretching over two signs of the zodiac. When the boy beheld him, reeking with poison and menacing with his fangs, his courage failed, and the reins fell from his hands. The horses, when they felt them loose on their backs, dashed headlong and unrestrained went off into unknown regions of the sky, in among the stars, hurling the chariot over pathless places, now up in high heaven now down almost to the earth. The moon saw with astonishment her brother's chariot running beneath her own. The clouds begin to smoke, and the mountain tops take fire. The fields are parched with heat, the plants wither, the trees with their leafy branches burn, the harvest is ablaze. But these are small things. Great cities perished, with their walls and towers, whole nations with their people were consumed to ashes. Then Phaethon beheld the world on fire, and felt the heat intolerable. The air he breathed was like the air of a furnace, and full of burning ashes, and the smoke was of pitchy darkness. He dashed forward he knew not whither. Then, it is believed, the people of Ethiopia became black by the blood being forced so suddenly to the surface, and the Libyan desert was dried up to the condition in which it remains to this day. The nymphs of the fountains with disheveled hair, mourned their waters, nor were the rivers safe beneath their banks. The Nile fled away and hid his head in the desert, and there it still remains concealed. Where he used to discharge his waters through seven mouths into the sea, there seven dry channels alone remained. The earth cracked open, and through the chinks, light broke into Tartarus and frightened the king of shadows and his queen. The sea shrank up. Where before was water, it became a dry plain, and the mountains that lie beneath the waves lifted up their heads and became islands. The fishes sought the lowest depths, and the dolphins no longer ventured as usual to sport on the surface. Thrice Neptune essayed to raise his head above the surface, and thrice was driven back by the heat. Earth, surrounded as she was by waters, yet with head and shoulders bare, screening her face with her hand, looked up to heaven, and with a husky voice called on Jupiter. 
O oh, ruler of the gods, if I have deserved this treatment, and it is your will that I perish with fire, why withhold your thunderbolts? Let me at least fall by your hand. Is this the reward of my fertility, of my obedient service? Is it for this that I have supplied herbage for cattle, and fruits for men, and frankincense for your altars? But if I am unworthy of regard, what has my brother Ocean done to deserve such a fate? If neither of us can excite your pity, think, I pray you, of your own heaven, and behold how both the poles are smoking which sustain your palace, which must fall if they be destroyed. Atlas faints, and Scars holds up his burden. If sea, earth, and heaven perish, we fall into ancient chaos. Save what yet remains to us from the devouring flame. Oh, take thought for our deliverance in this awful moment. Thus spoke earth, and overcome with heat and thirst, could say no more. Then Jupiter omnipotent, calling to witness all the gods, including him who had lent the chariot, and showing them that all was lost unless some speedy remedy were applied, mounted the lofty tower from whence he diffuses clouds over the earth, and hurled the forked lightnings, but at that time not a cloud was to be found to interpose for a screen to earth, nor was a shower remaining unexhausted. He thundered, and brandishing a lightning bolt in his right hand, launched it against the charioteer, and struck him at the same moment from his seat and from existence. Phython, with his hair on fire, fell headlong, like a shooting star which marks the heavens with its brightness as it falls, and Eridanus, the great river, received him and cooled his burning frame. End of chapter 8, part 13「8 Part 14 of Junior Classics Volume 2 – Folk Tales and Myths – This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. – Junior Classics Volume 2 – Folk Tales and Myths – by William Patton Chapter 8 – Myths of Greece and Rome – Part 14 – Bosses and Philemon, who were changed into two trees – by Thomas Bullfinch. On a certain hill in Phrygia stands a linden tree and an oak, enclosed by a low wall. Not far from the spot is a marsh, formerly good habitable land, but now indented with pools, the resort of fenbirds and cormorants. Once on a time, Jupiter, in human shape, visited this country, and with him his son Mercury, without his wings. They presented themselves as weary travellers at many a door, seeking rest and shelter, but found all closed, for it was late, and the inhospitable inhabitants would not rouse themselves to open for their reception. At last, a humble mansion received them, a small thatched cottage, where Baucis, a pious old dame, and her husband Philemon had grown old together. Not ashamed of their poverty, they made it endurable by moderate desires and kind dispositions. One need not look there for master or for servant. They too were the whole household, master and servant alike. When the two heavenly guests crossed the humble threshold and bowed their heads to pass under the low door, the old man placed a seat on which Bosses, bustling and attentive, spread a cloth and begged them to sit down. Then she raked out the coals from the ashes and kindled up a fire, fetted with leaves and dry bark, and with her scanty breath blew it into a flame. She brought out of a corner split sticks and dry branches, broke them up, and placed them under the small kettle. Her husband collected some pot herbs in the garden, and she shred them from the stalks and prepared them for the pot. He reached down with a forked stick a flitch of bacon hanging in the chimney, cut a small piece and put it in the pot to boil with the herbs, setting away the rest for another time. A beechen bowl was filled with warm water that their guests might wash. While all was doing, they beguiled the time with conversation. On the bench designed for the guests was laid a cushion stuffed with seaweed and a cloth, only produced on great occasions, but ancient and coarse enough, was spread over that. The old lady, with her apron on, with trembling hands, set the table. One leg was shorter than the rest, but a piece of slate put under restored the level. When fixed, she rubbed the table down with some sweet-smelling herbs, 
Upon it, she set some olives, some berries preserved in vinegar, and added radishes and cheese, with eggs lightly cooked in the ashes. All were served in earthen dishes, and an earthenware pitcher with wooden cups stood beside them. When all was ready, the stew, smoking hot, was set on the table. Some wine, not of the oldest, was added, and for dessert, apples and wild honey, and over and above all, friendly faces and simple but hearty welcome. Now, while the repast proceeded, the old folks were astonished to see that the wine, as fast as it was poured out, renewed itself in the pitcher of its own accord. Struck with terror, bosses and Philemon recognized their heavenly guests, fell on their knees and with clasped hands implored forgiveness for their poor entertainment. There was an old goose, which they kept as the guardian of their humble cottage, and they bethought them to make this a sacrifice in honor of their guests. But the goose, too nimble with the aid of feet and wings for the old folks, eluded their pursuit, and at last took shelter between the gods themselves. They forbade it to be slain, and spoke in these words, We are gods. This inhospitable village shall pay the penalty of its impiety. You alone shall go free from the chastisement. Quit your house, and come with us to the top of yonder hill. They hastened to obey, and, staff in hand, labored up the steep ascent. They had reached to within an arrow's flight of the top, when turning their eyes below, they beheld all the country sunk in a lake, only their own house left standing. While they gazed with wonder at the sight, and lamented the fate of their neighbors, that old house of theirs was changed into a temple. Columns took the place of the corner post, the thatch grew yellow, and appeared a gilded roof. The floors became marble, the doors were enriched with carving and ornaments of gold. Then spoke Jupiter in benignant accents. Excellent old man, and a woman worthy of such a husband. Speak, tell us your wishes. What favor have you to ask of us? Philemon took counsel with bosses a few moments, then declared to the gods their united wish. We ask to be priests and guardians of this your temple, and since here we have passed our lives in love and concord, we wish that one and the same hour may take us both from life, that I may not live to see her grave, nor be laid in my own by her. Their prayer was granted. They were the keepers of the temple as long as they lived. When grown very old, as they stood one day before the steps of the sacred edifice and were telling the story of the place, Bosses saw Philemon begin to put forth leaves, and old Philemon saw Bosses changing in like manner. And now a leafy crown had grown over their heads while exchanging parting words, as long as they could speak. Farewell, dear spouse, they said together, and at the same moment the bar closed over their mouths. The Tyanean shepherd still shows the two trees standing side by side, made out of the two good old people. End of chapter 8, part 14「Chapter Eight, Part Fifteen of Junior Classics, Volume Two, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume Two, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter Eight, Myths of Greece and Rome, Part Fifteen, The Paradise of Children by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Long, long ago, when this old world was in its tender infancy, there was a child named Epimetheus, who never had either father or mother, and that he might not be lonely, another child, fatherless and motherless like himself, was sent from a far country to live with him and be his playfellow and helpmate. Her name was Pandora. The first thing that Pandora saw when she entered the cottage where Epimetheus dwelt was a great box, and almost the first question which she put to him after crossing the threshold was this, Epimetheus, what have you in that box? My dear little Pandora, answered Epimetheus, that is a secret, and you must be kind enough not to ask any questions about it. The box was left here to be kept safely, and I do not myself know what it contains. But who gave it to you? asked Pandora, and where did it come from? 
That is a secret, too, replied Epimetheus. How provoking, exclaimed Pandora, pouting her lip. I wish the great ugly box were out of the way. Oh, come, don't think of it any more, cried Epimetheus. Let us run out of doors and have some nice play with the other children. It is thousands of years since Epimetheus and Pandora were alive, and the world nowadays is a very different sort of thing from what it was in their time. Then everybody was a child. There needed no fathers and mothers to take care of the children, because there was no danger nor trouble of any kind, and no clothes to be mended, and there was always plenty to eat and drink. Whenever a child wanted his dinner, he found it growing on a tree, and if he looked at the tree in the morning, he could see the expanding blossom of that night's supper, or at eventide, he saw the tender bud of tomorrow's breakfast. It was a very pleasant life indeed. No labor to be done, no tasks to be studied, nothing but sports and dances and sweet voices of children talking or caroling like birds or gushing out in merry laughter throughout the livelong day. What was most wonderful of all, the children never quarreled among themselves. Neither had they any crying fits, nor, since time first began, had a single one of these little mortals ever gone apart into a corner and sulked. Oh, what a good time was that to be alive in! The truth is, those ugly little winged monsters called Troubles, which are now almost as numerous as mosquitoes, had never yet been seen on the earth. It is probable that the very greatest disquietude which a child had ever experienced was Pandora's vexation at not being able to discover the secret of the mysterious box. This was at first only the faint shadow of a trouble, but every day it grew more and more substantial until before a great while the cottage of Epimetheus and Pandora was less sunshiny than those of the other children. "'Whence can the box have come?' Pandora continually kept saying to herself and to Epimetheus, and what in the world can be inside of it? Always talking about this box, said Epimetheus at last, for he had grown extremely tired of the subject. I wish, dear Pandora, you would try to talk of something else. Come, let us go and gather some ripe figs and eat them under the trees for our supper. And I know a vine that has the sweetest and juiciest grapes you have ever tasted." "'Always talking about grapes and figs,' cried Pandora, pettishly. "'Well, then,' said Epimetheus, who was a very good-tempered child, like a multitude of children in those days, "'let us run out and have a merry time with our playmates.' "'I'm tired of merry times, and I don't care if I ever have any more,' answered our pettish little Pandora. "'And besides, I never do have any. This ugly box!' I am so taken up with thinking about it all the time. I insist upon your telling me what is inside of it. As I have already said fifty times over, I do not know, replied Epimetheus, getting a little vexed. How then can I tell you what is inside? You might open it, said Pandora, looking sideways at Epimetheus, and then we could see for ourselves. Pandora, what are you thinking of? exclaimed Epimetheus and his face expressed so much horror at the idea of looking into a box which had been confided to him on the condition of his never opening it, that Pandora thought it best not to suggest it any more. Still, however, she could not help thinking and talking about the box. "'At least,' she said, "'you can tell me how it came here.' "'It was left at the door,' replied Epimetheus." just before you came, by a person who looked very smiling and intelligent, and who could hardly forbear laughing as he put it down. He was dressed in an odd kind of cloak, and had on a cap that seemed to be made partly of feathers, so that it looked almost as if it had wings. "'What sort of staff had he?' asked Pandora. "'Oh, the most curious staff you ever saw!' cried Epimetheus. It was like two serpents, twisting around a stick, and was carved so naturally that at first I thought the serpents were alive. "'I know him,' said Pandora, thoughtfully. "'Nobody else has such a staff. It was Quicksilver, and he brought me hither, as well as the box. No doubt he intended it for me, and most probably it contains pretty dresses for me to wear, or toys for you and me to play with, or something very nice for us both to eat.' "'Perhaps so,' answered Epimetheus, turning away. "'But until Quicksilver comes back and tells us so, "'we have neither of us any right to lift the lid of the box.' 
"'What a dull boy he is!' muttered Pandora, as Epimetheus left the cottage. "'I do wish he had a little more enterprise.' For the first time since her arrival, Epimetheus had gone out without asking Pandora to accompany him. He went to gather figs and grapes by himself, or to seek whatever amusement he could find in other society than his little playfellows. He was tired to death of hearing about the box, and heartily wished that Quicksilver, or whatever was the messenger's name, had left it at some other child's door, where Pandora would never have set eyes on it. So perseveringly as she did babble about this one thing. The box, the box, and nothing but the box. It seemed as if the box were bewitched, and as if the cottage were not big enough to hold it without Pandora's continually stumbling over it and making Epimetheus stumble over it likewise and bruising all four of their shins. Well, it was really hard that poor Epimetheus should have a box in his ears from morning till night, especially as the little people of the earth were so unaccustomed to vexations in those happy days that they knew not how to deal with them. Thus, a small vexation made as much disturbance then as a far bigger one would in our own times. After Epimetheus was gone, Pandora stood gazing at the box. She had called it ugly above a hundred times, but, in spite of all that she had said against it, it was positively a very handsome article of furniture, and would have been quite an ornament to any room in which it should be placed. It was made of a beautiful kind of wood with dark and rich veins spreading over its surface, which was so highly polished that little Pandora could see her face in it. As the child had no other looking-glass, it is odd that she did not value the box merely on this account. The edges and corners of the box were carved with most wonderful skill. Around the margin were figures of graceful men and women, and the prettiest children ever seen, reclining or sporting amid a profusion of flowers and foliage. And these various objects were so exquisitely represented, and were wrought together in such harmony, that flowers, foliage, and human beings seemed to combine into a wreath of mingled beauty. But here and there, peeping forth from behind the carved foliage, Pandora once or twice fancied that she saw a face not so lovely, or something or other that was disagreeable, and which stole the beauty out of all the rest. Nevertheless, on looking more closely, and touching the spot with her finger, she could discover nothing of the kind. Some face that was really beautiful had been made to look ugly by her catching a sideways glimpse at it. The most beautiful face of all was done in what is called high relief in the center of the lid. There was nothing else, save the dark, smooth richness of the polished wood, and this one face in the center with a garland of flowers about its brow. Pandora had looked at this face a great many times, and imagined that the mouth could smile if it liked, or be grave when it chose, the same as any living mouth. The features, indeed, all wore a very lively and rather mischievous expression, which looked almost as if its needs must burst out of the carved lips and utter itself in words. Had the mouth spoken, it would probably have been something like this. Do not be afraid, Pandora. What harm can there be in opening the box? Never mind that poor, simple Epimetheus. You are wiser than he, and have ten times as much spirit. Open the box, and see if you do not find something very pretty. The box, I had almost forgotten to say, was fastened, not by a lock nor by any other such contrivance, but by a very intricate knot of gold cord. There appeared to be no end to this knot, and no beginning. Never was a knot so cunningly twisted, nor with so many ins and outs, which roguishly defied the skillfulest fingers to disentangle them. And yet, by the very difficulty that there was in it, Pandora was the more tempted to examine the knot, and just see how it was made. Two or three times, already, she had stooped over the box, and taken the knot between her thumb and forefinger, but without positively trying to undo it. "'I really believe,' she said to herself, "'that I begin to see how it was done. Nay, perhaps I could tie it up again after undoing it. There would be no harm in that, surely. Even Epimetheus would not blame me for that.' I need not open the box, and should not, of course, without the foolish boy's consent, even if the knot were untied. It might have been better for Pandora if she had had a little work to do, or anything to employ her mind upon, so as not to be so constantly thinking of this one subject. But children led so easy a life before any troubles came into the world, that they had really a great deal too much leisure. 
They could not be forever playing at hide-and-seek among the flower shrubs or at blind man's bluff with garlands over their eyes or at whatever other games had been found out while Mother Earth was in her babyhood. When life is all sport, toil is the real play. There was absolutely nothing to do. A little sweeping and dusting about the cottage, I suppose, and the gathering of fresh flowers, which were only too abundant everywhere, and arranging them in vases, and poor little Pandora's day's work was over. And then, for the rest of the day, there was the box. After all, I am not quite sure that the box was not a blessing to her in its way. It supplied her with such a variety of ideas to think of and to talk about whenever she had anybody to listen. When she was in good humor, she could admire the bright polish of its sides and the rich border of beautiful faces and foliage that ran all around it. Or, if she chanced to be ill-tempered, she could give it a push or kick it with her naughty little foot. And many a kick did the box. But it was a mischievous box, as we shall see, and deserved all it got. Many a kick did it receive. But certain it is, if it had not been for the box, our active-minded little Pandora would not have known half so well how to spend her time as she now did. For it was really an endless employment to guess what was inside. What could it be indeed? Just imagine, my little hearers, how busy your wits would be if there were a great box in the house which, as you might have reason to suppose, contained something new and pretty for your Christmas or New Year's gifts. Do you think that you should be less curious than Pandora? If you were left alone with the box, might you not feel a little tempted to lift the lid? But you would not do it. Oh, fie! No, no! Only if you thought there were toys in it, it would be so very hard to let slip an opportunity of taking just one peep. I know not whether Pandora expected any toys, for none had yet begun to be made, probably in those days when the world itself was one great plaything for the children that dwelt upon it. But Pandora was convinced that there was something very beautiful and valuable in the box, and therefore she felt just as anxious to take a peep as any of these little girls here around me would have felt, and possibly a little more so, but of that I am not quite so certain. On this particular day, however, which we have so long been talking about, her curiosity grew so much greater than it usually was, that at last she approached the box. She was more than half determined to open it if she could. Ah, naughty Pandora! First, however, she tried to lift it. It was heavy. Quite too heavy for the slender strength of a child like Pandora. She raised one end of the box a few inches from the floor and let it fall again with a pretty loud thump. A moment afterwards she almost fancied that she heard something stir inside of the box. She applied her ear as closely as possible and listened. Positively there did seem to be a kind of stifled murmur within. Or was it merely the singing in Pandora's ears? Or could it be the beating of her heart? The child could not quite satisfy herself whether she had heard anything or no. But at all events, her curiosity was stronger than ever. As she drew back her head, her eyes fell upon the knot of gold cord. "'It must have been a very ingenious person who tied this knot,' said Pandora to herself. "'But I think I could untie it nevertheless. "'I am resolved at least to find the two ends of the cord.' So she took the golden knot in her fingers and pried into its intricacies as sharply as she could. Almost without intending it, or quite knowing what she was about, she was soon busily engaged in attempting to undo it. Meanwhile, the bright sunshine came through the open window, as did likewise the merry voices of the children, playing at a distance, and perhaps the voice of Epimetheus among them. Pandora stopped to listen. What a beautiful day it was! Would it not be wiser if she were to let the troublesome knot alone and think no more about the box, but run and join her little playfellows and be happy? All this time, however, her fingers were half unconsciously busy with the knot, and, happening to glance at the flower-wreathed face on the lid of the enchanted box, she seemed to perceive it slyly grinning at her. "'That face looks very mischievous,' thought Pandora. "'I wonder whether it smiles because I'm doing wrong.' I have the greatest mind in the world to run away. But just then, by the merest accident, she gave the knot a kind of a twist which 
produced a wonderful result. The gold cord untwined itself as if by magic and left the box without a fastening. This is the strangest thing I ever knew, said Pandora. What will Epimetheus say, and how can I possibly tie it up again? She made one or two attempts to restore the knot, but soon found it quite beyond her skill. It had disentangled itself so suddenly that she could not in the least remember how the strings had been doubled into one another, and when she tried to recollect the shape and appearance of the knot, it seemed to have gone entirely out of her mind. Nothing was to be done, therefore, but to let the box remain as it was until Epimetheus should come in. But, said Pandora, when he finds the knot untied, he will know that I have done it. How shall I make him believe that I have not looked into the box? And then the thought came into her naughty little heart that, since she would be suspected of having looked into the box, she might just as well do so at once. Oh, very naughty and very foolish, Pandora! You should have thought only of doing what was right, and of leaving undone what was wrong, and not of what your playfellow Epimetheus would have said or believed. And so perhaps she might, if the enchanted face on the lid of the box had not looked so bewitchingly persuasive at her, and if she had not seemed to hear more distinctly than before the murmur of small voices within. She could not tell whether it was fancy or no, but there was quite a little tumult of whispers in her ear, or else it was her curiosity that whispered, "'Let us out, dear Pandora. Pray let us out. We will be such nice pretty playfellows for you. Only let us out.' "'What can it be?' thought Pandora. "'Is there something alive in the box? "'Well, yes, I am resolved to take just one peep. "'Only one peep, and then the lid shall be shut down as safely as ever. "'There cannot possibly be any harm in just one little peep.' "'But it is now time for us to see what Epimetheus was doing.' This was the first time since his little playmate had come to dwell with him that he had attempted to enjoy any pleasure in which she did not partake. But nothing went right, nor was he nearly so happy as on other days. He could not find a sweet grape or a ripe fig. If Epimetheus had a fault, it was a little too much fondness for figs. Or, if ripe at all, they were overripe and so sweet as to be cloying. There was no mirth in his heart such as usually made his voice gush out of its own accord and swell the merriment of his companions. In short, he grew so uneasy and discontented that the other children could not imagine what was the matter with Epimetheus. Neither did he himself know what ailed him any better than they did. For you must recollect that, at the time we are speaking of, it was everybody's nature and constant habit to be happy. The world had not yet learned to be otherwise. Not a single soul or body, since these children were first sent to enjoy themselves on the beautiful earth, had ever been sick or out of sorts. At length, discovering that, somehow or other, he put a stop to all the play, Epimetheus judged it best to go back to Pandora, who was in a humor better suited to his own. But, with a hope of giving her pleasure, he gathered some flowers and made them into a wreath, which he meant to put upon her head. The flowers were very lovely, roses and lilies and orange blossoms, and a great many more, which left a trail of fragrance behind as Epimetheus carried them along, and the wreath was put together with as much skill as could reasonably be expected of a boy. The fingers of little girls, it had always appeared to me, are the fittest to twine flower wreaths, but boys could do it in those days rather better than they can now. And here I must mention that a great black cloud had been gathering in the sky, for some time past, although it had not yet overspread the sun. But just as Epimetheus reached the cottage door, this cloud began to intercept the sunshine, and thus to make a sudden and sad obscurity. He entered softly, for he meant, if possible, to steal behind Pandora and fling the wreath of flowers over her head before she should be aware of his approach. But as it happened, there was no need of his treading so very lightly. He might have trod as heavily as he pleased, as heavily as a grown man, as heavily, I was going to say, as an elephant, without much probability of Pandora's hearing his footsteps. She was too intent upon her purpose. At the moment of his entering the cottage, the naughty child had put her hand to the lid, and was on the point of opening the mysterious box. Epimetheus beheld her. If he had cried out, Pandora would probably have withdrawn her hand, and the fatal mystery of the box might never have been known. 
But Epimetheus himself, although he said very little about it, had his own share of curiosity to know what was inside. Perceiving that Pandora was resolved to find out the secret, he determined that his playfellow should not be the only wise person in the cottage, and if there were anything pretty or valuable in the box, he meant to take half of it to himself. Thus, after all his sage speeches to Pandora about restraining her curiosity, Epimetheus turned out to be quite as foolish, and nearly as much in fault as she. So, whenever we blame Pandora for what happened, we must not forget to shake our heads at Epimetheus likewise. As Pandora raised the lid, the cottage grew very dark and dismal, for the black cloud had now swept quite over the sun and seemed to have buried it alive. There had, for a little while past, been a low growling and muttering, which all at once broke into a heavy peal of thunder. But Pandora, heeding nothing of all this, lifted the lid nearly upright and looked inside. It seemed as if a sudden swarm of winged creatures brushed past her, taking flight out of the box, while, at the same instant, she heard the voice of Epimetheus with a lamentable tone, as if he were in pain. "'Oh, I am stung!' cried he. "'I am stung! Naughty Pandora, why have you opened this wicked box?' Pandora let fall the lid, and, starting up, looked about her to see what had befallen Epimetheus. The thundercloud had so darkened the room that she could not very clearly discern what was in it but she heard a disagreeable buzzing, as if a great many huge flies or gigantic mosquitoes or those insects which we call door-bugs or pinching dogs were darting about. And as her eyes grew more accustomed to the imperfect light, she saw a crowd of ugly little shapes with bats' wings looking abominably spiteful and armed with terribly long stings in their tails. It was one of these that had stung Epimetheus. Nor was it a great while before Pandora herself began to scream, in no less pain and affright than her playfellow, and making a vast deal more hubbub about it. An odious little monster had settled on her forehead, and would have stung her I know not how deeply, if Epimetheus had not run and brushed it away. Now, if you wish to know what these ugly things might be, which had made their escape out of the box, I must tell you that they were the whole family of earthly troubles. There were evil passions, there were a great many species of cares, there were more than a hundred and fifty sorrows, there were diseases in a vast number of miserable and painful shapes, there were more kinds of naughtiness than it would be of any use to talk about. In short, everything that has since afflicted the souls and bodies of mankind had been shut up in the mysterious box and given to Epimetheus and Pandora to be kept safely in order that the happy children of the world might never be molested by them. Had they been faithful to their trust, all would have gone well. No grown person would ever have been sad, nor any child have had cause to shed a single tear from that hour until this moment. But, and you may see by this how a wrong act of any one mortal is a calamity to the whole world, by Pandora's lifting the lid of that miserable box, and by the fault of Epimetheus too, in not preventing her. These troubles have obtained a foothold among us, and do not seem very likely to be driven away in a hurry. For it was impossible, as you will easily guess, that the two children should keep the ugly swarm in their own little cottage. On the contrary, the first thing that they did was to fling open the doors and windows in hopes of getting rid of them. And sure enough, away flew the winged troubles all abroad, and so pestered and tormented the small people everywhere about, that none of them so much as smiled for many days afterwards. And, what was very singular, all the flowers and dewy blossoms on earth, not one of which had hitherto faded, now began to droop and shed their leaves after a day or two. The children, moreover, who before seemed immortal in childhood, now grew older, day by day, and came soon to be youths and maidens, and men and women, by and by, and aged people, before they dreamed of such a thing. Meanwhile, the naughty Pandora, and hardly less naughty Epimetheus, remained in their cottage. Both of them had been grievously stung, and were in a good deal of pain, which seemed the more intolerable to them, because it was the very first pain that had ever been felt since the world began. Of course, they were entirely unaccustomed to it, and could have no idea what it meant. Besides all this, they were in exceedingly bad humor, both with themselves and with one another. 
In order to indulge it to the utmost, Epimetheus sat down sullenly in a corner with his back towards Pandora, while Pandora flung herself upon the floor and rested her head on the fatal and abominable box. She was crying bitterly and sobbing as if her heart would break. Suddenly there was a gentle little tap on the inside of the lid. "'What can it be?' cried Pandora, lifting her head. But either Epimetheus had not heard the tap, or was too much out of humor to notice it. At any rate, he made no answer. "'You are very unkind,' said Pandora, sobbing anew, "'not to speak to me.' Again the tap. It sounded like the tiny knuckles of a fairy's hand, knocking lightly and playfully on the inside of the box. "'Who are you?' asked Pandora, with a little of her former curiosity. "'Who are you inside of this naughty box?' A sweet little voice spoke from within. "'Only lift the lid and you shall see.' "'No, no,' answered Pandora, again beginning to sob. "'I have had enough of lifting the lid. "'You are inside of the box, naughty creature, and there you shall stay. "'There are plenty of your ugly brothers and sisters already flying about the world. "'You need never think that I shall be so foolish as to let you out.' She looked towards Epimetheus as she spoke perhaps expecting that he would commend her for her wisdom, but the sullen boy only muttered that she was wise a little too late. "'Ah,' said the sweet little voice again, "'you had much better let me out. I am not like those naughty creatures that have stings in their tails. They are no brothers and sisters of mine, as you would see at once, if you were only to get a glimpse of me. Come, come, my pretty Pandora, I am sure you will let me out.' And indeed there was a kind of cheerful witchery in the tone that made it almost impossible to refuse anything which this little voice asked. Pandora's heart had insensibly grown lighter at every word that came from within the box. Epimetheus, too, though still in the corner, he had turned half round and seemed to be in rather better spirits than before. "'My dear Epimetheus,' cried Pandora, "'have you heard this little voice?' "'Yes, to be sure I have.' answered he, but in not very good humor as yet. And what of it? Shall I lift the lid again? asked Pandora. Just as you please, said Epimetheus. You have done so much mischief already that perhaps you may as well do a little more. One other trouble in such a swarm as you have set adrift about the world can make no very great difference. You might speak to me a little more kindly, murmured Pandora, wiping her eyes. Ah, naughty boy! cried the little voice within the box in an arch and laughing tone. "'He knows he is longing to see me. Come, my dear Pandora, lift up the lid. I am in a great hurry to comfort you. Only let me have some fresh air, and you shall soon see that matters are not quite so dismal as you think them.' "'Epimetheus!' exclaimed Pandora. "'Come what may, I am resolved to open the box.' "'And as the lid seems very heavy,' cried Epimetheus, running across the room, "'I will help you.' So, with one consent, the two children again lifted the lid. Out flew a sunny and smiling little personage, and hovered about the room, throwing a light wherever she went. "'Have you never made the sunshine dance into dark corners by reflecting it from a bit of looking-glass? Well, so looked the winged cheerfulness of this fairy-like stranger amid the gloom of the cottage.' She flew to Epimetheus and laid the least touch of her finger on the inflamed spot where the trouble had stung him, and immediately the anguish of it was gone. Then she kissed Pandora on the forehead, and her hurt was cured likewise. After performing these good offices, the bright stranger fluttered sportively over the children's heads and looked so sweetly at them that they both began to think it not so very much amiss to have opened the box, since, otherwise, their cheery guest must have been kept a prisoner among those naughty imps with stings in their tails. "'Pray who are you, beautiful creature?' inquired Pandora. "'I am to be called Hope,' answered the sunshiny figure." and because I am such a cheery little body, I was packed into the box to make amends to the human race for that swarm of ugly troubles which was destined to be let loose among them. Never fear, we shall do pretty well in spite of them all. Your wings are colored like the rainbow, exclaimed Pandora. How very beautiful! Yes, they are like the rainbow, said Hope, because glad as my nature is, I am partly made of tears as well as smiles. "'And will you stay with us?' 
asked Epimetheus, forever and ever. As long as you need me, said Hope, with her pleasant smile, and that will be as long as you live in the world. I promise never to desert you. There may come times and seasons now and then when you will think that I have utterly vanished. But again and again and again, when perhaps you least dream of it, you shall see the glimmer of my wings on the ceiling of your cottage. Yes, my dear children, and I know something very good and beautiful that is to be given you hereafter. Oh, tell us, they exclaimed. Tell us what it is. Do not ask me, replied Hope, putting her finger on her rosy mouth. But do not despair, even if it should never happen while you live on this earth. Trust in my promise, for it is true. We do trust you, cried Epimetheus and Pandora, both in one breath. And so they did. And not only they, but so has everybody trusted hope that has since been alive. And to tell you the truth, I cannot help being glad, though to be sure it was an uncommonly naughty thing for her to do, but I cannot help being glad that our foolish Pandora peeped into the box. No doubt, no doubt, the troubles are still flying about the world and have increased in multitude rather than lessened and are a very ugly set of imps and carry most venomous stings in their tails. I have felt them already and expect to feel them more as I grow older. But then that lovely and lightsome little figure of hope. What in the world could we do without her? Hope spiritualizes the earth. Hope makes it always new. And even in the earth's best and brightest aspect, Hope shows it to be only the shadow of an infinite bliss hereafter. End of chapter 8, part 15 Chapter 41, part 1 of Junior Classics, volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 9, Tales of the Hudson, Part 1, Rip Van Winkle, by Washington Irving. Whoever has made a voyage up the Hudson must remember the Catskill Mountains. They are a dismembered branch of the great Appalachian family and are seen away to the west of the river, swelling up to a noble height and lording it over the surrounding country. Every change of season, every change of weather, indeed every hour of the day produces some change in the magical hues and shapes of these mountains, and they are regarded by all the good wives far and near as perfect barometers. When the weather is fair and settled, they are clothed in blue and purple and print their bold outlines on the clear evening sky. But sometimes, when the rest of the landscape is cloudless, they will gather a hood of gray vapors about their summits, which in the last rays of the setting sun will glow and light up like a crown of glory. At the foot of these fairy mountains, the voyager may have described the light smoke curling up from a village, whose shingle roofs gleam among the trees, just where the blue tints of the upland melt away into the fresh green of the nearer landscape. It is a little village of great antiquity, having been founded by some of the Dutch colonists in the early times of the province, just about the beginning of the government of the good Peter Stuyvesant. May he rest in peace. And there were some of the houses of the original settlers standing within a few years, built of small yellow bricks brought from Holland, having latticed windows and gable fronts, surmounted with weathercocks. In that same village, in one of these very houses, which, to tell the precise truth, was sadly time-worn and weather-beaten, there lived many years since, while the country was yet a province of Great Britain, a simple, good-natured fellow of the name of Rip Van Winkle. He was a descendant of the Van Winkles, who figured so gallantly in the chivalrous days of Peter Stuyvesant, and accompanied him to the siege of Fort Christina. He inherited, however, but little of the martial character of his ancestors. I have observed that he was a simple, good-natured man. He was, moreover, a kind neighbor and an obedient henpecked husband. Indeed, to the latter circumstance might be owing that meekness of spirit which gained him such universal popularity, for those men are most apt to be obsequious and conciliating abroad 
who are under the discipline of shrews at home their tempers doubtless are rendered pliant and malleable in the fiery furnace of domestic tribulation and a certain lecture is worth all the sermons in the world for teaching the virtues of patience and long-suffering a termagant wife may therefore in some respects be considered a tolerable blessing and if so rip van winkle was thrice blessed certain it is that he was a great favorite among all good wives of the village who as usual with the amiable sex took his part in all family squabbles and never failed whenever they talked those matters over in their evening gossipings to lay all the blame on dame van winkle the children of the village too would shout with joy whenever he approached he assisted at their sports made their playthings taught them to fly kites and shoot marbles and told them long stories of ghosts witches and indians whenever he went dodging about the village he was surrounded by a troop of them hanging on his skirts clambering on his back and playing a thousand tricks on him with impunity and not a dog would bark at him throughout the neighborhood the great error in rip's composition was an insufferable aversion to all kinds of profitable labor it could not be from the want of assiduity or perseverance for he would sit on a wet rock with a rod as long and heavy as a tartar's lance and fish all day without a murmur even though he should not be encouraged by a single nibble he would carry a fowling piece on his shoulder for hours together trudging through the woods and swamps and uphill and down dale and to shoot a few squirrels or wild pigeons he would never refuse to assist a neighbor even in the roughest toil and was a foremost man in all country frolics for husking indian corn or building stone fences the women of the village too used to employ him to run their errands and to do such little odd jobs as their less obliging husbands would not do for them in a word rip was ready to attend to anybody's business but his own but as to doing family duty and keeping his farm in order he found it impossible in fact he declared it was of no use to work on his farm it was the most pestilent little piece of ground in the whole country everything about it went wrong and would go wrong in spite of him his fences were continually falling to pieces his cow would either go astray or get among the cabbages weeds were sure to grow quicker in his fields than anywhere else the rain always made a point of setting in just as he had some outdoor work to do so that though his patrimonial estate had dwindled away under his management acre by acre until there was little more left than a mere patch of indian corn and potatoes yet it was the worst conditioned farm in the neighborhood his children too were as ragged and wild as if they belonged to nobody his son rip an urchin begotten in his own likeness promised to inherit the habits with the old clothes of his father he was generally seen trooping like a colt at his mother's heels equipped in a pair of his father's cast-off galley gaskins which he had much ado to hold up with one hand as a fine lady does her train in bad weather rip van winkle however was one of those happy mortals of foolish well-oiled dispositions who take the world easy eat white bread or brown whichever can be got with least thought or trouble and would rather starve on a penny than work for a pound if left to himself he would have whistled life away in perfect contentment but his wife kept continually dinning his ears about his idleness his carelessness and the ruin he was bringing on his family morning noon and night her tongue was incessantly going and everything he said or did was sure to produce a torrent of household eloquence rip had but one way of replying to all lectures of the kind and that by frequent use had grown into a habit he shrugged his shoulders shook his head cast up his eyes but said nothing this however always provoked a fresh volley from his wife so that he was fain to draw off his forces and take to the outside of the house the only side which in truth belongs to a hen-pecked husband rip's sole domestic adherent was his dog wolf who was as much hen-pecked as his master for dame van winkle regarded them as companions in idleness and even looked upon wolf with an evil eye as the cause of his master's going so often astray true it is in all points of spirit befitting an honorable dog he was as courageous an animal as ever scoured the woods but what courage can withstand the ever-during 
and all besetting terrors of a woman's tongue the moment wolf entered the house his crest fell his tail drooped to the ground or curled between his legs he sneaked about with a gallows air casting many a sidelong glance at dame van winkle and at the least flourish of a broomstick or ladle he would fly to the door with yelping precipitation times grew worse and worse with rip van winkle as years of matrimony rolled on a tart temper never mellows with age and a sharp tongue is the only edged tool that grows keener with constant use for a long while he used to console himself when driven from home by frequenting a kind of perpetual club of the sages philosophers and other idle personages of the village which held its sessions on a bench before a small inn designated by a rubicund portrait of his majesty george the third here they used to sit in the shade through a long lazy summer's day talking listlessly over village gossip or telling endless sleepy stories about nothing but it would have been worth any statesman's money to have heard the profound discussions that sometimes took place when by chance an old newspaper fell into their hands from some passing traveller how solemnly they would listen to the contents as drawled out by derrick van bummel the schoolmaster a dapper learned little man who was not to be daunted by the most gigantic word in the dictionary and how sagely they would deliberate upon the public events some months after they had taken place the opinion of this junto were completely controlled by nicholas vedder a patriarch of the village and landlord of the inn at the door of which he took his seat from morning till night just moving sufficiently to avoid the sun and keep in the shade of a large tree so that the neighbors could tell the hour by his movements as accurately as by a sundial it was true he was rarely heard to speak but smoked his pipe incessantly his adherents however for every great man has his adherents perfectly understood him and knew how to gather his opinions when anything that was read or related displeased him he was observed to smoke his pipe vehemently and to send forth short frequent and angry puffs but when pleased he would inhale the smoke slowly and tranquilly and emit it in light and placid clouds and sometimes taking the pipe from his mouth and letting the fragrant vapour curl about his nose would gravely nod his head in token of perfect approbation from even this stronghold the unlucky rip was at length routed by his termagant wife who would suddenly break in upon the tranquillity of the assemblage and call the members all to naught nor was that august personage nicholas vedder himself sacred from the daring tongue of this terrible virago who charged him outright with encouraging her husband in habits of idleness poor rip was at last reduced almost to despair and his only alternative to escape from the labor of the farm and clamor of his wife was to take gun in hand and stroll away into the woods here he would sometimes seat himself at the foot of a tree and share the contents of his wallet with wolf with whom he sympathized as a fellow sufferer in persecution poor wolf he would say thy mistress leads thee a dog's life of it but never mind my lad whilst i live thou shalt never want a friend to stand by thee wolf would wag his tail look wistfully at his master's face and if dogs can feel pity i verily believe he reciprocated the sentiment with all his heart in a long ramble of the kind on a fine autumnal day rip had unconsciously scrambled to one of the highest parts of the catskill mountains he was after his favorite sport of squirrel shooting and the still solitudes had echoed and re-echoed with the reports of his gun panting and fatigued he threw himself late in the afternoon on a green knoll covered with mountain herbage that crowned the brow of a precipice from an opening between the trees he could overlook all the lower country for many a mile of rich woodland he saw at a distance the lordly hudson far far below him moving on its silent but majestic course with the reflection of a purple cloud or the sail of a lagging bark here and there sleeping on its glassy bosom and at last losing itself in the blue highlands on the other side he looked down into a deep mountain glen wild lonely and shagged the bottom filled with fragments from the impending cliffs and scarcely lighted by the reflected rays of the setting sun 
For some time Rip lay musing on this scene. Evening was gradually advancing. The mountains began to throw their long blue shadows over the valleys. He saw that it would be dark long before he could reach the village, and he heaved a heavy sigh when he thought of encountering the terrors of Dame Van Winkle. As he was about to descend, he heard a voice from a distance hallooing, Rip Van Winkle! Rip Van Winkle! He looked around but could see nothing but a crow winging its solitary flight across the mountain. He thought his fancy must have deceived him, and turned again to descend, when he heard the same cry ring through the still evening, Rip Van Winkle! Rip Van Winkle! At the same time, Wolf bristled up his back, and giving a low growl, skulked to his master's side, looking fearfully down into the glen. Rip now felt a vague apprehension stealing over him, he looked anxiously in the same direction, and perceived a strange figure toiling up the rocks, and bending under the weight of something he carried on his back. He was surprised to see any human being in this lonely and unfrequented place, but supposing it to be someone of the neighborhood in need of his assistance, he hastened down to yield it. On nearer approach he was still more surprised at the singularity of the stranger's appearance. He was a short, square-built old fellow, with thick, bushy hair and a grizzled beard. His dress was of antique Dutch fashion, a cloth jerkin strapped round the waist, several pair of breeches, the outer one of ample volume, decorated with rows of buttons down the sides, and bunches at the knees. He bore on his shoulder a stout keg that seemed full of liquor, and made signs for Rip to approach and assist him with the load. Though rather shy and distrustful of this new acquaintance, Rip complied with his usual alacrity, and mutually relieving one another, they clambered up a narrow gully, apparently the dry bed of a mountain torrent. As they ascended, Rip every now and then heard long peals like distant thunder that seemed to issue out of a deep ravine, or rather cleft between lofty rocks, toward which their rugged path conducted. He paused for an instant, but supposing it to be the muttering of one of those transient thunder showers which often take place in mountain heights, he proceeded. Passing through the ravine, they came to a hollow like a small amphitheatre, surrounded by perpendicular precipices, over the brinks of which impending trees shot their branches, so that you only caught glimpses of the azure sky and the bright evening cloud. During the whole time, Rip and his companion had labored on in silence for though the former marveled greatly what could be the object of carrying a keg of liquor up this wild mountain, yet there was something strange and incomprehensible about the unknown that inspired awe and checked familiarity. On entering the amphitheatre, new objects of wonder presented themselves. On a level spot in the centre was a company of odd-looking personages playing at ninepins. They were dressed in a quaint outlandish fashion. Some wore short doublets, others jerkins, with long knives in their belts, and most of them had enormous breeches of similar style with that of the guides. Their visages, too, were peculiar. One had a large beard, broad face, and small piggish eyes. The face of another seemed to consist entirely of nose, and was surmounted by a white sugar-loaf hat set off with a little red cock's tail. They all had beards of various shapes and colors, there was one who seemed to be the commander. He was a stout old gentleman with a weather-beaten countenance. He wore a lace doublet, broad belt and hanger, high-crowned hat and feather, red stockings, and high-heeled shoes with roses in them. The whole group reminded Rip of the figures of an old Flemish painting in the parlor of Dominie van Schaik, the village parson, and which had been brought over from Holland at the time of the settlement. What seemed particularly odd to Rip was that though these folks were evidently amusing themselves, yet they maintained the gravest faces, the most mysterious silence, and were with all the most melancholy part of pleasure he had ever witnessed. Nothing interrupted the stillness of the scene, but the noise of the balls, which whenever they were rolled, echoed along the mountains like rumbling peals of thunder. As Rip and his companion approached them, they suddenly desisted from their play, and stared at him with such fixed statue-like gaze, and such strange, uncouth, lackluster countenances, that his heart turned within him, 
and his knees smote together his companion now emptied the contents of the keg into large flagons and made signs to him to wait upon the company he obeyed with fear and trembling they quaffed the liquor in profound silence and then returned to their game by degrees rip's awe and apprehension subsided he even ventured when no eye was fixed upon him to taste the beverage which he found had much of the flavor of excellent hollands he was naturally a thirsty soul and was soon tempted to repeat the draught one taste provoked another and he reiterated his visits to the flagon so often that at length his senses were overpowered his eyes swam in his head his head gradually declined and he fell into a deep sleep on waking he found himself on the green knoll whence he had first seen the old man of the glen he rubbed his eyes it was a bright sunny morning the birds were hopping and twittering among the bushes and the eagle was wheeling aloft and breasting the pure mountain breeze but surely thought rip i have not slept here all night he recalled the occurrences before he fell asleep the strange man with a keg of liquor the mountain ravine the wild retreat among the rocks the woe-begone party at ninepins the flagon oh that flagon that wicked flagon thought rip what excuse shall i make to dame van winkle he looked round for his gun but in place of the clean well-oiled fowling piece he found an old firelock lying by him the barrel encrusted with rust the lock falling off the stock worm-eaten he now suspected that the grave roisters of the mountain had put a trick upon him and having dosed him with liquor had robbed him of his gun wolf too had disappeared but he might have strayed away after a squirrel or partridge he whistled after him and shouted his name but all in vain the echoes repeated his whistle and shout but no dog was to be seen he determined to revisit the scene of the last evening's gambol and if he met with any of these party to demand his dog and gun as he rose to walk he found himself stiff in the joints and wanting in his usual activity these mountain beds do not agree with me thought rip and if this frolic should lay me up with a fit of rheumatism i shall have a blessed time with dame van winkle with some difficulty he got down into the glen he found the gully up which he and his companion had ascended the preceding evening but to his astonishment a mountain stream was now foaming down it leaping from rock to rock and filling the glen with babbling murmurs he however made shift to scramble up its sides working his toilsome way through thickets of birch sassafras and witch hazel and sometimes tripped up or entangled by the wild grapevines that twisted their coils or tendrils from tree to tree and spread a kind of network in his path at length he reached to where the ravine had opened through the cliffs to the amphitheatre but no traces of such opening remained the rocks presented a high impenetrable wall over which the torrent came tumbling in a sheet of feathery foam and fell into a broad deep basin black from the shadows of the surrounding forest here then poor rip was brought to a stand he again called and whistled after his dog he was only answered by the cawing of a flock of idle crows sporting high in the air about a dry tree that overhung a sunny precipice and who secure in their elevation seemed to look down and scoff at the poor man's perplexities what was to be done the morning was passing away and, and rip felt famished for want of his breakfast he grieved to give up his dog and gun he dreaded to meet his wife but it would not do to starve among the mountains he shook his head shouldered the rusty firelock and with a heart full of trouble and anxiety turned his steps homeward as he approached the village he met a number of people but none whom he knew which somewhat surprised him for he had thought himself acquainted with every one in the country round their dress too was of a different fashion from that to which he was accustomed they all stared at him with equal marks of surprise and whenever they cast their eyes upon him invariably stroked their chins the constant recurrence of this gesture induced rip involuntarily to do the same when to his astonishment he found his beard had grown a foot long he had now entered the skirts of the village a troop of strange children ran at his heels hooting after him and pointing at his gray beard 
the dogs too not one of which he recognized for an old acquaintance barked at him as he passed the very village was altered it was larger and more populous there were rows of houses which he had never seen before and those which had been his familiar haunts had disappeared strange names were over the doors strange faces at the windows everything was strange his mind now misgave him he began to doubt whether both he and the world around him were not bewitched surely this was his native village which he had left but the day before there stood the catskill mountains there ran the silver hudson at a distance there was every hill and dale precisely as it had always been rip was sorely perplexed ah that flagon last night thought he has addled my poor head sadly it was with some difficulty that he found his way to his own house which he approached with silent awe expecting every moment to hear the shrill voice of dame van winkle he found the house gone to decay the roof fallen in the windows shattered the doors off the hinges a half-starved dog that looked like wolf was skulking about it rip called him by name but the cur snarled showed his teeth and passed on this was an unkind cut indeed my very dog sighed poor rip has forgotten me he entered the house which to tell the truth dame van winkle had always kept in neat order it was empty forlorn and apparently abandoned this desolateness overcame all his connubial fears he called loudly for his wife and children the lonely chambers rang for a moment with his voice and then all again was silence he now hurried forth and hastened to his old resort the village inn but it too was gone a large rickety wooden building stood in its place with great gaping windows some of them broken and mended with old hats and petticoats and over the door was painted the union hotel by jonathan doolittle instead of the great tree that used to shelter the quiet little dutch inn of yore there now was reared a tall naked pole with something on top that looked like a red nightcap and from it was fluttering a flag on which was a singular assemblage of stars and stripes all oh, this was strange and incomprehensible he recognized on the sign however the ruby face of king george under which he had smoked so many a peaceful pipe but even this was singularly metamorphosed the red coat was changed for one of blue and buff a sword was held in the hand instead of a sceptre and the head was decorated with a cocked hat and underneath was painted in large characters general washington there was as usual a crowd of folk about the door but none that rip recollected the very character of the people seemed changed there was a busy bustling disputatious tone about it instead of the accustomed phlegm and drowsy tranquillity he looked in vain for the sage nicholas vetter with his broad face double chin and fair long pipe uttering clouds of tobacco smoke instead of idle speeches or van bummel the schoolmaster doling forth the contents of an ancient newspaper in place of these a lean bilious looking fellow with his pockets full of handbills was haranguing vehemently about rights of citizens elections members of congress liberty bunkers hill heroes of seventy six and other words which were a perfect babylonish jargon to the bewildered van winkle the appearance of rip with his long grizzled beard his rusty fowling piece his uncouth dress and an army of women and children at his heels soon attracted the attention of the tavern politicians they crowded round him eyeing him from head to foot with great curiosity the orator bustled up to him and drawing him partly aside inquired on which side he voted rip stared in vacant stupidity another short but busy little fellow pulled him up by the arm and rising on tiptoe inquired in his ear whether he was federal or democrat rip was really at a loss to comprehend the question when a knowing self-important old gentleman in a sharp cocked hat made his way through the crowd putting them to the right and left with his elbows as he passed and planting himself before van winkle with one arm akimbo the other resting on his cane his keen eyes and sharp hat penetrating as it were into his very soul demanded in an austere tone what brought him to the election with a gun on his shoulder and a mob at his heels and whether he meant to breed a riot in the village alas gentlemen cried rip somewhat dismayed 
i am a poor quiet man a native of the place and a loyal subject of the king god bless him here a general shout burst forth from the bystanders a tory a spy a spy a refugee hustle him away with him it was with great difficulty that the self-important man in the cocked hat restored order and having assumed a tenfold austerity of brow demanded again of the unknown culprit what he came there for and whom he was seeking the poor man humbly assured him that he meant no harm but merely came there in search of some of his neighbors who used to keep about the tavern well who are they name them rip bethought himself a moment and inquired where's nicholas vetter there was a silence for a little while when an old man replied in a thin piping voice nicholas vetter why he is dead and gone these eighteen years there was a wooden tombstone in the churchyard that used to tell all about him but that's rotten and gone too where's brom dutcher oh he went off to the army in the beginning of the war some say he was killed at the storming of stony point others say he was drowned in a squall at the foot of anthony nose i don't know he never came back again where's van bummel the schoolmaster he went off to the wars too was a great militia general and is now in congress rip's heart died away at hearing of these sad changes in his home and friends and finding himself thus alone in the world every answer puzzled him too by treating of such enormous lapses of time and of great matters he could not understand war congress stony point he had no courage to ask after any more friends but cried out in despair does nobody here know rip van winkle oh rip van winkle exclaimed two or three oh to be sure that's rip van winkle yonder leaning against the tree rip looked and beheld a precise counterpart of himself as he went up the mountain apparently as lazy and certainly as ragged the poor fellow was now completely confounded he doubted his own identity and whether he was himself or another man in the midst of his bewilderment the man in the cocked hat demanded who he was and what was his name god knows exclaimed he at his wit's end i'm not myself i'm somebody else that's me yonder no that's somebody else i got into my shoes i was myself last night but i fell asleep on the mountain and they've changed my gun and everything's changed and i'm changed i can't tell my name or who i am the bystanders began now to look at each other nod wink significantly and tap their fingers against their foreheads there was a whisper also about securing the gun and keeping the old fellow from doing mischief at the very suggestion of which the self-important man in the cocked hat retired with some precipitation at this critical moment a fresh comely woman pressed through the throng to get a peep at the grey-bearded man she had a chubby child in her arms which frightened at his looks began to cry hush rip cried she hush you little fool the old man won't hurt you the name of the child the air of the mother the tone of her voice all awakened a train of recollections in his mind what's your name my good woman asked he judith gardenier and your father's name ah poor man rip van winkle was his name but it's twenty years since he went away from home with his gun and never has been heard of since his dog came home without him but whether he shot himself or was carried away by the indians nobody can tell i was but a little girl rip had but one question more to ask but he put it with a faltering voice where is your mother oh she too had died but a short time since she broke a blood vessel in a fit of passion at a new england peddler there was a drop of comfort at least in this intelligence the honest man could contain himself no longer he caught his daughter and her child in his arms i am your father cried he young rip van winkle once old rip van winkle now does nobody know poor rip van winkle all stood amazed until an old woman tottering out from among the crowd 
put her hand to her brow and peering under it in his face for a moment exclaimed sure enough it is rip van winkle it is himself welcome home again old neighbor why where have you been these twenty long years rip's story was soon told for the whole twenty years had been to him but as one night the neighbors stared when they heard it some were seen to wink at each other and put their tongues in their cheeks and the self-important man in the crooked hat who when the alarm was over had returned to the field screwed down the corners of his mouth and shook his head upon which there was general shaking of the head throughout the assemblage it was determined however to take the opinion of old peter vanderdonk who was seen slowly advancing up the road he was a descendant of the historian of that name who wrote one of the earliest accounts of the province peter was the most ancient inhabitant of the village and well versed in all the wonderful events and traditions of the neighborhood he recollected rip at once and corroborated his story in the most satisfactory manner he assured the company that it was a fact handed down from his ancestor the historian that the catskill mountains had always been haunted by strange beings that it was affirmed that the great hendrick hudson the first discoverer of the river and country kept a kind of vigil there every twenty years with his crew of the half moon being permitted in this way to revisit the scenes of his enterprise and keep a guarding eye upon the river and the great city called by his name that his father had once seen them in their old dutch dresses playing at ninepins in a hollow of the mountain and that he himself had heard one summer afternoon the sound of their balls like distant peals of thunder to make a long story short the company broke up and returned to the more important concerns of the election rip's daughter took him home to live with her she had a snug well-furnished house and a stout cheery farmer for a husband whom rip recollected as one of the urchins that used to climb upon his back as to rip's son and heir who was the ditto of himself seen leaning against the tree he was employed to work on the farm but evinced an hereditary disposition to attend to anything else but his business rip now resumed his old walks and habits he soon found many of his former cronies though all rather the worse for the wear and tear of time and preferred making friends among the rising generation with whom he soon grew into great favor having nothing to do at home and being arrived at that happy age when a man can be idle with impunity he took his place once more on the bench at the inn door and was reverenced as one of the patriarchs of the village and a chronicle of the old times before the war it was some time before he could get into the regular track of gossip or could be made to comprehend the strange events that had taken place during his torpor how that there had been a revolutionary war that the country had thrown off the yoke of old england and that instead of being a subject of his majesty george the third who is now a free citizen of the united states rip in fact was no politician the changes of states and empires made but little impression on him but there was one species of despotism under which he had long groaned and that was petticoat government happily that was at an end he had got his neck out of the yoke of matrimony and could go in and out whenever he pleased without dreading the tyranny of dame van winkle whenever her name was mentioned however he shook his head shrugged his shoulders and cast up his eyes which might pass either for an expression of resignation to his fate or joy at his deliverance he used to tell his story to every stranger that arrived at mr doolittle's hotel he was observed at first to vary on some points every time he told it which was doubtless owing to his having so recently awakened it at last settled down to precisely the tale i have related and not a man woman or child in the neighborhood but knew it by heart some always pretended to doubt the reality of it and insisted that rip had been out of his head and that this was one point on which he always remained flighty the old dutch inhabitants however almost universally gave it full credit even to this day they never hear a thunderstorm of a summer afternoon about the catskills but they say hendrik hudson and his crew are at their game of ninepins and it is a common wish of all henpecked husbands in the neighborhood when life hangs heavy on their hands that they might have a quieting draught out of rip van winkle's flagon end of chapter nine part one
Chapter 9, Part 2 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Larry Wilson. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 9, Tales of the Hudson, Part 2. The Legend of Sleepy Hollow by Washington Irving. In the bosom of one of those spacious coves which indent the eastern shore of the Hudson, at that broad expansion of the river, dominated by the ancient Dutch navigators, the Tappan Zee, and where they always prudently shortened sail, and implored the protection of St. Nicholas when they crossed, there lies a small market town, or rural port, which by some is called Greenborough, but which is more generally and properly known by the name of Terrytown. This name was given, we are told, in former days, by the good housewives of the adjacent country, from the inveterate propensity of their husbands to linger about the tavern on market days. Be that as it may, I do not vouch for the fact, but merely advert to it, for the sake of being precise and authentic. Not far from this village, perhaps about two miles, there is a little valley, or rather lap of land, among high hills, which is one of the quietest places in the whole world. A small brook glides through it with just murmur enough to lull one to repose, and the occasional whistle of a quail or tapping of a woodpecker is almost the only sound that ever breaks in upon the uniform tranquillity. I recollect that when a stripling, my first exploit in squirrel shooting was in a grove of tall walnut trees that shades one side of the valley. I had wandered into it at noontime when all nature is peculiarly quiet and was startled by the roar of my own gun, as it broke the Sabbath stillness around, and was prolonged and reverberated by the angry echoes. If ever I should wish for a retreat, whither I might steal from the world and its distractions, and dream quietly away the remnant of a troubled life, I know of none more promising than this little valley. From the listless repose of the place, and the peculiar character of its inhabitants, who are descendants from the original Dutch settlers, this sequestered glen has long been known by the name of Sleepy Hollow, and its rustic lads are called the Sleepy Hollow Boys throughout all the neighboring country. A drowsy, dreamy influence seems to hang over the land and to pervade the very atmosphere. Some say that the place was bewitched by a high German doctor during the early days of the settlement. Others that an old Indian chief, the prophet or wizard of his tribe, held his powwows there before the country was discovered by master hendrick hudson certain it is the place still continues under the sway of some witching power that holds a spell over the minds of the good people causing them to walk in a continual reverie they are given to all kinds of marvellous beliefs are subject to trances and visions and frequently see strange sights and hear music and voices in the air the whole neighbourhood abounds with local tales haunted spots and twilight superstitions stars shoot and meteors glare oftener across the valley than in any other part of the country and the nightmare with her whole nine full seems to make it the favorite scene of her gambols the dominant spirit however that haunts this enchanted region and seems to be commander-in-chief of all the powers of the air is the apparition of a figure on horseback without a head it is said by some to be the ghost of a hessian trooper whose head had been carried away by a cannonball in some nameless battle during the revolutionary war and who is ever and anon seen by the country folk hurrying along in the gloom of night as if on the wings of the wind his haunts are not confined to the valley but extend at times to the adjacent roads and especially to the vicinity of a church at no great distance indeed certain of the most authentic historians of those parts who have been careful in collecting and collating the floating facts concerning this spectre allege that the body of the trooper having been buried in the churchyard the ghost rides forth to the scene of battle in nightly quest of his head and that the rushing speed with which he sometimes passes along the hollow like a midnight blast is owing to his being belated and in a hurry to get back to the churchyard before daybreak such is the general purport of this legendary superstition which has furnished materials for many a wild story in that region of shadows and the spectre is known at all the country firesides by the name of the headless horseman 
of Sleepy Hollow. It is remarkable that the visionary propensity I have mentioned is not confined to the native inhabitants of the valley, but is unconsciously imbibed by every one who resides there for a time. However wide awake they may have been before they entered that sleepy region, they are sure, in a little time, to inhale the witching influence of the air and begin to grow imaginative, to dream dreams and see apparitions. I mention this peaceful spot with all possible laud, for it is in such little retired Dutch valleys, found here and there embosomed in the great state of New York, that population, manners, and customs remain fixed, while the great torrent of migration and improvement, which is making such incessant changes in other parts of this restless country, sweep by them unobserved. They are like those little nooks of still water which border a rapid stream, where we may see the straw and bubble riding quietly at anchor, or slowly revolving in their mimic harbor, undisturbed by the rush of the passing current. Though many years have elapsed since I trod the drowsy shades of Sleepy Hollow, yet I question whether I should not still find the same trees and the same families vegetating in its sheltered bosom. In this by-place of nature there abode in a remote period of American history, that is to say, some thirty years since, a worthy white of the name of Ichabod Crane, who sojourned, or as he expressed it, tarried in Sleepy Hollow for the purpose of instructing the children of the vicinity. He was a native of Connecticut, a state which supplies the Union with pioneers for the mind as well as for the forest, and sends forth yearly its legions of frontier woodsmen and country schoolmasters. The cognomen of Crane was not inapplicable to his person. He was tall, but exceedingly lank, with narrow shoulders, long arms and legs, hands that dangled a mile out of his sleeves, feet that might have served for shovels, and his whole frame most loosely hung together. His head was small and flat at top, with huge ears, large green glassy eyes, and a long snipe nose, so that it looked like a weathercock perched upon his spindle neck, to tell which way the wind blew. To see him striding along the profile of a hill on a windy day, with his clothes bagging and fluttering about him, one might have mistaken him for the genius of famine descending upon the earth, or some scarecrow elope from a cornfield. His schoolhouse was a low building of one large room, rudely constructed of logs, the windows partly glazed and partly patched with leaves of old coffee books. It was most ingeniously secured at vacant hours by a withe twisted in the handle of the door, and stakes set against the window shutters, so that though a thief might get in with perfect ease, he would find some embarrassment in getting out, an idea most probably borrowed by the architect Joost van Houten from the mystery of an eel pot. The schoolhouse stood in a rather lonely but pleasant situation, just at the foot of a woody hill, with a brook running close by and a formidable birch tree growing at one end of it. From hence the low murmur of his pupils' voices coming over their lessons might be heard in a drowsy summer's day, like the hum of a beehive, interrupted now and then by the authoritative voice of the master in the tone of menace or command, or peradventure by the appalling sound of the birch as he urged some tardy loiterer along the flowery path of knowledge. Truth to say, he was a conscientious man, and never bore in mind the golden maxim Spare the rod and spoil the child. Ichabod Crane's scholars certainly were not spoiled. I would not have it imagined, however, that he was one of those cruel potentates of the school who joy in the smart of their subjects. On the contrary, he administered justice with discrimination rather than severity, taking the burthen off the backs of the weak and laying it on those of the strong. Your mere puny stripling, that winced at the least flourish of the rod, was passed by with indulgence, but the claims of justice were satisfied by inflicting a double portion on some little tough, wrong-headed, rod-skirted Dutch urchin, who sulked and swelled and grew dogged and sullen beneath the birch. All this he called doing his duty by their parents, and he never inflicted a chastisement without following it by the assurance so consolatory to the smarting urchin that he would remember it and thank him for it the longest day he had to live. 
when school hours were over he was even the companion and playmate of the larger boys and on holiday afternoons would convoy some of the smaller ones home who happened to have pretty sisters or good housewives for mothers noted for the comforts of the cupboard indeed it behooved him to keep on good terms with his pupils the revenue arising from his school was small and would have been scarcely sufficient to furnish him with daily bread for he was a huge feeder and though lank had the dilating powers of an anaconda but to help out his maintenance he was according to country custom in those parts boarded and lodged at the houses of the farmers whose children he instructed with these he lived successively a week at a time thus going the rounds of the neighborhood with all his worldly effects tied up in a cotton handkerchief that all this might not be too onerous on the purses of his rustic patrons who are apt to consider the costs of schooling a grievous burden and schoolmasters as mere drones he had various ways of rendering himself both useful and agreeable he assisted the farmers occasionally in the lighter labor of their farms helped to make hay mended the fences took the horses to water drove the cows from pasture and cut wood for the winter fire he laid aside too all the dominant dignity and absolute sway with which he lorded it in his little empire the school and became wonderfully gentle and ingratiating he found favor in the eyes of the mothers by petting the children particularly the youngest and like the lion bold which whilom so magnanimously the lamb did hold he would sit with a child on one knee and rock a cradle with his foot for the whole hours together in addition to his other vocations he was the singing master of the neighborhood and picked up many bright shillings by instructing the young folk in psalmody it was a matter of no little vanity to him on sundays to take his station in the front of the church gallery with a band of chosen singers where in his own mind he completely carried away the palm from the parson certain it is his voice resounded far above all the rest of the congregation and there are peculiar quavers still to be heard in that church and which may be heard half a mile off quite to the opposite side of the mill pond on a still sunday morning which are said to be legitimately descended from the nose of ichabod crane thus by diverse little makeshifts in that ingenious way which is commonly denominated by hook and by crook the worthy pedagogue got on tolerably enough and was thought by all who understood nothing of the labor of headwork to have a wonderfully easy life of it the schoolmaster is generally a man of some importance in the female circle of a rural neighborhood being considered a kind of idle gentleman-like personage of vastly superior taste and accomplishments to the rough country swains and indeed inferior in learning only to the parson his appearance therefore is apt to occasion some little stir at the tea-table of a farmhouse and the addition of a supernumerary dish of cakes or sweetmeats or peradventure the parade of a silver teapot our man of letters therefore was peculiarly happy in the smiles of all the country damsels how he would figure among them in the churchyard between services on sundays gathering grapes for them from the wild vines that overran the surrounding trees reciting for their amusement all the epitaphs on the tombstones or sauntering with a whole bevy of them along the banks of the adjacent mill-pond while the more bashful country bumpkins hung sheepishly back envying his superior elegance and address from his half itinerant life also he was a kind of travelling gazette carrying the whole budget of local gossip from house to house so that his appearance was always greeted with satisfaction he was moreover esteemed by the women as a man of great erudition for he had read several books quite through and was a perfect master of cotton mather's history of new england witchcraft in which by the way he most firmly and potently believed he was in fact an odd mixture of small shrewdness and simple credulity his appetite for the marvellous and his powers of digesting it were equally extraordinary and both had been increased by his residence in this spellbound region no tale was too gross or monstrous for his capacious swallow it was often his delight after his school was dismissed in the afternoon to stretch himself on the rich bed of clover bordering the little brook that whimpered by his schoolhouse and there con over old mather's direful tales until the gathering dusk of the evening made the printed page 
a mere mist before his eyes then as he wended his way by swamp and stream and awful woodland to the farmhouse where he happened to be quartered every sound of nature at that witching hour fluttered his excited imagination the moan of the whippoorwill from the hillside the boding cry of the tree toad that harbinger of storm the dreary hooting of the screech owl or the sudden rustling in the thicket of birds frightened from their roost the fireflies too which sparkled most vividly in the darkest places now and then startled him as one of uncommon brightness would stream across his path and if by chance a huge blockhead of a beetle came winging his blundering flight against him the poor varlet was ready to give up the ghost with the idea that he was struck with a witch's token his only resource on such occasions either to drown thought or drive away evil spirits was to sing psalm tunes and the good people of sleepy hollow as they sat by their doors of an evening were often filled with awe at hearing his nasal melody in linked sweetness long drawn out floating from the distant hill or along the dusky road another of his sources of fearful pleasure was to pass long winter evenings with the old dutch wives as they sat spinning by the fire with a row of apples roasting and spluttering along the hearth and listened to their marvellous tales of ghosts and goblins and haunted fields and haunted brooks and haunted bridges and haunted houses and particularly of the headless horseman or galloping hessian of the hollow as they sometimes called him he would delight them equally by his anecdotes of witchcraft and of the direful omens and portentous sights and sounds in the air which prevailed in the earlier times of connecticut and would frighten them woefully with speculations upon comets and shooting stars and with the alarming fact that the world did absolutely turn round and that they were half the time topsy-turvy but if there was a pleasure in all this while snugly cuddling in the chimney corner of a chamber that was all of a ruddy glow from the crackling wood fire and where of course no spectre dared to show his face it was dearly purchased by the terrors of his subsequent walk homewards what fearful shapes and shadows beset his path amidst the dim and ghastly glare of a snowy night with what wistful look did he eye every trembling ray of light streaming across the waste fields from some distant window how often he was appalled by some shrub covered with snow which like a sheeted spectre beset his very path how often did he shrink with curdling awe at the sound of his own steps on the frosty crust beneath his feet and dreaded to look over his shoulder lest he should behold some uncouth being tramping close behind him and how often was he thrown into complete dismay by some rushing blast howling among the trees in the idea that it was the galloping hessian on one of his nightly scourings all these however were mere terrors of the night phantoms of the mind that walked in darkness and though he had seen many spectres in his time and had been more than once beset by satan in diverse shapes in his lonely perambulations yet daylight put an end to all these evils and he would have passed a pleasant life of it in despite of the devil and all his works if his path had not been crossed by a being that causes more perplexity to mortal man than ghosts goblins and the whole race of witches put together and that was a woman among the musical disciples who assembled one evening in each week to receive his instructions in psalmody was katrina van tassel the daughter and only child of a substantial dutch farmer she was a blooming lass of fresh eighteen plump as a partridge ripe and melting and rosy-cheeked as one of her father's peaches and universally famed not merely for her beauty but her vast expectations she was withal a little of a coquette as might be perceived even in her dress which was a mixture of ancient and modern fashions as most suited to set off her charms she wore the ornaments of pure yellow gold which her great-grandmother had brought over from saradan the tempting stomacher of the olden time and withal a provokingly short petticoat to display the prettiest foot and ankle in the country road ichabod crane had a soft and foolish heart towards the sex and it is not to be wondered at that so tempting a morsel soon found favor in his eyes more especially after he had visited her in her paternal mansion old balthus van tassel was a perfect picture of a thriving contented liberal-hearted farmer 
he seldom it is true sent either his eyes or his thoughts beyond the boundaries of his own farm but within those everything was snug happy and well conditioned he was satisfied with his wealth but not proud of it and piqued himself upon the hearty abundance rather than the style in which he lived his stronghold was situated on the banks of the hudson in one of those green sheltered fertile nooks in which dutch farmers are so fond of nestling a great elm tree spread its broad branches over it at the foot of which bubbled up a spring of the softest and sweetest water in a little well formed of a barrel and then stole sparkling away through the grass to a neighboring brook that bubbled along among alders and dwarf willows hard by the farmhouse was a vast barn that might have served for a church every window and crevice of which seemed bursting forth with the treasures of the farm the flail was busily resounding within it from morning to night swallows and martins skimmed twittering about the eaves and rows of pigeons some with one eye turned up as if watching the weather some with their heads under their wings or buried in their bosoms and others swelling and cooing and bowing about their dames were enjoying the sunshine on the roof sleek unwieldy porkers were grunting in the repose and abundance of their pens which sallied forth now and then troops of sucking pigs as if to snuff the air a stately squadron of snowy geese were riding in an adjoining pond convoying whole fleets of ducks regiments of turkeys were gobbling through the farmyard and guinea fowls fretting about it like ill-tempered housewives with their peevish discontented cry before the barn door strutted the gallant cock that pattern of a husband a warrior and a fine gentleman clapping his burnished wings and crowing in the pride and gladness of his heart sometimes tearing up the earth with his feet and then generously calling his ever-hungry family of wives and children to enjoy the rich morsel which he had discovered the pedagogue's mouth watered as he looked upon this sumptuous promise of luxurious winter fare in his devouring mind's eye he pictured to himself every roasting pig running about with a pudding in his belly and an apple in his mouth the pigeons were snugly put to bed in a comfortable pie and tucked in with a coverlet to crust the geese were swimming in their own gravy and the ducks pairing cosily in dishes like snug married couples with a decent competency of onion sauce in the porkers he saw carved out the future sleek side of bacon and juicy relishing ham not a turkey but he beheld daintily trussed up with its gizzard under its wing and peradventure a necklace of savoury sausages and even bright chanticleer himself lay sprawling on his back in a side dish with uplifted claws as if craving that quarter which his chivalrous spirit disdained to ask while living as the enraptured ichabod fancied all this and as he rolled his great green eyes over the fat meadowlands the rich fields of wheat of rye of buckwheat and indian corn and the orchards burdened with ruddy fruit which surrounded the warm tenement of von tassel his heart yearned after the damsel who was to inherit these domains and his imagination expanded with the idea how they might be readily turned into cash and the money invested in immense tracts of wild land and shingle palaces in the wilderness nay his busy fancy already realized his hopes and presented to him the blooming katrina with a whole family of children mounted on the top of a wagon load with household trumpery with pots and kettles dangling beneath and he beheld himself bestriding a pacing mare with a colt at her heels setting out for kentucky tennessee or the lord knows where when he entered the house the conquest of his heart was complete it was one of those spacious farmhouses with high ridged but lowly sloping roofs built in the style handed down from the first dutch settlers the low projecting eaves forming piazzas along the front capable of being closed up in bad weather under this were hung flails harness various utensils of husbandry and nets for fishing in the neighboring river benches were built along the sides for summer use and a great spinning wheel at one end and a churn at the other showed the various uses to which this important porch might be devoted from this piazza the wandering ichabod entered the hall which formed the centre of the mansion and the place of usual residence here rows of resplendent pewter ranged on a long dresser dazzled his eyes in one corner stood a huge bag of wool ready to be spun in another a quantity of linsey woolsey just from the loom 
ears of indian corn and strings of dried apples and peaches hung in gray festoons along the walls mingled with the god of red peppers and a door left ajar gave him a peep into the best parlor where the claw-footed chairs and dark mahogany tables shone like mirrors andirons with their accompanying shovel and tongs glistened from their covert of asparagus tops mock oranges and conch shells decorated the mantelpiece strings of various colored birds eggs were suspended above it a great ostrich egg was hung from the centre of the room and a corner cupboard knowingly left open displayed immense treasures of old silver and well-mended china from the moment ichabod laid his eyes upon these regions of delight the peace of his mind was at an end and his only study was how to gain the affections of the peerless daughter of van tassel in this enterprise however he had more real difficulties than generally fell to the lot of a knight-errant of yore who seldom had anything but giants enchanters fiery dragons and such like easily conquered adversaries to contend with and had to make his way merely through gates of iron and brass and walls of adamant to the castle keep where the lady of his heart was confined all of which he achieved as easily as a man would carve his way to the centre of a christmas pie and then the lady gave him her hand as a matter of course ichabod on the contrary had to win his way to the heart of a country coquette beset with a labyrinth of whims and caprices which were forever presenting new difficulties and impediments and he had to encounter a host of fearful adversaries of real flesh and blood the numerous rustic admirers who beset every portal to her heart keeping a watchful and angry eye upon each other but ready to fly out in the common cause against any new competitor among these most formidable was a burly roaring roistering blade of the name of abraham or according to the dutch abbreviation brom van brunt the hero of the country round which rang with his feats of strength and hardihood he was broad-shouldered and double-jointed with short curly black hair and a bluff but not unpleasant countenance having a mingled air of fun and arrogance from his herculean frame and great powers of limb he had received the nickname of brom bones by which he was universally known he was famed for great knowledge and skill in horsemanship being as dexterous on horseback as a tartar he was foremost at all races and cockfights and with the ascendancy which bodily strength acquires in rustic life was the umpire in all disputes setting his hat on one side and giving his decisions with an air and tone admitting of no gainsay or appeal he was always ready for either a fight or a frolic but had more mischief than ill-will in his composition and with all his overbearing roughness there was a strong dash of waggish good-humour at bottom he had three or four boon companions who regarded him as their model and at the head of whom he scoured the country attending every scene of feud or merriment for miles round in cold weather he was distinguished by a fur cap surmounted with a flaunting fox-tail and when the folks at a country gathering described this well-known crest at a distance whisking about among a squad of hard riders they always stood by for a squall sometimes his crew would be heard dashing along past the farmhouses at midnight with whoop and halloo like a troop of don cossacks and the old dames startled out of their sleep would listen for a moment till the hurry scurry had clattered by and then exclaim ay there goes brom bones and his gang the neighbors looked upon him with a mixture of awe admiration and good will and when any madcap prank or rustic brawl occurred in the vicinity always shook their heads and warranted brom bones was at the bottom of it this rantipole hero had for some time singled out the blooming katrina for the object of his uncouth gallantries and though his amorous toyings were something like the gentle caresses and endearments of a bear yet it was whispered that she did not altogether discourage his hopes certain it is his advances were signals for rival candidates to retire who felt no inclination to cross a line in his amours insomuch that when his horse was seen tied to van tassel's paling on a sunday night a sure sign that his master was courting or as it is termed sparking within all other suitors passed by in despair and carried the war into other quarters such was the formidable rival with whom ichabod crane had to contend 
and considering all things a stouter man than he would have shrunk from the competition and a wiser man would have despaired he had however a happy mixture of pliability and perseverance in his nature he was in form and spirit like a supple jack yielding but tough though he bent he never broke and though he bowed beneath the slightest pressure yet the moment was away jerk he was as erect and carried his head as high as ever to have taken the field openly against his rival would have been madness for he was not a man to be thwarted in his amours any more than that stormy lover achilles ichabod therefore made his advances in a quiet and gently insinuating manner under cover of his character of singing-master he made frequent visits at the farmhouse not that he had anything to apprehend from the meddlesome interference of parents which is so often a stumbling block in the path of lovers balt van tassel was an easy indulgent soul he loved his daughter better even than his pipe and like a reasonable man and an excellent father let her have her way in everything his notable little wife too had enough to do to attend to her housekeeping and manage her poultry for as she sagely observed ducks and geese are foolish things and must be looked after but girls can take care of themselves thus while the busy dame bustled about the house or plied her spinning wheel at one end of the piazza honest balt would sit smoking his evening pipe at the other watching the achievements of a little wooden warrior who armed with a sword in each hand was most valiantly fighting the wind on the pinnacle of the barn in the meantime ichabod would carry on his suit with the daughter by the side of the spring under the great elm or sauntering along in the twilight that hour so favorable to the lover's eloquence i profess not to know how women's hearts are wooed and won to me they have always been matters of riddle and admiration some seem to have but one vulnerable point or door of access while others have a thousand avenues and may be captured in a thousand different ways it is a great triumph of skill to gain the former but a still greater proof of generalship to maintain possession of the latter for the man must battle for his fortress at every door and window he who wins a thousand common hearts is therefore entitled to some renown but he who keeps undisputed sway over the heart of a coquette is indeed a hero certain it is this was not the case with the redoubtable brawn bones and from the moment ichabod crane made his advances the interests of the former evidently declined his horse was no longer seen tied at the palings on sunday nights and a deadly feud gradually arose between him and the preceptor of sleepy hollow brahm who had a degree of rough chivalry in his nature would fain have carried matters to open warfare and have settled their pretensions to the lady according to the mode of those most concise and simple reasoners the knights errant of yore by single combat but ichabod was too conscious of the superior might of his adversary to enter the lists against him he had overheard a boast of bones that he would double the doormaster up and lay him on a shelf of his own schoolhouse and he was too wary to give him an opportunity there was something extremely provoking in this obstinately pacific system it left brahm no alternative but to draw upon the funds of rustic waggery in his disposition and to play off boorish practical jokes upon his rival ichabod became the object of whimsical persecution to bones and his gang of rough writers they harried his hitherto peaceful domains smoked out his singing school by stopping up the chimney broke into the schoolhouse at night in spite of its formidable fastenings of wythe and window stakes and turned everything topsy-turvy so that the poor schoolmaster began to think all the witches in the country held their meetings there but what was still more annoying brahm took all opportunities of turning him into ridicule in presence of his mistress and had a scoundrel dog whom he taught to whine in the most ludicrous manner and introduced as a rival of ichabod's to instruct her in psalmody in this way matters went on for some time without producing any material effect on the relative situation of contending powers on a fine autumnal afternoon ichabod in pensive mood sat enthroned on the lofty stool whence he usually watched all the concerns of his little literary realm in his hand he swayed a ferule, 
that scepter of despotic power the birch of justice reposed on three nails behind the throne a constant terror to the evil doers while on the desk before him might be seen sundry contraband articles and prohibited weapons detected upon the persons of idle urchins such as half-munched apples pop-guns whirligigs fly-cagers and whole legions of rampant little paper gamecocks apparently there had been some appalling act of justice recently inflicted for his scholars were all busily intent upon their books or slyly whispering behind them with one eye kept upon the master and a kind of buzzing stillness reigned throughout the schoolroom it was suddenly interrupted by the appearance of a negro in tow-cloth jacket and trousers a round-crowned fragment of a hat like the cap of mercury and mounted on the back of a ragged wild half-broken colt which he managed with a rope by way of halter he came clattering up to the school door with an invitation to ichabod to attend a merry-making or quilting frolic to be held that evening at mynheer von tassel's and having delivered his message with that air of importance an effort at fine language which a negro is apt to display on petty embassies of that kind he dashed over the brook and was seen scampering away up the hollow full of the importance and hurry of his mission all was now bustle and hubbub in the late quiet schoolroom the scholars were hurried through their lessons without stopping at trifles those who were nimble skipped over half with impunity and those who were tardy had a smart application now and then in the rear to quicken their speed or help them over a tall word books were flung aside without being put away on the shelves inkstands were overturned benches thrown down and the whole school was turned loose an hour before the usual time bursting forth like a legion of young imps yelping and racketing about the green in joy at their early emancipation the gallant ichabod now spent at least an extra half hour at his toilet brushing and furbishing up his best and indeed only suit of rusty black and arranging his locks by a bit of broken looking-glass that hung up in the schoolhouse that he might make his appearance before this mistress in the true style of a cavalier he borrowed a horse from the farmer with whom he was domiciliated a choleric old dutchman by the name of hans von ripper and thus gallantly mounted issued forth like a knight-errant in quest of adventures but it is meet i should in the true spirit of romantic story give some account of the looks and equipment of my hero and his steed the animal he bestrode was a broken-down plough-horse that had outlived almost everything but his viciousness he was gaunt and shagged with a ewe neck and a head like a hammer his rusty mane and tail were tangled and knotted with burrs one eye had lost its pupil and was glaring and spectral but the other had the gleam of a genuine devil in it still he must have had fire and metal in his day if we may judge from the name he bore of gunpowder he had in fact been a favorite steed of his master's the choleric von ripper who was a furious rider and had infused very probably some of his own spirit into the animal for old and broken down as he looked there was more of the lurking devil in him than any young filly in the country ichabod was a suitable figure for such a steed he rode with short stirrups which brought his knees nearly up to the pommel of the saddle his sharp elbows stuck out like grasshoppers he carried his whip perpendicularly in his hand like a sceptre and as his horse jogged on the motion of his arms was not unlike the flapping of a pair of wings a small wool hat rested on the top of his nose for so his scanty strip of forehead might be called and the skirts of his black coat fluttered out almost to the horse's tail such was the appearance of ichabod and his steed as they shambled out of the gates of hans von ripper and it was altogether such an apparition as is seldom to be met with in broad daylight it was as i have said a fine autumnal day the sky was clear and serene and nature wore that rich and golden livery which we always associate with the idea of abundance the forests had put on their sober brown and yellow while some trees of the tenderer kind had been nipped by the frosts into brilliant dyes of orange purple and scarlet streaming files of wild ducks began to make their appearance high in the air the bark of the squirrel might be heard from the groves of beech and hickory nuts and the pensive whistle of the quail at intervals from the neighboring stubble field the small birds were taking their farewell banquets in the fullness of their revelry 
they fluttered chirping and frolicking from bush to bush and tree to tree capricious from the very profusion and variety around them there was the honest cock robin the favorite game of stripling sportsmen with its loud querulous note and the twittering blackbirds flying in sable clouds and the golden-winged woodpecker with his crimson crest his broad black gorget and splendid plumage and the cedar bird with its red-tipped wings and yellow-tipped tail and its little montero cap of feathers and the blue jay that noisy coxcomb in his gay light blue coat and white underclothes screaming and chattering nodding and bobbing and bowing and pretending to be on good terms with every songster of the grove as ichabod jogged slowly on his way his eye ever open to every symptom of culinary abundance ranged with delight over the treasures of jolly autumn on all sides he beheld vast store of apples some hanging in oppressive opulence on the trees some gathered into baskets and barrels for the market others heaped up in rich piles for the cider press farther on he beheld great fields of indian corn with its gold ears peeping from their leafy coverts and holding out the promise of cakes and hasty pudding and the yellow pumpkins lying beneath them turning up their fair round bellies to the sun and giving ample prospects of the most luxurious of pies and anon he passed the fragrant buckwheat fields breathing the odor of the beehive and as he beheld them soft anticipations stole over his mind of dainty slapjacks well buttered and garnished with honey or treacle by the delicate little dimpled hand of katrina van tassel thus feeding his mind with many sweet thoughts and sugared suppositions he journeyed along the sides of a range of hills which looked out upon some of the goodliest scenes of the mighty hudson the sun gradually wheeled his broad disk down into the west the wide bosom of the tappan zee lay motionless and glassy except that here and there a gentle undulation waved and prolonged the blue shadow of the distant mountain a few amber clouds floated in the sky without a breath of air to move them the horizon was of a fine golden tint changing gradually into a pure apple green and from that into the deep blue of the mid-heaven a slanting ray lingered on the woody crests of the precipices that overhung some parts of the river giving greater depth to the dark gray and purple of their rocky sides a sloop was loitering in the distance dropping slowly down with the tide her sail hanging uselessly against the mast and as the reflection of the sky gleamed along the still water it seemed as if the vessel was suspended in the air end of chapter nine part two chapter nine part two of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by larry wilson junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william Patton. chapter nine tales of the hudson part two the legend of sleepy hollow continued by washington irving it was towards evening that ichabod arrived at the castle of Heer van tassel which he found thronged with the pride and flower of the adjacent country old farmers a spare leathern faced race in homespun coats and breeches blue stockings huge shoes and magnificent pewter buckles their brisk withered little dames in close crimped caps long-waisted short gowns homespun petticoats and scissors and pincushions and gay calico pockets hanging on the outside buxom lasses almost as antiquated as their mothers excepting where a straw hat or fine ribbon or perhaps a white frock gave symptoms of city innovation the sons in short square skirted coats with rows of stupendous brass buttons and their hair generally cued in the fashion of the times especially if they could procure an eel-skin for the purpose it being esteemed throughout the country as a potent nourisher and strengthener of the hair brom bones however was the hero of the scene having come to the gathering on his favorite steed daredevil a creature like himself full of metal and mischief and which no one but himself could manage he was in fact noted for preferring vicious animals given to all kinds of tricks which kept the rider in constant risk of his neck for he held a tractable well-broken horse 
as unworthy of a lad of spirit fain would i pause to dwell upon the world of charms that burst upon the enraptured gaze of my hero as he entered the state parlor of van tassel's mansion not only those of the bevy of buxom lasses with their luxurious display of red and white but the ample charms of a genuine dutch country tea-table in the sumptuous time of autumn such heaped-up platters of cakes of various and almost indescribable kinds known only to experienced dutch housewives there was the doughty doughnut the tender olicoat and the crisp and crumbling cooler sweet cakes and short cakes ginger cakes and honey cakes and the whole family of cakes and then there were apple pies and peach pies and pumpkin pies besides slices of ham and smoked beef and moreover delectable dishes of preserved plums and peaches and pears and quinces not to mention broiled shad and roasted chickens together with bowls of milk and cream all mingled higgledy piggledy pretty much as i have enumerated them with the motherly teapot sending up its clouds of vapour from the midst heaven bless the mark i want breath and time to discuss this banquet as it deserves and am too eager to get on with my story happily ichabod crane was not in so great a hurry as his historian but did ample justice to every dainty he was a kind and thankful creature whose heart dilated in proportion as his skin was filled with good cheer and whose spirits rose with eating as some men's do with drink he could not help too rolling his large eyes round him as he ate and chuckling with the possibility that he might one day be lord of all this scene of almost unimaginable luxury and splendor then he thought how soon he'd turn back upon the old schoolhouse snap his fingers in the face of hans von ripper and every other niggardly patron and kick any itinerant pedagogue out of doors that should dare to call him comrade old balthus von tassel moved about among his guests with a face dilated with content and good humour round and jolly as a harvest moon his hospital attentions were brief but expressive being confined to a shake of the hand a slap on the shoulder a loud laugh and a pressing invitation to fall to and help themselves and now the sound of the music from the common room or hall summoned to the dance the musician was an old grey-headed negro who had been the itinerant orchestra of the neighbourhood for more than half a century his instrument was as old and battered as himself the greater part of the time he scraped on two or three strings accompanying every movement of the bow with a motion of the head bowing almost to the ground and stamping with his foot whenever a fresh couple were to start ichabod prided himself upon his dancing as much as upon his vocal powers not a limb not a fibre about him was idle and to have seen his loosely hung frame in full motion and clattering about the room you would have thought st vitus himself that blessed patron of the dance was figuring before you in person he was the admiration of all the negroes who having gathered of all ages and sizes from the farm and the neighbourhood stood forming a pyramid of shining black faces at every door and window gazing with delight at the scene rolling their white eyeballs and showing grinning rows of ivory from ear to ear how could the flogger of urchins be otherwise than animated and joyous the lady of his heart was his partner in the dance and smiling graciously in reply to all his amorous oglings while brom bones sorely smitten with love and jealousy sat brooding by himself in one corner when the dance was at end ichabod was attracted to a knot of the sager folks who with old van tassel sat smoking at one end of the piazza gossiping over former times and drawing out long stories about the war this neighbourhood at the time of which i am speaking was one of those highly favoured places which abound with chronicle and great men the british and american lines had run near it during the war it had therefore been the scene of marauding and infested with refugees cowboys and all kinds of border chivalry just sufficient time had elapsed to enable each story-teller to dress up his tale with a little becoming fiction and in the indistinctness of his recollection to make himself the hero of every exploit there was the story of dufou martling a large blue-bearded dutchman who had nearly taken a british frigate with an old iron nine-pounder from a mud breastwork 
only that his gun burst at the sixth discharge and there was an old gentleman who shall be nameless being too rich a mine here to be lightly mentioned who in the battle of white plains being an excellent master of defence parried a musket ball with a small sword insomuch that he absolutely felt it whiz round the blade and glance off at the hilt in proof of which he was ready at any time to show the sword with the hilt a little bent there were several more that had been equally great in the field not one of whom was persuaded that he had a considerable hand in bringing the war to a happy termination but all these were nothing to the tales of ghosts and apparitions that succeeded the neighbourhood is rich in legendary treasures of the kind local tales and superstitions thrive best in these sheltered long-settled retreats but are trampled underfoot by the shifting throng that forms the population of most of our country places besides there is no encouragement for ghosts in most of our villages for they have scarcely had time to finish their first nap and turn themselves in their graves before their surviving friends have travelled away from the neighbourhood so that when they turn out at night to walk their rounds they have no acquaintance left to call upon this is perhaps the reason why we so seldom hear of ghosts except in our long-established dutch communities the immediate cause however of the prevalence of supernatural stories in these parts was doubtless owing to the vicinity of sleepy hollow there was a contagion in the very air that blew from that haunted region it breathed forth an atmosphere of dreams and fancies infecting all the land several of the sleepy hollow people were present at von tassel's and as usual were doling out their wild and wonderful legends many dismal tales were told about funeral trains and mourning cries and wailings heard and seen above the great tree where the unfortunate major andre was taken and which stood in the neighbourhood some mention was also made of the woman in white that haunted the dark glen at raven rock and was often heard to shriek on winter nights before a storm having perished there in the snow the chief part of the stories however turned upon the favourite spectre of sleepy hollow the headless horseman who had been heard several times of late patrolling the country and it was said tethered his horse nightly among the graves in the churchyard the sequestered situation of this church seems always to have made it a favourite haunt of troubled spirits it stands on a knoll surrounded by locust trees and lofty elms from among which its decent whitewashed walls shine modestly forth like christian purity beaming through the shades of retirement a gentle slope descends from it to a silver sheet of water bordered by high trees between which peeps may be caught at the blue hills of the hudson to look upon its grass-grown yard where the sunbeams seem to sleep so quietly one would think that there at least the dead might rest in peace on one side of the church extends a wide woody dell along which raves a large brook among broken rocks and trunks of fallen trees over a deep black part of the stream not far from the church was formerly thrown a wooden bridge the road that led to it and the bridge itself were thickly shaded by overhanging trees which cast a gloom about it even in the daytime but occasioned a fearful darkness at night this was one of the favourite haunts of the headless horseman and the place where he was most frequently encountered the tale was told of old brewer a most heretical disbeliever in ghosts how he met the horseman returning from his foray into sleepy hollow and was obliged to get up behind him how they galloped over bush and brake over hill and swamp until they reached the bridge when the horseman suddenly turned into a skeleton threw old brouvier into the brook and sprang away over the treetops with a clap of thunder this story was immediately matched by a thrice marvellous adventure of brome bones who made light of the galloping hessian as an errant jockey he affirmed that on returning one night from the neighbouring village of sing sing he had been overtaken by this midnight trooper that he had offered to race him for a bowl of punch and should have won it too for daredevil beat the goblin horse all hollow but just as they came to the church bridge the hessian bolted and vanished in a flash of fire all these tales told in that drowsy undertone which men talk in the dark the countenance of the listeners only now and then receiving a casual gleam from the glare of a pipe sank deep into the mind of ichabod 
he repaid them in kind with large extracts from his invaluable author cotton mather and added many marvelous events that had taken place in his native state of connecticut and fearful sights which had been seen in his nightly walks about sleepy hollow the revel now gradually broke up the old farmers gathered together their families in their wagons and were heard for some time rattling along the hollow roads and over the distant hills some of the damsels mounted on pillions behind their favorite swains and their light-hearted laughter mingling with the clatter of hoofs echoed along the silent woodlands sounding fainter and fainter until gradually they died away and the late scene of noise and frolic was all silent and deserted ichabod only lingered behind according to the custom of country lovers to have a tete-a-tete -tete with the heiress fully convinced that he was now on the high road to success what passed at this interview i will not pretend to say for in fact i do not know something however i fear me must have gone wrong for he certainly sallied forth after no great interval with an air quite desolate and chop-fallen oh these women these women could that girl have been playing off any of her coquettish tricks was her encouragement of the poor pedagogue all a mere sham to secure her conquest of his rival heaven only knows not i let it suffice to say ichabod stole forth with the air of one who had been sacking a hen-roost rather than a fair lady's heart without looking to the right or left to notice the scene of rural wealth on which he had so often gloated he went straight to the stable and with several hearty cuffs and kicks roused the steed most uncourteously from the comfortable quarters in which he was soundly sleeping dreaming of mountains of corn and oats and whole valleys of timothy and clover it was the very witching time of night that ichabod heavy-hearted and crestfallen pursued his travel homewards along the sides of the lofty hills which rise above tarrytown and which he had traversed so cheerily in the afternoon the hour was as dismal as himself far below him the tappan zee spread its dusky and indistinct waste of waters with here and there the tall mast of a sloop riding quietly at anchor under the land in the dead hush of midnight he could even hear the barking of the watchdog from the opposite shore of the hudson but it was so vague and faint as only to give an idea of his distance from his faithful companion of man now and then too the long-drawn crowing of a cock accidentally awakened would sound far far off from some farmhouse away among the hills but it was like a dreaming sound in his ear no signs of life occurred near him but occasionally the melancholy chirp of a cricket or perhaps the guttural twang of a bullfrog from a neighboring marsh as if sleeping uncomfortably and turning suddenly in his bed all the stories of ghosts and goblins that he had heard in the afternoon now came crowding upon his recollection the night grew darker and darker the stars seemed to sink deeper in the sky and driving clouds occasionally hid them from his sight he had never felt so lonely and dismal he was moreover approaching the very place where many of the scenes of the ghost stories had been laid in the centre of the road stood an enormous tulip tree which towered like a giant above all the other trees of the neighbourhood and formed a kind of landmark its limbs were gnarled and fantastic large enough to form trunks for ordinary trees twisting down almost to the earth and rising again into the air it was connected with the tragical story of the unfortunate andre who had been taken prisoner hard by and was universally known by the name of major andre's tree the common people regarded it with a mixture of respect and superstition partly out of sympathy for the fate of the, its ill-starred namesake and partly from the tales of strange sights and doleful lamentations told concerning it as ichabod approached this fearful tree he began to whistle he thought his whistle was answered it was but a blast sweeping sharply through the dry branches as he approached a little nearer he thought he saw something white hanging in the midst of the tree he paused and ceased whistling but on looking more narrowly perceived that it was a place where the tree had been scathed by lightning and the white wood laid bare suddenly he heard a groan his teeth chattered and his knees smoked against the saddle it was but the rubbing of one huge bough upon another as they were swayed about by the breeze he passed the tree in safety 
but new perils lay before him about two hundred yards from the tree a small brook crossed the road and ran into a marshy and thickly wooded glen known by the name of wiley's swamp a few rough logs laid side by side served for a bridge over this stream on that side of the road where the brook entered the wood a group of oaks and chestnuts matted thick with wild grapevines threw a cavernous gloom over it to pass this bridge was the severest trial it was at this identical spot that the unfortunate andre was captured and under the covert of those chestnuts and vines were the sturdy yeomen concealed who surprised him this has ever since been considered a haunted stream and fearful are the feelings of the schoolboy who has to pass it alone after dark as he approached the stream his heart began to thump he summoned up however all his resolution gave his horse half a score of kicks in the ribs and attempted to dash briskly across the bridge but instead of starting forward the perverse old animal made a lateral movement and ran broadside against the fence ichabod whose fears increased with the delay jerked the reins on the other side and kicked lustily with the contrary foot it was all in vain his steed started it is true but it was only to plunge to the opposite side of the road into a thicket of brambles and alder bushes the schoolmaster now bestowed both whip and heel under the starveling ribs of old gunpowder who dashed forward snuffling and snorting but came to a stand just by the bridge with a suddenness that had nearly sent his rider sprawling over his head just at that moment a plashy tramp by the side of the bridge caught the sensitive ear of ichabod in the dark shadow of the grove on the margin of the brook he beheld something huge misshapen black and towering it stirred not but seemed to gather up in the gloom like some gigantic monster ready to spring upon the traveller the hair of the affrighted pedagogue rose upon his head with terror what was to be done to turn and fly was now too late and besides what chance was there of escaping ghost or goblin if such it was which could ride upon the wings of the wind summoning up therefore a show of courage he demanded in stammering accents who who are you he received no reply he repeated his demand in a still more agitated voice still there was no answer once more he cudgelled the sides of the inflexible gunpowder and shutting his eyes broke forth with involuntary fervour into a psalm tune just then the shadowy object of alarm put itself in motion and with a scramble and a bound stood at once in the middle of the road though the night was dark and dismal yet the form of the unknown might now in some degree be ascertained he appeared to be a horseman of large dimensions and mounted on a black horse of powerful frame he made no offer of molestation or sociability but kept aloof on one side of the road jogging along on the blind side of old gunpowder who had now got over his fright and waywardness ichabod who had no relish for this strange midnight companion and bethought himself of the adventure of brome bones with the galloping hessian now quickened his steed in hopes of leaving him behind the stranger however quickened his horse to an equal pace ichabod pulled up and fell into a walk thinking to lag behind the other did the same his heart began to sink within him he endeavoured to resume his psalm tune but his parched tongue clove to the roof of his mouth and he could not utter a stave there was something in the moody and dogged silence of this pertinacious companion that was mysterious and appalling it was soon fearfully accounted for on mounting a rising ground which brought the figure of his fellow traveller in relief against the sky gigantic in height and muffled in a cloak ichabod was horror-struck on perceiving that he was headless but his horror was still more increased on observing that the head which should have rested on his shoulders was carried before him on the pommel of the saddle his terror rose to desperation he rained a shower of kicks and blows upon gunpowder hoping by a sudden movement to give his companion the slip but the spectre started full jump with him away then they dashed through the thick and thin stones flying and sparks flashing at every bound ichabod's flimsy garments fluttered in the air as he stretched his long lank body away over his horse's head in the eagerness of his flight 
they had now reached the road which turns off to sleepy hollow but gunpowder who seemed possessed with the demon instead of keeping up it made an opposite turn and plunged headlong downhill to the left this road leads through a sandy hollow shaded by trees for about a quarter of a mile where crosses the bridge famous in goblin story and just beyond swells the green knoll on which stands the whitewashed church as yet the panic of the steed had given his unskilful rider an apparent advantage in the chase but just as he had got halfway through the hollow the girths of the saddle gave way and he felt it slipping from under him he seized it by the pommel and endeavoured to hold it firm but in vain and had just time to save himself by clasping old gunpowder round the neck when the saddle fell to the earth and he heard it trampled under foot by his pursuer for a moment the terror of hans von ripper's wrath passed across his mind for it was his sunday saddle but this was no time for petty fears the goblin was hard on his haunches and unskilful rider that he was he had much ado to maintain his seat sometimes slipping on one side sometimes on another and sometimes jolted on the high ridge of his horse's backbone with a violence that he verily feared would cleave him asunder an opening in the trees now cheered him with the hopes that the church bridge was at hand the wavering reflection of a silver star in the bosom of the brook told him he was not mistaken he saw the walls of the church dimly glaring under the trees beyond he recollected the place where brom bones ghostly competitor had disappeared if i can but reach that bridge thought ichabod i am safe just then he heard the black steed panting and blowing close behind him he even fancied that he felt his hot breath another convulsive kick in the ribs and old gunpowder sprang upon the bridge he thundered over the resounding planks he gained the opposite side and now ichabod cast a look behind to see if his pursuer should vanish according to the rule in a flash of fire and brimstone just then he saw the goblin rising in his stirrups and in the very act of hurling his head at him ichabod endeavoured to dodge the horrible missile but too late it encountered his cranium with a tremendous crash he was tumbled headlong into the dust and gunpowder the black steed and the goblin rider passed by like a whirlwind the next morning the old horse was found without his saddle and with the bridle under his feet soberly cropping the grass at his master's gate ichabod did not make his appearance at breakfast dinner hour came but no ichabod the boys assembled at the schoolhouse and strolled idly about the banks of the brook but no schoolmaster hans van ripper now began to feel some uneasiness about the fate of poor ichabod and his saddle an inquiry was set on foot and after diligent investigation they came upon his traces in one part of the road leading to the church was found the saddle trampled in the dirt the tracks of horses hoofs deeply dented in the road and evidently at furious speed were traced to the bridge beyond which on the bank of a broad part of the brook where the water ran deep and black was found the hat of the unfortunate ichabod and close beside it a shattered pumpkin the brook was searched but the body of the schoolmaster was not to be discovered hans von ripper as executor of his estate examined the bundle which contained all his worldly effects they consisted of two shorts and a half two stocks for the neck a pair or two of worsted stockings an old pair of corduroy small clothes a rusty razor a book of psalm tunes full of dog's ears and a broken pitch pipe as to the books and furniture of the schoolhouse they belonged to the community excepting cotton mather's history of witchcraft a new england almanac and a book of dreams and fortune-telling in which last was a sheet of fool's cap much scribbled and blotted in several fruitless attempts to make a copy of verses in honour of the heiress of von tassel these magic books and the poetic scrawl were forthwith consigned to the flames by hans von ripper who from that time forward determined to send his children no more to school observing that he never knew any good come of this same reading and writing whatever money the schoolmaster possessed and he had received his quarter's pay but a day or two before he must have had about his person at the time of his disappearance 
the mysterious event caused much speculation at the church on the following sunday knots of gazers and gossips were collected in the churchyard at the bridge and at the spot where the hat and pumpkin had been found the stories of brewer of bones and a whole budget of others were called to mind and when they had diligently considered them all and compared them with the symptoms of the present case they shook their heads and came to the conclusion that ichabod had been carried off by the galloping hessian as he was a bachelor and in nobody's debt nobody troubled his head any more about him the school was removed to a different quarter of the hollow and another pedagogue reigned in his stead it is true an old farmer who had been down to new york on a visit several years after and from whom this account of the ghostly adventure was received brought home the intelligence that ichabod crane was still alive that he had left the neighborhood partly through fear of the goblin and hans von ripper and partly in mortification at having been suddenly dismissed by the heiress that he had changed his quarters to a distant part of the country had kept school and studied law at the same time had been admitted to the bar turned politician electioneered written for the newspapers and finally had been made a justice of the ten pound court brom bones too who shortly after his rival's disappearance conducted the blooming katrina in triumph to the altar was observed to look exceedingly knowing whenever the story of ichabod was related and also burst into a hearty laugh at the mention of the pumpkin which led some to suspect that he knew more about the matter than he chose to tell the old country wives however who are the best judges of these matters maintain to this day that ichabod was spirited away by supernatural means and it is a favorite story often told about the neighborhood round the winter evening fire the bridge became more than ever an object of superstitious awe and that may be the reason why the road has been altered of late years so as to approach the church by the border of the mill pond the schoolhouse being deserted soon fell to decay and was reported to be haunted by the ghost of the unfortunate pedagogue and the ploughboy loitering homeward of a still summer evening has often fancied his voice at a distance chanting a melancholy psalm tune among the tranquil solitudes of sleepy hollow end of chapter nine part two chapter ten part one of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part one the hare who thought the world had come to an end translated by h n francis once upon a time there was near the western ocean a grove of palm and velvet trees a certain hare lived here beneath a palm sapling at the foot of a velvet tree one day this hare after feeding came and lay down beneath a young palm tree and the thought struck him if this earth should be destroyed what would become of me at this very moment a ripe vilva fruit fell on a palm leaf at the sound of it the hare suddenly thought this solid earth is collapsing and starting up he fled without so much as looking behind him another hare saw him scampering off as if frightened to death and asked the cause of his sudden flight pray don't ask me he said the second hare followed crying pray sir what is it and kept running after him then the hare stopped a moment and without looking back he said the earth here is breaking up and at this the second hare ran after the first and then first one and then another hare caught sight of him running and joined in the chase till one hundred thousand hares all took their flight together they were seen by a deer a boar an elk a buffalo a wild ox a rhinoceros a tiger a lion and an elephant 
and when they asked what it meant and were told that the earth was breaking up they too took to flight by degrees this host of animals was a league long a wise brahmin who saw this headlong flight of animals and was told that the cause of it was that the earth was coming to an end thought the earth is nowhere coming to an end surely it must be some sound which was misunderstood by them if i don't make a great effort they will all perish i will save their lives with the speed of a lion he got before them to the foot of a mountain and roared three times like a lion they were terribly frightened and stopped in their flight standing all huddled together the brahmin in the guise of a lion went amongst them and asked why they were running away the earth is collapsing they answered who saw it collapsing he said the elephants know all about it they replied he asked the elephants but they didn't know they said the lion knew but the lion said we don't know the tigers know the tigers said the wild oxen know the wild oxen the buffaloes the buffaloes the elks the elks the boars the boars the deer the deer said we don't know the hares know when the hares were questioned they pointed to one particular hare and said this one told us so the brahmin went up to him and asked is it true sir that the earth is breaking up yes sir i saw it said the hare where he asked were you living when you saw it nearer the ocean sir in a grove of palm and velvet trees as i was lying beneath the shade of a palm sapling at the foot of a velvet tree i thought if this earth should break up where shall i go and at that very moment i heard the sound of the earth breaking up and i fled the lion thought to himself a ripe vilva fruit evidently must have fallen on a palm leaf and made a thud and this hare jumped to the conclusion that the earth was coming to an end and ran away i will find out the exact truth about it so he reassured the herd of animals and said i will take the hare and go and find out exactly whether the earth is coming to an end or not in the place pointed out by him until i return do you stay here then placing the hare on his back he sprang forward with the speed of a lion and putting the hare down in a palm grove he said come show us the place you meant i dare not my lord said the hare come don't be afraid said the lion the hare not daring to go near the vilva tree stood afar off and cried yonder sir is the place of dreadful sounds the lion went to the foot of the vilva tree and saw the spot where the hare had been lying beneath the shade of the palm tree and the ripe vilva fruit that fell on the palm leaf and having ascertained that the earth had not broken up he placed the hare on his back and with the speed of a lion soon came again to the herd of beasts he told them the whole story and having thus reassured the herd of beasts he let them go end of chapter ten part one chapter ten part two of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part two the watering of the saplings translated by rev w h d rouse once upon a time a king named visasena was reigning over the city of benares 
and proclamation was made of a holiday the park keeper thought he would take a holiday so calling the monkeys that lived in the park he said this park is a great blessing to you i want to take a week's holiday will you water the saplings on the seventh day oh yes they said he gave them the watering skins and went away the monkeys drew water and began to water the roots when the eldest monkey cried out wait now it's hard to get water we must not waste it let us pull up the plants and notice the length of their roots if they have long roots they need plenty of water but short ones need but a little true true they agreed so some of them pulled up the plants while others put them back and watered them who bid you do that asked a young gentleman living in benares our chief they replied to this the young gentleman answered if he was chosen as the best what sort of creatures are the rest whereat the monkeys repeated brahmin you know not what you say blaming us in such a way if the root we do not know how can we tell the trees that grow end of chapter ten part two chapter ten part three of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part three the old hare and the elephants translated by sir edwin arnold once on a time very little rain had fallen in the dew season and the elephants being oppressed with thirst thus addressed their leader master how are we to live the small creatures find something to wash in but we cannot and we are half dead in consequence whither shall we go then and what shall we do upon that the king of the elephants led them away a little distance and showed them a beautiful pool of water clear as crystal where they took their ease now it chanced that a company of hares resided on the banks of the pool and the going and the coming of the elephants trampled many of them to death till one of their number grumbled out this troop will be coming here to water every day and every one of our family will be crushed do not disquiet yourself said an old buck hare named goodspeed i will manage to stop it and so saying he set off bethinking himself on his way how he should approach and accost a herd of elephants for elephants destroy by touching snakes with point of tooth beguile kings by favor kill and traitors murder with a fatal smile i will get on the top of a hill he thought and address the elephants from there this being done and the lord of the herd perceiving him it was asked of the hare who art thou and whence comest thou i am an ambassador from his godship the moon replied goodspeed state your business said the elephant king sire began the hare an ambassador speaks the truth safely by reason of his position thus saith the moon then these hares were the guardians of my pool and thine elephants in coming here have scared them away this is not well am i not asanka whose banner bears a hare and are not these hares my followers please your worship said the elephant king with much fear we knew nothing of this we will go there no more it were well said the make-believe ambassador that you first make your apologies to the god who is quaking with rage in his pool and then went about your business we will do so 
replied the elephant with meekness and being led by night to the pool in the ripples of which the image of the moon was quivering the herd made their prostrations the hare explaining to the moon that their fault was committed in ignorance and therefore they got their dismissal end of chapter ten part three Chapter Ten, Part Four, of Junior Classics, Volume Two, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Junior Classics, Volume Two, Folk Tales and Myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part four the elephant has a bet with the tiger by walter skeet m r a s f a i in the beginning gaja the elephant and rimo the tiger were sworn friends but one day they came to a clearing and presently encountered lobong the long-tailed spectacle monkey and when he saw the monkey the elephant said mr lobong yonder is far too noisy let us try and shake him off if he falls to me i am to eat you and if he falls to you you are to eat me we will make a wager of it the tiger said agreed and the elephant replied agreed very well said the tiger you shall try and menace him first so the elephant tried to menace the monkey ow 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 he trumpeted and each time he trumpeted the monkey was scared but the monkey went jumping head foremost through the branches and never fell to the ground at all presently therefore the tiger asked the elephant well friend elephant would you like to try your luck again but the elephant said no thank you it shall be your turn now and if he falls to you you shall eat me if you really can make him fall then the tiger went and roared his longest and loudest and shortened his body as for a spring and growled and menaced the monkey thrice and the monkey leaped and fell at the tiger's feet for his feet and hands were paralyzed and would not grip the branches any more then the tiger said well friend elephant i suppose i may eat you now but the elephant said you have i admit won the wager but i beg you to grant me just seven days respite to enable me to visit my wife and children and to make my will the tiger granted the request and the elephant went home bellowing and sobbing every foot of the way now the elephant's wife heard the sound of her husband's voice and said to her children what can be the matter with your father that he keeps sobbing so and the children listened to make sure and said yes it really is father's voice the sobbing and not that of anybody else presently father elephant arrived and mother elephant asked what were you sobbing for father what have you done to yourself father elephant replied i made a wager with friend tiger about shaking down a monkey and friend tiger beat me i menaced the monkey but he did not fall if he had fallen to me i was to have eaten friend tiger but if he fell to friend tiger friend tiger was to eat me i was beaten and now friend tiger says he is going to eat me so i begged leave to come home and see you and he has given me just seven days respite now for the seven days father elephant kept sobbing aloud and neither ate nor slept and the thing came to the hearing of friend mouse deer what can be the matter with friend elephant that he keeps bellowing and bellowing neither does he sleep so that night is turned into day and day into night what on earth is the matter with him suppose i go and see said the mouse deer then the mouse deer went to see what was wrong and asked what is the matter with you friend elephant 
that we hear you bellowing and bellowing every single day in every single night just now too when the rams are upon us you are far too noisy but the elephant said it is no mere empty noise friend mouse dear i have got into a dreadful scrape what sort of a scrape inquired the mouse dear i made a wager with friend tiger about shaking down a monkey and he beat me what was the stake asked the mouse dear the stake was that friend tiger might eat me if friend tiger frightened it down and if i frightened it down i might eat friend tiger it fell to friend tiger and now friend tiger wants to eat me and my reason for not eating or sleeping any more is that i have got only just seven days respite to go home and visit my wife and children and to make my will then the mouse deer said if it came to friend tiger's eating you i should feel exceedingly sorrowful exceedingly distressed but things being only as you say i feel neither if you will assist me i will become your slave and my descendant shall be your slaves forever very well if that is the case i will assist you said the mouse deer go and look for a jar full of molasses friend elephant promised to do so and went to look for it at the house of a maker of palm wine the owner of the house fled for his life and the jar fell into friend elephant's possession who bore it back to the mouse deer then friend mouse deer said when does your promise expire and friend elephant replied tomorrow so when next morning arrived they started and the mouse deer said now pour the molasses over your back and let it spread and spread and run down your legs friend elephant did as he was ordered friend mouse deer then instructed the elephant as follows as soon as i begin to lick up the molasses on your back bellow as loud as you can and make believe to be hurt and writhe and wriggle this way and that and presently friend mouse deer commenced to lick hard and friend elephant writhed and wriggled and made believe to be hurt and made a prodigious noise of trumpeting in this way they proceeded and friend mouse deer got up and sat astride upon friend elephant's back and the elephant trumpeted and trumpeted all the way till they met with friend tiger at this friend mouse deer exclaimed a single elephant is very short commons if i could only catch that big and fat old tiger there it would be just enough to satisfy my hunger now when friend tiger heard these words of the mouse deer he said to himself so i suppose if you catch me you'll eat me into the bargain will you and friend tiger stayed not a moment longer but fled for his life fetching very lofty bounds and soon he met with a black ape and friend ape asked why running so hard friend tiger why so much noise and why just when the rams are upon us too do you go fetching such lofty bounds friend tiger replied what do you mean by so much noise what was the thing that was got upon friend elephant's back that had caught friend elephant and was devouring him so that he went writhing and wriggling for the pain of it and the blood went streaming down in floods moreover the thing that was on friend elephant's back said to my hearing that a single elephant was very short commons but if it could catch a fat old tiger like myself that would be just enough to satisfy its hunger friend ape said what was that thing friend tiger i don't know said the tiger ah mused the ape i wonder if it could be friend mouse deer certainly not said the tiger why how in the world could friend mouse deer swallow me to say nothing of his not being used to meat food said he come and let us go back again then they went back again to find the elephant and first the ape went the faster and then the tiger went the faster and then the ape got in front again but friend mouse deer sitting on friend elephant's back 
saw them coming and shouted hello father ape said he this is a dog's trick indeed you promised to bring me two tigers and you only bring me one i refuse to accept it father ape now when the tiger heard this he ran off at first as fast as he could but presently he slackened his pace and said it is too bad of you friend ape for trying to cozen me in order to pay your own debts for shame father ape it was only through good luck that he refused to accept me if he had accepted i should have been dead and done with so now if you come down to the ground you shall die the death yourself just for your trying to cheat me thus the tiger and the ape were set at enmity and to this day the tiger is very wroth with the ape for trying to cheat him and here the story ends End of chapter 10, part 4chapter ten part five of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part five how the tortoise outran the deer by c f hart a tortoise met a deer out walking one day and asked him what he was looking for the deer answered i am out for a walk to see if i cannot find something to eat and pray where are you going tortoise oh out walking looking for water to drink how soon do you expect to reach the water asked the deer why do you ask that question returned the tortoise because your legs are so short well answered the tortoise i can run faster than you can if you are long-legged you cannot run so fast as i then let us run a race said the deer well answered the tortoise when shall we run tomorrow at what time very early in the morning all right assented the tortoise who then went into the forest and called together his relations the other tortoises saying come on let's catch him but how are you going to catch him they inquired i said to the deer answered the tortoise let us run a race to see who can run the faster now i am going to cheat that deer you scatter yourselves along the edge of the campo in the forest keeping not very far from one another and see that you keep perfectly still each in his place tomorrow when we begin the race the deer will run in the campo but i will remain quietly in my place when he calls out to me if you are ahead of him answer but take care not to respond if he is past you early the next morning the deer went out to meet the tortoise come said the former let us run wait a bit said the tortoise i am going to run in the woods why how are you a little short-legged fellow going to run in the forest asked the deer surprised the tortoise insisted that he could not run in the campo but that he was accustomed to run in the forest so the deer assented and the tortoise went into the wood saying when i take my position i will make a noise of a little stick so that you may know i am ready when the tortoise having reached his place gave the signal the deer started off leisurely laughing to himself not thinking it worth his while to run after the deer had gone quite a little distance he turned around and called out hello tortoise when to his astonishment a tortoise a little way ahead cried out hello deer well said the deer to himself that tortoise does run fast whereupon he hurried up for a bit and then called out again but the voice of the tortoise still seemed to be beyond him why how's this exclaimed the deer and he ran briskly for a little ways till 
thinking that he surely must have passed the tortoise he stopped turned about and called again hello dear the answer came from the edge of the forest just ahead on this the deer set off at full speed and after a little but without stopping this time he called to the tortoise and still the cry hello dear came back to him from ahead he then redoubled his forces but with no better success and at last tired and bewildered he ran against a tree and fell dead the noise made by the feet of the deer having ceased the first tortoise listened not a sound was heard then he called to the deer but received no response so he went to see what was the matter and found the deer lying at the foot of the tree footnote this is an amazonian myth of the tupi speaking population as related in the lingua geral charles f hart a myth of the slow tortoise sun and the swift deer moon a race which the sun always wins end footnote end of chapter ten part five chapter ten part six of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part six which was the stronger the tortoise the taper or the whale by c f hart one day a tortoise went down to the sea to drink a whale saw him and called out here what are you doing tortoise why i'm drinking cause i'm thirsty then the whale began to make fun of the tortoise's short legs but the tortoise indignantly replied even if my legs are short i am stronger than you and i can pull you on shore the whale laughed come on let me see you do it well said the tortoise just wait until i go into the forest and get a sepo footnote a sepo is a long root growing in the air often used as a rope and footnote away went the tortoise into the forest and there he met a taper who asked him what he was looking for i am looking for a sepo and what are you going to do with a sepo asked the taper i want it to pull you down to the sea you exclaimed the taper surprised i'll pull you into the forest and what's more but never mind let's try who may be the stronger go get your sepo the tortoise went off and presently came back with a very long sepo one end of which he tied around the body of the taper now said the tortoise wait here until i go down to the sea when i shake the sepo run with all your might into the forest having attached one end to the taper he dragged the other down to the sea and fastened it to the tail of the whale this accomplished he said i will go up into the forest and when i shake the sepo pull as hard as you can for i am going to draw you on shore the tortoise then went into the wood midway between the whale and the taper shook the sepo and awaited the result first the whale swimming vigorously dragged the taper backward to the sea but the latter resisting with all his might finally gained a firm foothold and began to get the better of the whale drawing him in toward the shore then the whale made another effort and in this manner they kept tugging against one another each thinking the tortoise at the other end of the sepo until at last both gave up the struggle from sheer exhaustion the tortoise then walked down to the shore and the whale called out to him well you certainly are strong tortoise i am very tired the tortoise untied the sepo from the whale 
and having dipped himself in the water went over to where the taper was puffing after his labors well taper he said as he untied the sepo you see that i am the stronger it is true tortoise you are very very strong footnote the tortoise son has a trial of strength with a taper moon or perhaps this is the tortoise son provoking the everlasting tidal contest between sea and land see a fart and footnote end of chapter ten part six chapter ten part seven of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Junior Classics, Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Some Animal Myths of Various Lands. Part 7 How the Turtle Got His Shell by Annie Kerr. Long ago, our fathers have told us the turtle and the wallaby were friends now on a certain day the turtle was hungry and asked his friend to go with him to the beach and from thence to the hornbill's garden where was much sugar-cane and where bananas also were plentiful this they did and fed plentifully on all that was there the wallaby trod upon the stalks of the bananas and bowed them to the ground that his friend might eat thus did he also to the tall sugar canes and the flowering rush and they both did eat and their hunger was stayed now while they were eating the birds were at work in their gardens tilling the ground when the work was finished they dug up much taro and returned to the village to cook their food they peeled the roots and cut them up and placed them in the pots for cooking then said binama the hornbill let one of you go down to the beach and bring sea-water that our food may be salted but nothing came of it for one by one the birds made excuse fearing lest an enemy lay in wait at last the wagtail arose and ran into the house to make ready to go to the beach he hung his shell breastplate around his neck tied waving feathers round his head and took his spear and went forth as he went he leaped from side to side the better to avoid the foe if foe there were in a little while he came to binama's garden and saw the turtle and the wallaby feeding their hearts trembled nevertheless the turtle made bold and said to the wagtail thy master has bidden us eat of his bananas that our hunger may be stayed now the wagtail knew in his heart that they lied but he answered never a word but filled his bottles with sea-water and ran back to the village by another way when he reached the village he cried aloud friends the turtle and the wallaby are eating in our master's garden at this word all arose and ran for their spears and surrounded the garden the wallaby lifted up his head and seeing naught but enemies round him tarried not but leaped mightily and escaped the turtle could not jump as he well knew so he crawled with haste into a yam patch and hid himself under the leaves the birds knew he was still there and they hunted for him diligently until they found him and dragged him forth the turtle feared greatly and cried take not vengeance on me for truly the wallaby bade me come hither and with his feet he broke the stalks while i only ate of the fruit the birds cared little for his words and tied him to a pole and thus carried him to binama's house where they laid him upon a shelf till the morrow the next day binama called his servants together and all went to dig food to make a feast when they should slay the turtle 
none were in the house but the children whom Binama had set to guard the captive. Then the turtle made his voice soft and called to the children, Loosen my bonds, O children, quoth he, that we may play together. Now the children knew not what was in the turtle's mind, and they did as he bade them. He crawled down from the shelf and stretched himself, for he was stiff and sore. Then he said to the children, Where? are your ornaments leave the poor ones in the basket and bring forth only the good ones that i may see them the children ran to the place where binama kept his ornaments and brought forth a long necklace of shell money also two shell armlets and a wooden bowl and laid them before the turtle he forthwith wound the necklace many times round his neck and put on both the shell armlets. Moreover, the bowl he fastened upon his back. Then he said to the children, Ye behold me now richly attired. Watch, while I run a little and back again, and tell me if the sight is a good one or no. The children watched him crawl a few paces, and called him to return. This the turtle did, and all sat together in the shade of a tree then the turtle crawled once more and the children laughed to watch his ungainly form decorated with their father's ornaments again the turtle returned to the children but this time he did not sit with them for on a sudden he heard voices and knew the men were drawing near then he saw them as they came forth and ran swiftly to the sea the children cried aloud to their father come for the turtle is running away. When Binama heard this cry, he and the birds with him threw the sheaves of taro aside and gave chase to the runaway. But the turtle had already reached the sea, and he hastened to dive. The birds called, Show thyself now, lift up thy head. So the turtle did so, and the angry birds cast great stones into the sea, and the left armlet which the turtle wore was shattered. So he dived, but they called again, Show thyself, lift up thy head. And a stone fell upon the right armlet and broke it into small pieces. Again they called, and again the turtle raised himself in the water, and this time the stones cut the string on which the necklace of shell money was threaded. And now for the last time came the call, show thyself lift up thy head the turtle once more raised himself and the birds flung after him all the great stones they could find they fell in scores upon the wooden bowl which had been carried away from binama's home but it was not destroyed nay nor was it harmed at all and the turtle fled far over the sea nor was he seen again of Benama or his followers but since that day even until now so our fathers have told us all turtles carry upon their backs the bowl which in the old days was in the house of benama end of chapter ten part seven chapter ten part eight of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Some Animal Myths of Various Lands Part 8 The Legend of Rata by Sir George Grey Wahiroa had been treacherously slain by a chief named Matuku. So it became the duty of his young son Rata to revenge his father's death. By the time he had grown up, he had devised a plan for doing this, and gave the necessary orders to his followers he then started on a journey arrived at the entrance to matuku's place 
he found a man sitting in the courtyard who had been left in charge where is the man who killed my father he asked he lives down in the earth and i call to warn him when the new moon appears that is when he comes upon the earth to do battle how can he know when the proper time comes i call to him in a loud voice when will there be a new moon in two nights return to your village but come here again on the morning of the second day on the morning appointed rata returned and found the man sitting in the same place do you know any spot where i can conceal myself from the enemy with whom i am about to fight he inquired the man replied come with me and i will show you the two fountains of clear water this spot that we stand on said the man when they arrived at the place is the place where matuku rises up from the earth and yonder fountain is the one on which he combs and washes his dishevelled hair but this fountain is the one he uses to reflect his face in while he dresses it you cannot kill him while he is at the fountain he uses to reflect his face in because your shadow would also be reflected in it and he would see it but at the fountain in which he washes his hair you may smite and slay him will he make his appearance this evening yes they had not waited long when the moon became visible and the man told rata to hide himself near the brink of the fountain in which matuku would wash his hair then he shouted aloud ho ho the new moon is visible a moon two days old matuku heard him and seizing his two-handed wooden sword rose from the earth he laid his sword on the ground at the edge of the fountain where he dressed his hair and kneeling down on both sides of it he loosened the strings which bound up his long locks shook them out and plunged his head into the clear cool water rada crept out from where he lay hid and rapidly moved up and stood behind him as matuku raised his head above the water rada with one hand seized him by the hair while with the other he smote and slew him where shall i find the bones of my father he next asked the keeper they are not here a strange people who live at a distance came and carried them off upon hearing this reply rada returned to his village to think matters over he went to the forest and having found a very tall tree that grew straight throughout its entire length he felled it and cut its noble branching tops intending to fashion the trunk into a canoe the insects which inhabit trees and the spirits of the forest were very angry at this and as soon as rada had returned to the village when his day's work was done they took the tree and raised it up again the multitude of insects birds and spirits worked away at replacing each little chip and shaving in its proper place and sang as they worked fly together chips and shavings stick ye fast together hold ye fast together stand upright again o tree early the next morning rada came back when he got to the place where he had left the trunk lying on the ground he could not at first find it that fine tall straight tree which he saw standing whole and sound was the same he thought he had cut down and there it was now erect again however he stepped up to it and hewing away he felled it to the ground once more off he cut its fine branching top and he began to hollow out the hold of the canoe and round off the prow and the stern into their proper gracefully curved forms in the evening when it became too dark to work he returned to his village as soon as he was gone the multitudes of insects birds and spirits raised up the tree upon its stump once more they sang as they worked and when they had ended the tree again stood as sound as ever in its former place in the forest morning dawned and rada returned once more to work at his canoe when he reached the place was not he amazed to see the tree standing untouched just as he had first found it nothing daunted however he hews away at it again 
and down it topples crashing to the earth as soon as he saw the tree on the ground rada went off as if going home but turned back and hid himself in the underwood in a spot whence he could peep out and see what took place he had not been hidden long when he heard the innumerable multitude of the children of tani approaching singing their incantations and at last they arrived at the place where the tree was lying on the ground rada rushed upon them he sees some of them shouting ha ha it is you is it who have been exercising your magical arts upon my tree then the children of tani all cried aloud in reply who gave you authority to fell the forest god to the ground you had no right to do so when rada heard this he was overcome with shame at what he had done the children of tani called out to him return o rada to thy village we will make a canoe for you and rada obeyed their orders without delay they were so numerous and each understood so well what to do that they had no sooner begun to add zada canoe than it was finished when the canoe was afloat upon the sea one hundred and forty warriors embarked on board it and they paddled off to seek their foe one night just at nightfall they reached the fortress of their enemy rada landed alone leaving all his warriors on board as he stole along the shore he saw that a fire was burning on the sacred place where the enemy sacrificed to their gods without stopping he crept directly towards the fire and hid behind some thick bushes there were several priests and to assist them in their magical arts they were using the bones of wahiroa knocking them together to beat time while repeating a powerful incantation known only to themselves rada listened attentively to this incantation until he had learned it by heart and when he was quite sure he knew it he rushed suddenly upon the priest being ignorant of the numbers of the enemy or whence they came they made little resistance and were in a moment overcome the bones of his father wahiroa were then eagerly snatched up he hastened with them back to the canoe embarked on board it and his warriors at once paddled away rada's task of avenging his father's death being thus ended his tribe hauled up his large canoe on the shore and roofed it over with thatch to protect it from the sun and weather end of chapter ten part eight chapter ten part nine of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part nine why the hippopotamus lives in the water by elphinstone dayrell f r g s f r a i many years ago the hippopotamus whose name was isentim was one of the biggest kings on the land he was second only to the elephant the hippo had seven large fat wives of whom he was very fond now and then he used to give a big feast to the people but a curious thing was that although every one knew the hippo no one except his seven wives knew his name at one of the feasts just as the people were about to sit down the hippo said you have come to feed at my table but none of you know my name if you cannot tell my name you shall all of you go away without your dinner as they could not guess his name they had to go away and leave all the good food behind them before they left however the tortoise stood up and asked the hippopotamus what he would do if he told him his name at the next feast so the hippo replied that he would be so ashamed of himself 
that he and his whole family would leave the land and for the future would dwell in the water now it was the custom for the hippo and his seven wives to go down every morning and evening to the river to wash and have a drink of this custom the tortoise was aware the hippo used to walk first and the seven wives followed one day when they had gone down to the river to bathe the tortoise made a small hole in the middle of the path and then waited when the hippo and his wives returned two of the wives were some distance behind so the tortoise came out from where he had been hiding and half buried himself in the hole he had dug leaving the greater part of his shell exposed when the two hippo wives came along the first one knocked her foot against the tortoise's shell and immediately called out to her husband oh isn't him my husband i have hurt my foot at this the tortoise was very glad and went joyfully home when the next feast was given by the hippo he made the same condition about his name so the tortoise got up and said you promise you will not kill me if i tell you your name and the hippo promised the tortoise then shouted as loud as he was able your name is isn't him at which a cheer went up from all the people and then they sat down to dinner when the feast was over the hippo with his seven wives in accordance with his promise went down to the river and they have always lived in the water from that day till now although they come up on shore to feed at night you never find a hippo on the land in the daytime End of chapter 10, part 9chapter ten part ten of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton some animal myths of various lands part ten why the elephant has small eyes by elphinstone dayrell f r g s f r a i when ambo was king of calabar the elephant was not only a very big animal but he had eyes in proportion to his bulk in those days men and animals were friends and all mixed together quite freely at regular intervals king ambo used to give a feast and the elephant used to eat more than any one though the hippopotamus used to do his best however not being as big as the elephant although he was very fat he was left a long way behind as the elephant ate so much at these feasts the tortoise who was small and very cunning made up his mind to put a stop to the elephant eating more than a fair share of the food provided he therefore placed some dry kernels and shrimps of which the elephant was very fond in his bag and went to the elephant's house to make an afternoon call when the tortoise arrived the elephant told him to sit down so he made himself comfortable and having shut one eye took one palm kernel and a shrimp out of his bag and commenced to eat them with relish when the elephant saw the tortoise eating he said as he was always hungry himself you seem to have some good food there what are you eating the tortoise replied that the food was sweet but was rather painful as he was eating one of his eyes and he lifted up his head showing one eye closed the elephant said if the food is so good take out one of my eyes and give me the same food the tortoise who was waiting for this knowing how greedy the elephant was said i cannot reach your eye you are so big so the elephant took the tortoise in his trunk and lifted him up and with one quick scoop he had the elephant's eye out the elephant trumpeted with pain but the tortoise gave him some of the dried kernels and shrimps 
and they so pleased the elephant that he soon forgot the pain soon the elephant said that food is so sweet i must have some more but the tortoise told him that before he could have any the other eye must come out to this the elephant agreed and soon the elephant was quite blind the elephant then began to make a great noise and started pulling trees down and doing much damage calling out for the tortoise the tortoise had slid down the elephant's trunk to the ground and hid himself the next morning when the elephant heard the people passing he asked them what the time was and the bush buck who was nearest shouted out the sun is now up and i am going to market to get some yams and fresh leaves for my food then the elephant perceived that the tortoise had deceived him and began to ask all the passers-by to lend him a pair of eyes as he could not see but every one refused as they wanted their eyes themselves at last the worm groveled past and seeing the big elephant greeted him in his humble way he was much surprised when the king of the forest returned his salutation and very much flattered also the elephant said look here worm i have mislaid my eyes will you lend me yours for a few days i will return them next market day the worm was so flattered at being noticed by the elephant that he gladly consented and took his eyes out which as everyone knows were very small and gave them to the elephant when the elephant had put the worm's eyes into his own large eye sockets the flesh immediately closed round them so tightly that when the market day arrived it was impossible for the elephant to get them out again to return to the worm and although the worm repeatedly made applications to the elephant to return his eyes the elephant always pretended not to hear and sometimes used to say in a very loud voice if there are any worms about they had better get out of my way as they are so small i cannot see them and if i tread on them they will be squashed ever since then the worms have been blind and for the same reason elephants have such small eyes quite out of proportion to the size of their huge bodies end of chapter ten part ten chapter ten part eleven of junior classics volume two folk tales and myths this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by ali medved junior classics volume two folk tales and myths by william patton chapter ten some animal myths of various lands part eleven the boy who set a snare for the sun by h r schoolcraft at the time when the animals reigned on the earth they had killed all the people but a girl and her little brother and these two were living in fear in an out-of-the-way place the boy was a perfect little pygmy and never grew beyond the size of a mere infant but the girl increased with her years so that the task of providing food and shelter fell wholly upon her she went out daily to get wood for the lodge fire and she took her little brother with her that no mishap might befall them for he was too little to leave alone a big bird of a mischievous disposition might have flown away with him she made him a bow and arrows and one day she said to him my little brother i will leave you behind where i have been gathering the wood you must hide yourself and you will soon see the snowbirds come and pack the worms out of the logs which I have piled up. Shoot one of them and bring it home. He obeyed her and tried his best to kill one, but he came home unsuccessful. 
His sister told him that he must not despair, but try again the next day. She accordingly left him at the gathering place of the wood and returned to the lodge. Toward nightfall, she heard his little footsteps crackling through the snow, and he hurried in and threw down, with an air of triumph, one of the birds which he had killed. My sister, said he, I wish you to skin it, and stretch the skin, and when I have killed more, I will have a coat made out of them. But what shall we do with the body? said she, for they had always up to that time lived upon greens and berries. Cut it in two, he answered, and season us too with one half of it at a time. It was their first dish of game, and they greatly relished it. The boy kept on in his efforts, and in the course of time he killed ten birds, out of the skins of which his sister made him a pretty little coat. As he was small, there was one bird's skin to spare. Sister, said he one day, as he marched up and down before the lodge, dressed in his new coat and fancying himself the greatest little fellow in the world as he was for there was no other beside him my sister are we really alone in this world or are we making believe is there nobody else living and tell me what all this great broad earth and this huge big sky made for a little boy and girl like you and me by no means she said and then she explained to him that there were many folks very unlike a harmless girl and boy, such as they were, who lived in another part of the earth, and that if he would live blameless and not endanger his life, he must never go where they were. This only served to inflame the boy's curiosity, and he soon took his bow and arrows and went in that direction. After walking a long while and meeting no one, he became tired and stretched himself upon a high green knoll where the day's warmth had melted off the snow. It was a charming place to lie upon, and he fell asleep. While he slept, the sun beat so hot upon him that it singed his birdskin coat and so shriveled and shrunk it upon his body as to wake him up. When he saw the mischief the sun's fiery beams had played with the coat he was so proud of, he flew into a great rage and scolded the sun in a terrible way for a little boy no higher than a man's knee. Do not think you are too high for me to get you, said he. I shall revenge myself, O oh son. I will have you for a plaything yet. When he reached home, he told his sister how unfortunate he had been and bitterly bewailed the spoiling of his new coat. He would not eat, not so much as a single berry. He lay down like one who fasts, without changing his position for ten days nor could his sister persuade him to get up. At the end of ten days, he turned over on the other side and lay in that position for ten days. When he got up, he was very pale, but very determined. He ordered his sister to make him a snare, as he meant to catch the sun. She said she had nothing but presently she brought forward a dear sinew, which their father had left, and made it into a string suitable for a noose. The moment she showed it to her brother, he said it would not do, and angrily bade her find something else. She said she had nothing else, but presently remembered the bird's skin that had been left over when the coat was made, and this she made into a string. With this, 
The boy was more vexed than over the other. The sun has had enough of my bird skins, he said. Find something else. She did not dare to say again that she had nothing, so she went out of the lodge, murmuring to herself, Was there ever so obstinate a boy? Luckily, she thought of her hair, and pulling out some of it here and there from among her beautiful black locks, she quickly braided it into a fine cord and handed it to her brother. The moment his eye fell on it, he was delighted, and immediately began to run it back and forth through his hands, trying its strength. Satisfied that the long, glossy coil was strong enough, he wound it around his shoulders and set out from the lodge a little after midnight, his object being to catch the sun before he rose. Having fixed his snare firmly at a place where the sun must strike the land as it rose above the earth, he waited patiently. The instant it appeared, he drew the cord tight so that the sun was held fast and could not rise. Soon, there was a great commotion among the animals who ruled the earth. They had no light and ran to and fro, calling out to each other and asking what had happened. They called together a council to discuss the matter. An old dormouse, suspecting what was a trouble, proposed that someone should be appointed to go out and cut the cord. This was a bold thing to do as the rays of the sun would surely burn whoever ventured near them. No one seemed willing to run the risk, so the Dormouse himself undertook to go. The Dormouse was, at this time, the largest animal in the world. When he stood up, he looked like a mountain. He made haste to the place where the sun lay and snared. And as it came nearer and nearer, its back began to smoke and burn with the heat, and the whole top of its huge body was turned in a very short time to enormous heaps of ashes. The Dormouse did succeed, however, in cutting the cord with its teeth, and the sun blazed up into the high blue sky, as beautiful as ever. The poor Dormouse paid the price of his bravery. So great was the heat of the sun that he found himself, when it was all over, shrunk to a little bit of a thing. And that is the reason why the Dormouse is one of the tiniest creatures on the earth. The little boy returned home when he discovered that the sun had escaped his snare and devoted himself entirely to hunting. If the beautiful hair of my sister would not hold the sun fast, nothing in the world could, he said. I was not born, a little fellow like me, to look after the sun. It takes someone greater and wiser than I to do that. Whereupon he went out and shot ten more snowbirds, for at that he was very expert and had a new bird-skin coat made, which was prettier than the one he had worn before. End of chapter 10, part 11。Chapter 10, Some Animal Myths from Various Lands, part 12 of Junior Classics, volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics Volume 2 Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 10 Animal Myths from Various Lands. Part 12 The Bird Lover by Cornelius Matthews. In a region of country where the forest and prairie strived which should be the most beautiful, 
the open plain with its free sunshine and winds and flowers, or the closed wood with its delicious twilight walks and enamored haunts, there lived a wicked Manito in the disguise of an old Indian. Although the country furnished an abundance of game and whatever else a good heart could wish for, it was the study of this wicked genius to destroy such as fell into his hands. He made use of all his arts to decoy men into his power for the purpose of killing them. The country had been once thickly peopled, but the mudgy Monito had so thinned it by his cruel practices that he now lived almost solitary in the wilderness. The secret of his success lay in his great speed. He had the power to assume the shape of any four-footed creature, and it was his custom to challenge such as he sought to destroy to run with him. He had a beaten path on which he ran, leading around a large lake, and he always ran around this circle, so that the starting and the winning post was the same. Whoever failed, as everyone had, yielded up his life at this post, and although he ran every day, no man was ever known to beat this evil genius, for whenever he was pressed hard, he changed himself into a fox, wolf, deer, or other swift-footed animal, and was thus able to leave his competitor behind. The whole country was in dread of this same Mudgy Monito, and yet the young men were constantly running with him, for if they refused, he called them cowards, which was a reproach they could not bear. They would rather die than be called cowards. To keep up his sport, the Monito made light of these deadly footmatches, and instead of assuming a braggart air, and going about in a boastful way, with the blood of such as he had overcome upon his hands, he adopted very pleasing manners, and visited the lodges around the country as any other sweet-tempered and harmless old Indian might. His secret object in these friendly visits was to learn whether the young boys were getting old enough to run with him. He kept a very sharp eye upon their growth, and the day he thought them ready, he did not fail to challenge them to a trial on his racing ground. There was not a family in all that beautiful region which had not in this way been visited and thinned out, and the Manito had quite naturally come to be held in abhorrence by all the Indian mothers in the country. It happened that there lived near him a poor widow woman, whose husband and seven sons he had made away with, and she was now living with an only daughter and a son ten or twelve years old. This woman was very poor and feeble and she suffered so much for lack of food and other comforts of the lodge that she would have been glad to die, but for her daughter and her little son. The Mudgy Monito had already visited her lodge to observe whether the boy was sufficiently grown to be challenged to the race, and so crafty in his approaches and so soft in his manners was the Monito that the mother feared that he would yet decoy the son and make away with him as he had done with his father and his seven brothers, in spite of all her struggles to save him. And yet she strove with all her might to strengthen her son in every good course. She taught him as best she could what was becoming for the wise hunter and the brave warrior. She remembered and set before him all that she could recall of the skill and the craft of his father and his brothers who were lost. The widow woman also instructed her daughter in whatever should make her useful as a wife and in the leisure time of the lodge she gave her lessons in the art of working with the quills of porcupine, and bestowed on her such other accomplishments as should make her an ornament and a blessing to her husband's household. The daughter, Minda by name, was kind and obedient to her mother, and never failed in her duty. Their lodge stood high up on the banks of a lake, which gave them a wide prospect of country, embellished with groves and open fields which waved with the blue light of their long grass, and made at all hours of sun and moon a cheerful scene to look upon. Across this beautiful prairie, Minda had one morning made her way to gather dry limbs for their fire, for she disdained no labor of the lodge. And while enjoying the sweetness of the air and the green beauty of the woods, she strolled far away. She had come to a bank, painted with flowers of every hue, and was reclining on its fragrant couch when a bird of red and deep blue plumage softly blended, alighted on a branch nearby, 
and began to pour forth its carol. It was a bird of strange character, such as she had never before seen. Its first note was so delicious to the ear of Minda, and it so pierced to her young heart, that she listened as she had never before to any mortal or heavenly sound. It seemed like the human voice, forbidden to speak, and uttering its language through this wild wood chant with a mournful melody, as if it bewailed the lack of the power or the right to make itself more plainly intelligible. The voice of the bird rose and fell, and circled round and round, that whithersoever floated or spread out its notes, they seemed ever to have their center where Minda sat. And she looked with sad eyes into the sad eyes of the mournful bird, that sat in his red and deep blue plumage just opposite to the flowery bank. The poor bird strove more and more with his voice, and seemed ever more and more anxiously to address his notes of lament to Minda's ears, till at last she could not refrain from saying, What aileth thee, sad bird? As if he had but waited to be spoken to, the bird left his branch, and alighted upon the bank, smiling on Minda, and shaking his shining plumage, answered, I am bound in this condition, until a maiden shall accept me in marriage. I have wandered these groves, and sung to many and many of the Indian girls, but none ever heeded my voice till you, will you be mine, he added, and poured forth a flood of melody which sparkled and spread itself with its sweet murmurs over all the scene, and fairly entranced the young Minda, who sat silent, as if she feared to break the charm by speech. The bird, approaching nearer, asked her if she loved him, to get her mother's consent to their marriage. I shall be free then, said the bird, and you shall know me as I am. Minda lingered and listened to the sweet voice of the bird in its own forest notes, or filling each pause with gentle human discourse, questioning her as to her home, her family, and the little incidents of her daily life. She returned to the lodge later than usual, but she was too timid to speak to her mother of that which the bird had charged her. She returned again and again to the fragrant haunt in the wood, and every day she listened to the song and the discourse of her bird admirer with more pleasure, and he every day besought her to speak to her mother of the marriage. This she could not, however, muster heart and courage to do. At last the widow began herself to have a suspicion that her daughter's heart was in the wood. From her long delays in returning, and the little success she had in gathering the fire branches for which she went in search. In answer to her mother's questions, Minda revealed the truth and made known her lover's request. The mother, considering the lonely and destitute condition of her little household, gave her consent. The daughter, with light steps, hastened with the news to the wood. The bird lover, of course, heard it with delight, and fluttered through the air in happy circles, and poured forth a song of joy, which thrilled Minda to the heart. He said that he would come to the lodge at sunset, and immediately took wing while Minda hung fondly upon his flight, till he was lost far away in the blue sky. With the twilight, the bird lover, whose name was Mondoa, appeared at the door of the lodge as a hunter with a red plume and a mantle of blue upon his shoulders. He addressed the widow as his friend, and she directed him to sit down beside her daughter, and they were regarded as man and wife. Early on the following morning, he asked for the bow and arrows of those who had been slain by the wicked Manito, and went out a-hunting. As soon as he had got out of sight of the lodge, he changed himself into the woodbird, as he had been before his marriage, and took his flight through the air. Although game was scarce in the neighborhood of the widow's lodge, Mondoa returned at evening in his character of a hunter with two deer. This was his daily practice, and the widow's family never more lacked for food. It was noticed, however, that Mondoa himself ate but little, and that of a peculiar kind of meat flavored with berries, which with other circumstances convinced them that he was not as the Indian people around him. In a few days his mother-in-law told him that the Minito would come to pay them a visit, to see how the young man, her son, prospered. Mondoa answered that he should not on that day be absent. When the time arrived, he flew upon a tall tree overlooking the lodge, and took his station there as the wicked Minito passed in. The Mudgy Monedo cast sharp glances at the scaffold so well laden with meat, and as soon as he had entered he said, Why, who is it that is furnishing you with meat so plentifully? 
No one, she answered, but my son. He is just beginning to kill deer. No, no, he retorted. Someone is living with you. Coeen, no indeed, replied the widow. You are only making sport of my hapless condition. Who do you think would come and trouble themselves about me? Very well, answered the Minito. I will go, but on such a day I will again visit you and see who it is that furnishes the meat and whether it is your son or not. He had no sooner left the lodge and got out of sight when the son-in-law made his appearance with two more deer. On being made acquainted with the conduct of the Manito, Very well, he said, I will be at home the next time to see him. Both the mother and the wife urged Mondoa to be aware of the Manito. They made known to him all of his cruel courses, and assured him that no man could escape from his power. No matter, said Mondoa. If he invites me to the race ground, I will not be backward. What follows may teach him, my mother, to show pity on the vanquished and not to trample on the widow and those who are without fathers. When the day of the visit of the Manito arrived, Mondoa told his wife to prepare certain pieces of meat, which he pointed out to her, together with two or three buds of the birch tree, which he requested her to put in the pot. He directed also that the Manito should be hospitably received, as if he had been just the kind-hearted old Indian he professed to be. Mondoa then dressed himself as a warrior, embellishing his visage with tints of red to show that he was prepared for either war or peace. As soon as the Maji Monedo arrived, he eyed this strange warrior, whom he had never seen before. But he dissembled, as usual, and with a gentle laugh said to the widow, Did not I tell you that someone was staying with you? For I knew your son was too young to hunt. The widow excused herself by saying that she did not think it necessary to tell him, insomuch as he was a Minito, and must have known before he asked. The Minito was very pleasant with Mondoa and after much other discourse in a gentle spoken voice, he invited him to the racing ground, saying it was a manly amusement, that he would have an excellent chance to meet there with other warriors, and that he should himself be pleased to run with him. Mondoa would have excused himself, saying that he knew nothing of running. Why, replied the Maji Monito, trembling in every limb as he spoke, don't you see how old I look? Well, you are young and full of life. We must at least run a little to amuse others. Be it so, then, replied Mondoa. I will oblige you. I will go in the morning. Pleased with his crafty success, the Manito would have now taken his leave, but he was pressed to remain and partake of their hospitality. The meal was immediately prepared, but one dish was used. Mondoa partook of it first to show his guest that he need not fear, saying at the same time, It is a feast, and as we seldom meet, we must eat all that is placed on the dish, as a mark of gratitude to the great spirit for permitting me to kill animals, and for the pleasure of seeing you and partaking of it with you. They ate and talked on this and that until they had nearly dispatched the meal, when the Manito took up the dish and drank off the broth at a breath. On setting it down, he immediately turned his head and commenced coughing with great violence. The old body in which he had disguised himself was well nigh shaken in pieces, for he had, as Mondoa expected, swallowed a grain of the birch bud, and this, which relished to himself as being of the bird nature, greatly distressed the old Manito who partook of the character of an animal or four-footed thing. He was at last put to such confusion of face by his constant coughing that he was enforced to leave, saying, or rather hiccoughing, as he left the lodge, that he should look for the young man at the racing ground in the morning. When the morning came, Mondoa was early astir, oiling his limbs and enameling his breast and arms with red and blue, resembling the plumage in which he had first appeared to Minda. Upon his brow he placed a tuft of feathers of the same shining tints. By his invitation, his wife Minda, the mother and her young son, attended Mondoa to the Monito's racing ground. The lodge of the Monito stood upon a high ground, and near it stretched out a long row of other lodges, said to be possessed by wicked kindred of his, who shared in the spoils of his cruelty. As soon as the young hunter and his party approached, the inmates appeared at their lodge doors and cried out, We are visited. At this cry, the Mudgy Monito came forth and descended with his companions to the starting post on the plain. From this the course could be seen, winding in a long girdle about the lake, and as they were now all assembled, the old Monito began to speak of the race belting himself up and pointing to the post, 
which was an upright pillar of stone. But before we start, said the Manito, I wish it to be understood that when men run with me I make a wager, and I expect them to abide by it, life against life. Very well, be it so, answered Mondoa. We shall see whose head is to be dashed against the stone. We shall, rejoined the mudgy Manito. I am very old, but I shall try and make a run. Very well, again rejoined Mondoa. I hope we shall both stand to our bargain. Good, said the old Manito, and he at the same time cast a sly glance at the young hunter, and rolled his eyes toward where stood the pillar of stone. I am ready, said Mondoa. The starting shout was given, and they set off at high speed, the Manito leading and Mondoa pressing closely after. As he closed upon him, the old Manito began to show his power, and changing himself into a fox, he passed the young hunter with ease and went leisurely along. Mondoa now, with a glance upward, took the shape of a strange bird of red and deep blue plumage, and with one flight, lighting at some distance ahead of the Manito, resumed his mortal shape. When the mudgy Monito espied his competitor before him, Whoa, whoa, he exclaimed, this is strange, and he immediately changed himself into a wolf and sped past Mondoa. As he galloped by, Mondoa heard a noise from his throat, and he knew that he was still in distress from the birch bud, which he had swallowed at his mother-in-law's lodge. Mondoa again took wing, and shooting into the air, he descended suddenly with great swiftness and took the path far ahead of the old Manito. As he passed the wolf, he whispered in his ear, My friend, is this the extent of your speed? The Manito began to be troubled with bad forebodings, for on looking ahead, he saw the young hunter in his own manly form, running along at leisure. The mudgy Manito, seeing the necessity of more speed, now passed Mondoa in the shape of a deer. They were now far around the circle of the lake, and fast closing in upon the starting post, when Mondoa, putting on his red and blue plumage, glided along the air and alighted upon the track far in advance. To overtake him, the old Manito assumed the shape of a buffalo, and he pushed on with such long gallops that he was again the foremost on the course. The buffalo was the last change he could make, and it was in this form that he had most frequently conquered. The young hunter, once more a bird, in the act of passing the Manito, saw his tongue lolling from his mouth with fatigue, my friend, said Mondoa, is this all your speed? The Manito made no answer. Mondoa had resumed his character of a hunter and was within a run of the winning post when the wicked Manito had nearly overtaken him. Baka, Baka, Neji, he called out to Mondoa. Stop, my friend, I wish to talk to you. Mondoa laughed aloud as he replied, I will speak to you at the starting post. When men run with me, I make a wager, and I expect them to abide by it. Life against life. One more flight as the blue bird with red wings, and Mondoa was so near to the goal that he could easily reach it in his mortal shape, shining in beauty, lighted up like the sky, with tinted arms and bosom gleaming in the sun, and the party-colored plume on his brow, waving in the wind. Mondoa, cheered by a joyful shout from his own people, leaped to the post. The Manito came on with fear in his face. My friend, he said, spare my life and then added in a low voice, as he would not that the others should hear it, Give me to live. And he began to move off, as if the request had been granted. As you have done to others, replied Mondoa, so shall it be done to you. And seizing the wicked Manito, he dashed him against the pillar of stone. His kindred, who were looking on in horror, raised a cry of fear, and fled away in a body to some distant land, whence they have never returned. The widow's family left the scene, and when they had all come out into the open fields, they walked on together until they had reached the fragrant bank and the evergreen wood, where the daughter had first encountered her bird lover. Mondoa, turning to the widow, said, My mother, here we must part. Your daughter and myself must now leave you. The good spirit, moved with pity, has allowed me to be your friend. I have done that for which I was sent. I am permitted to take with me the one whom I love. I have found your daughter ever kind, gentle, and just. She shall be my companion. The blessing of the good spirit be ever with you. Farewell, my mother. My brother, farewell. While the widow woman was still lost in wonder at these words, Mondoa and Minda, his wife, changed at the same moment. 
rose into the air as beautiful birds, clothed in shining colors of red and blue. They caroled together as they flew, and their songs were happy, and falling, falling like clear drops, as they rose and rose, and winged their way far upward. A delicious peace came into the mind of the poor widow woman, and she returned to her lodge, deeply thankful at heart for all the goodness that had been shown to her by the master of life. From that day forth she never knew one, and her young son proved a comfort to her lodge, and the tuneful carol of Mondoa and Minda, as it fell from heaven, was a music always, go whither she would, sounding peace and joy in her ear. End of chapter 10 Animal Mists from Various Lands Part 12 The Bird Lover Recording by Peter Strom, Sabetha, Kansas, on July 21st, 2018. Chapter 10, Part 13 of Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 10, Some Animal Myths of Various Lands, Part 13, Wounds. The Father of Indian Corn by Cornelius Matthews In time past, we cannot tell exactly how many, many years ago, a poor Indian was living with his wife and children in a beautiful part of the country. He was not only poor, but he was not expert in procuring food for his family, and his children were too young to give him assistance. Although of a lowly condition and straitened in his circumstances, he was a man of kind and contented disposition. He was always thankful to the Great Spirit for everything he received. He even stood in the door of his lodge to bless the birds that flew past in the summer evenings, although, if he had been of a complaining temper, he might have repined that they were not rather spread upon the table for his evening meal. The same generous and sweet disposition was inherited by his eldest son, who had now arrived at the proper age to undertake the ceremony of the fast, to learn what kind of a spirit would be his guide and guardian through life. Once, for this was his name, had been an obedient boy from his infancy, pensive, thoughtful, and gentle, so that he was beloved by the whole family. As soon as the first buds of spring appeared, and the delicious fragrance of the young year began to sweeten the air, his father, with the help of his younger brothers, built for once the customary little lodge, at a retired spot at some distance from their own, where he would not be disturbed during the solemn rite. To prepare himself, Wun sought to clear his heart of every evil thought, and to think of nothing that was not good and beautiful and kindly. That he might store his mind with pleasant ideas for his dreams, for the first few days he amused himself by walking in the woods and over the mountains, examining the early plants and flowers. As he rambled far and wide, through the wild country, he felt a strong desire to know how the plants and herbs and berries grew, without any aid from man, and why it was that some kinds were good to eat and that others were possessed of medicinal or poisonous power. After he had become too languid to walk about and confine himself strictly to the lodge, he recalled these thoughts, and turning them in his mind, he wished he could dream of something that would prove a benefit to his father and family and to all others of his fellow creatures. True, thought Wunz, the Great Spirit made all things, and it is to him that we owe our lives. Could he not make it easier for us to get our food than by hunting animals and taking fish? I must try to find this out in my visions. On the third day, Wunz became weak and faint and kept to his bed. Suddenly he fancied, as he lay thus, that a bright light came in at the lodge door, and ere he was aware, he saw a handsome young man with a complexion of the softest and purest white coming down from the sky and advancing toward him. The beautiful stranger was richly and gaily dressed, having on a great many garments of green and yellow colors, but differing in their deeper or lighter shades. He had a plume of waving feathers on his head, and all his motions were graceful and reminded once of the deep green of the summer grass and the clear amber of the summer sky and the gentle blowing of the summer wind. Beautiful as the stranger was, 
he paused on a little mound of earth just before the door of the lodge. I am sent to you, my friend, said a celestial visitor, in a voice most soft and musical to listen to. I am sent to you by that great spirit who made all things in the sky and on the earth. He has seen and knows your motives in fasting. He sees that it is from a kind and benevolent wish to do good to your people and to procure a benefit for them that you do not seek for strength in war or the praise of the men of the bloody hand. I am sent to instruct you and to show you how you can do your kindred good. He then told the young man to arise and to prepare to wrestle with him as it was only by this means that he could hope to succeed in his wishes. Wunz knew how weak he was from fasting, but the voice of the stranger was cheery and put such a courage in his heart that he promptly sprang up, determined to die rather than fail. Brave Wunz, if you ever accomplish anything, it will be through the power of the resolve that spake within you at that moment. He began the trial, and after a long sustained struggle he was almost overpowered. When the beautiful stranger said, My friend, it is enough for once. I will come again to try you. And smiling on him, he returned through the air in the same direction in which he had come. The next day, although he saw how sweetly the wild flowers bloomed upon the slopes and the birds warbled from the woodland, he longed to see the celestial visitor and to hear his voice. To his great joy, he reappeared at the same hour toward the going down of the sun and re-challenged ones to a trial of strength. The brave ones felt that his strength of body was even less than on the day before, but the courage of his mind seemed to grow. Observing this, and how ones put his whole heart in the struggle, the stranger again spoke to him in the words he used before, adding, Tomorrow will be your last trial. Be strong, my friend, for this is the only way in which you can overcome me and obtain the boon you seek. The light which shone after him as he left the ones was brighter than before. On the third day he came again and renewed the struggle. Very faint in body was poor ones, but he was stronger at heart than ever and determined to prevail now or perish. He put forth his utmost powers, and after a contest more severe than either of the others, the stranger ceased his efforts and declared himself conquered. For the first time he entered ones's little fasting lodge, and sitting down beside the youth, he began to deliver his instructions to inform him in what manner he should proceed to take advantage of his victory. You have won your desire of the great spirit, said the beautiful stranger. You have wrestled manfully. Tomorrow will be the seventh day of your fasting. Your father will give you food to strengthen you, and as it is the last day of trial, you will prevail. I know this and now tell you what you must do to benefit your family and your people. Tomorrow, he repeated, I shall meet you and wrestle with you for the last time. As soon as you have prevailed against me, you will strip off my garments and throw me down, clean the earth of roots and weeds, make it soft and bury me in the spot. When you have done this, leave my body in the earth and do not disturb it, but come at times to visit the place to see whether I have come to life and above all, be careful to never let the grass or weeds grow upon my grave. Once a month, cover me with fresh earth. If you follow these my instructions, you will accomplish your object of doing good to your fellow creatures by teaching them the knowledge I now teach you. He then shook ones by the hand and disappeared, but he was gone so soon that ones could not tell what direction he took. In the morning, ones's father came to his lodge with some slight refreshments, saying, my son, you have fasted long enough. If the great spirit will favor you, he will do it now. It is seven days since you have tasted food, and you must not sacrifice your life. The master of life does not require that. My father, replied Wunz, wait till the sun goes down. I have a particular reason for extending my fast to that hour. Very well, said the old man. I shall wait till the hour arise and you shall be inclined to eat. At his usual hour of appearing, the beautiful sky visitor returned, and the trial of strength was renewed. Although he had not availed himself of his father's offer of food, once felt that new strength had been given him. His heart was mighty within him to achieve some great purpose. Courage was like the eagle that spreads his wings within the treetop for a great flight, within the bosom of the brave ones.
He grasped his angel challenger with supernatural strength, threw him down, and, mindful of his own instructions, tore from him his beautiful garments and plume, and finding him dead, immediately buried him on the spot, using all the precautions he had been told of, and very confident was Wunz all the time that his friend would again come to life. Wunz now returned to his father's lodge, where he was warmly welcomed, for as it had been appointed to him during the days of his fasting to walk apart with heaven, he was not permitted to see any human face save that of his father, the representative to the little household upon earth of the good father who is in heaven. Once partook sparingly of the meal that had been prepared for him, and once more mingled in the cares and sports of the family. But he never for a moment forgot the grave of his friend. He carefully visited it throughout the spring, and weeded out the grass, and kept the ground in a soft and pliant state, and sometimes, when the brave ones thought of his friend that was gone from his sight, he dropped a tear upon the earth where he lay. Watching and tending, and moistening the earth with his tears, it was not long before one saw the tops of green plumes coming through the ground, and the more faithful he was in obeying his instructions, in keeping the ground in order, and in cherishing the memory of his departed friend, the faster they grew. He was, however, careful to conceal the charge of the earth which he had from his father. Days and weeks had passed in this way, the summer was drawing toward a close, when one day, after a long absence in hunting, once invited his father to follow him to the quiet and lonesome spot of his former fast. The little fasting lodge had been removed, and the weeds kept from growing on the circle where it had stood, but in its place rose a tall and graceful plant, surmounted with nodding plumes and stately leaves and golden clusters. There was in its aspect and bearing the deep green of the summer grass, the clear amber of the summer sky, and the gentle blowing of the summer wind. "'It is my friend!' shouted Wunz. "'It is the friend of all mankind! It is Mondamin! It is our Indian corn! We need no longer rely on hunting alone, for as long as this gift is cherished and taken care of, the ground itself will give us a living!' He then pulled an ear. "'See, my father,' said he, this is what I fasted for. The great spirit has listened to my voice and sent us something new, and henceforth our people will not alone depend upon the chase or upon the waters. Once then communicated to his father the instructions given to him by the stranger. He told him that the broad husks must be torn away, as he had pulled off the garments in his wrestling, and having done this, he directed him how the ear must be held before the fire till the outer skin became brown, as the complexion of his angel friend had been tinted by the sun, while all the milk was retained in the grain. The whole family, in high spirit, and deeply grateful to the merciful master who gave it, assisted in a feast on the newly grown ears of corn. So came that mighty blessing into the world, and we owe all of those beautiful fields of healthful grain to the dream of the brave boy ones. End of chapter 10, part 13「チャプター10」「パート14」「ジュニア・クラシック・ボリューム2」「フォーク・テイルズ・アンド・メッツ」「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.」「Recording by Jyoti」「ジュニア・クラシック・ボリューム2」「フォーク・テイルズ・アンド・メッツ」by William Patton「チャプター10」Some Animal Myths of Various Lands Part 14 When Brer Wolf Have His Corn Shucking When Brer Wolf Have His Corn Shucking by Anonymous Brer Wolf, he make a powerful crop of corn one year and he turn it over in his mind how he going to get all that corn shucked. Because Brer Wolf mighty unpopular man with his neighbors and when Brer Wolf have a corn shucking, the creatures don't turn out like they do when Siskoon have a corn shucking. But Brer Wolf, he have a powerful handsome daughter on the carpet. All the chaps about the county has had their heads set to step up to Brer Wolf's daughter. So Brer Wolf, he send out word how the chap what shucks the most corn at his shucking shall have his handsome daughter. Well, 
The chaps, they come from the far end of Columbia County and some come from Richmond County and they set to work and they make the shucks fly and each chap have a pile to himself. Brer Coon, he might set on Brer Wolf's daughter and Brer Coon, he know himself a powerful likely corn shucker and Brer Coon, he loathe to himself how he have a right smart chance to get the girl. Brer Fox, his head done plain turned when Miss Wolf roll her handsome eyes at himself. And so, Brer Fox, he get a pile to himself and fall to work. Now, old Brer Rabbit, his heart set on the girl, but Brer Rabbit, he are a mighty poor corn shucker. But Brer Rabbit, he just naturally know he don't stand no chance shucking a pile of corn and making time against Brer Coon. So, so, Brer Rabbit, he don't waste himself. Brer Rabbit don't, but he take his hat off and he go up to Brer Wolf and he make his bow and he ask Brer Wolf if he learn his daughter to dance, can he have her? But Brer Wolf, he say, what I said? I said, well, Brer Rabbit, he feel terrible put down, but he fall too, and he act most so vigorous. He sing, he, and he dance, and he dance, and he sing, and he amuse the company, most agreeable like, and he sing before the girls, and he dance before the girls, and he showed them the new step and the new shuffle, Brer Rabbit do. Brer Coon, he just turn his eye on Brer Rabbit occasionally, but he don't pay no attention to his acting and his frolicking. Brer Coon, he just make time with his corn shucking. Twelve Brer Coon's pile, it make three times the pile of the other chaps. When it come time for Brer Wolf to come round and count his piles, Brer Rabbit, he sat down alongside Brer Coon, and he fall to shucking corn to beat all. When Brer Wolf come round Brer Rabbit, he certainly do make the shucks fly powerful, cause the old rascal just been cutting up and acting all the evening, and he ain't tired. When Brer Wolf see the great pile so much bigger than what all the other chaps got, Brer Wolf, he say, What for both you chaps? Shuck on one pile, Brer Coon, he low that all his pile, he low Brer Coon do. How Brer Rabbit been cutting up and frolicking all the evening and he just now come and sat down alongside his pile? Brer Rabbit, he say, he swear and kiss the book this my pile. Brer Coon, he just been frolicking and going on all the evening to beat all. He make us laugh, nigh, bout fit to kill ourselves, while I done work my hands plumb to the bone. Now, he set himself down here and say it is spile. Brer Wolf, he say he leave it to the company, but the chaps, they don't want Brer Rabbit to have the girl. And they don't want Brer Coon to have the girl, so they won't take sides. They low, they been working so powerful hard, they don't take noticement of Brer Coon or Brer Rabbit. Then Brer Wolf, he low, he leave it to the girls. Now, Miss Wolf, she been favoring Brer Rabbit all the evening. Brer Rabbit. Now, Miss Wolf, she been favoring Brer Rabbit all the evening. Brer Rabbit dancing and singing plumped on Miss Wolf's head. So, Miss Wolf, she say, It most surely are Brer Rabbit's pile. Miss Wolf, she say, she plumb, astonished how Brer Coon can story so. Brer Rabbit, he take the girl and go off home clippity lippity. Poor old Brer Coon, he take himself off home. He's so tired he can scarcely hold himself together. End of chapter. Part 14. Recording by Jyoti. Chapter 10. Part 15. Of Junior Classics, Volume 2. 
Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths, by William Patton. Chapter 10, Some Animal Myths of Various Lands, Part 15. Br'er Rabbit's Cool Air Swing, by Anonymous. Mr. Man, he had a fine garden. Br'er Rabbit, he visit Mr. Man's garden every day to destroy the latest thing in it. Twelve Mr. Man plumb wore out with old Br'er Rabbit. Mr. Man, he set a trap for old Br'er Rabbit down alongside the big road. One day, when Mr. Man going down the crossroads, he look in his trap and show enough, there old Br'er Rabbit. Mr. Man, he say, Oh, so old man, here you is. Now I'll have you for my dinner. Mr. Man, he takes a cord from his pocket and tie Br'er Rabbit high on a limb of a sweet gum tree, and he leave Br'er Rabbit swinging there till he come back from the crossroads, when he aimed to fotch Br'er Rabbit home and cook him for his dinner. Br'er Rabbit, he swing this away in the wind and that away, and he swing this away in the wind and that away in the wind, and he think he time done come. Poor old Br'er Rabbit don't know where he's at. Presently, here come Br'er Wolf loping down the big road. When Br'er Wolf see old Br'er Rabbit swinging this away and that away in the wind, Br'er Wolf, he stop short and he say, For the Lord, man! "'What you doing up there?' "'Br'er Rabbit, he say, "'This just my cool air swing. "'I just taken a swing this morning.' "'But Br'er Rabbit, he just know "'Br'er Wolf gonna make way with him. "'Br'er Rabbit, he just turn it over in his mind "'which way he gonna get to. "'The wind, it swing poor Br'er Rabbit "'way out this away and way out that away. "'While Br'er Rabbit swinging, "'he work his brain, too. "'Br'er Wolf, he say, Br'er Rabbit, I got you fast. Now I gon' eat you up. Br'er Rabbit, he say, Br'er Wolf, open your mouth and shut your eyes. I'll jump plum in your mouth. So Br'er Wolf turn his head up and shut his eyes. Br'er Rabbit, he feel in his pocket and take out some pepper. And Br'er Rabbit, he throw it plum down Br'er Wolf's throat. Br'er Wolf, he nigh about stracted with the misery. He cough and he roll in the dirt, and he get up and he strike out for home, coughing to beat all. And Br'er Rabbit, he swing this away and that away in the wind. Presently, here come Br'er Squirrel. When Br'er Squirrel, he see the wind swing Br'er Rabbit way out this away and way out that away, Br'er Squirrel be that astonished he stop short. Br'er Squirrel, he say, Oh, the Lord, Br'er Rabbit, what you done done yourself this year time? Br'er Rabbit, he say, this year my cool swing, Br'er Squirrel. I taken a fine swing this morning. And the wind, it swing Br'er Rabbit way out this away and way back that away. Br'er Rabbit, he fold his hands and look mighty restful and happy, like he's setting back fanning himself on his front porch. Br'er Squirrel, he say, Please, sir, Br'er Rabbit, let me try your swing one time. Br'er Rabbit, he say, Certainly, Br'er Squirrel, you do me proud. And Br'er Rabbit, he make like he make haste to turn himself loose. Presently, Br'er Rabbit, he say, Come up here, Br'er Squirrel, and give me a hand with this knot. And Br'er Squirrel, he make haste to go and turn Br'er Rabbit loose. And Br'er Rabbit, he make Br'er Squirrel fast to the cord. The wind, it swing Br'er Squirrel way out this away and way out that away, and Br'er Squirrel, he think it fine. Br'er Rabbit, he say, I go down to the spring to get a fresh drink. You can swing till I come back. Br'er Squirrel, he say, Take your time, Br'er Rabbit, take your time. Br'er Rabbit, he take his time and scratch out for home fast he can go, and he ain't caring how long Br'er Squirrel swing. Br'er Squirrel, he swing this way, and he swing that away, and he think it fine. Presently, here come Mr. Man. When Mr. Man, he see Br'er Squirrel, he plumb astonished. He say, Oh, so old man, 
I done hear uh, many a many of your fine tricks, but I never done hear yourself into a squirrel before. Powerful kind of you, Br'er Rabbit, to give me a fine squirrel dinner. Mr. Man, he take Br'er Squirrel home and cook him for dinner. End of chapter 10, part 15. Chapter 11, Part 1, Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Juliana Ginger. Junior Classics, Volume 2, Folk Tales and Myths by William Patton. Chapter 11. Three Stories of the Seasons. Part 1. The Four Seasons. There was not a pretty cottage on the borders of the forest than that which was the home of Claire and Laura. A beautiful rose tree clambered all over the little house, thrusting its clusters of small pink blossoms through the open windows and nodding to Claire as though to say, you are as sweet as we are, and the sun shines on us all. The roses did not nod their heads at Laura, for she was as ugly and wicked as Claire was lovely. Her face wore always a heavy frown, which her mother reflected, for Laura was her favorite child, and she could not bear to see that her second daughter, for whom she had no spark of love, should be so much the more attractive of the two. Dame Nature had been very kind to the little Claire. The roses had given their delicate colouring to her soft cheeks, and her pretty eyes were just the hue of a purple pansy. The red of the crimson berries that glinted among the evergreens when winter came was not more vivid than that of her lips, and her hair had the sheen of yellow corn when the sun is smiling on it. Laura could not look at her without a pang of envy, and longed to drive her away from home. One bitter day in winter, when a waste of snow surrounded the cottage and frozen icicles hung from the roof, Laura asked her mother if Claire might pick some violets in the woods for her. Violets? exclaimed the mother. At this time of the year? Why, you must be dreaming, child. There is not a single flower in all the forest. But Laura insisted that Claire should be sent to seek for the flowers, and loathed to refuse her anything. Her mother did as she was asked. Do not come back without them, or it will be the worst for you, Laura called from the doorway, as she watched her little sister go shiveringly down the pathway that led to the forest. In its depths, she knew, there lurked gaunt grey wolves, and these were fierce with hunger. Claire knew this too, and her heart was faint with fear as she passed through the grove of fir trees. A cheery little robin hopped down from one of the branches and sang a few bars of his winter song, as if to comfort her. She had gone but a few paces further when she saw the red of his breast repeated in a glimmer of ruddy light in the distance. She hastened towards it, and found it came from a huge fire, round which were sitting twelve strange men. The faces of all were kindly, but while three had long white beards and snowy garments, three had golden beards and long green garments, three had auburn beards and yellow garments, and yet another triplet with long black beards were dressed in violet. One of the three, whose hair was frosted, looked up as she approached. May I warm myself at the fire, kind sir? She asked him timidly, and making room for her at once, he asked her why she wandered in the forest in such bitter weather. I was sent to pluck violets for my sister, Claire explained, and I dare not go home without them or she would be very angry. 
At this, her questioner turned to one of the free men who were robed in purple. Violets are your concern, Brother May. Cannot you help the poor little thing? he asked. She will be frozen to death otherwise. For tonight, it will be colder than ever. To be sure I will, said Brother May, laying a gentle hand on Claire's fair hair, and taking the staff from the white-haired man, he poked the fire. This was the signal for a most marvellous change in the forest. Ice and snow disappeared, and the air became soft and balmy. Birds sang in the branches overhead, and flowers sprang up, as if by magic, round the path which Claire had trodden. She filled her hands with fragrant violets and thanked the brothers for their help. You are welcome, dear child, they cried, and the old man took back his staff again and in his turn poked the fire. Once more it was winter, and Claire hastened home to the cottage as quickly as she could. Both Laura and her mother were surprised to see her, for they had made sure that she would lose her way. Laura snatched at the violets only to toss them aside and was so unkind for the rest of the day that Claire sobbed herself to sleep. Next morning, she was again sent out in the snow. This time, it was to seek wild strawberries in the forest, and her sister's look was so full of meaning, as she said, do not come home without them, that the poor little maiden trembled with fear as well as with cold as she entered the gloomy wood. The same friendly robin fluttered across her path, and following the direction in which he flew, to her great delight, she saw again the ruddy glow of the fire. The twelve strange men were still seated round it, and Brother January took her by the hand. Why are you here again, poor child? He asked her gently. It would surely be wiser for you to stay at home while King Frost reigns over the land, for you are young and tender, and his grip is very cruel. I had to come, sir, Claire explained. My sister said she must have strawberries. We gathered some in June last year. Brother January turned to a companion dressed in flowing yellow. Strawberries are your concern, Brother June, he said. It is for you now to come to the aid of our little friend. I will do so with pleasure, said Brother June, taking the staff held out to him and giving the fire a vigorous poke. At this, the winter disappeared, the trees sprang into full leaf, and crimson berries were seen amidst the creeping tendrils of the strawberry plant. Claire gathered as much of the sweet fruit as she could carry, and once more thanked her friends with a grateful smile. You are welcome, they cried in chorus, and as Brother January took back his staff, the winter once more spread its mantle over the earth. Instead of being grateful for the delicious fruit that Claire had brought her, Laura was more vexed than ever to find she had not been eaten by wolves. Her mother, too, looked at the poor girl angrily and sent her out to the barn as if she could no longer bear the sight of her. Claire was barely awake next morning when she was told that she must go to the forest and bring home some apples for her sister Laura, who had a fancy for them. But it's so dark, dear mother, cried Claire in terror. Make haste and go, was the only answer. And as quickly as her numbed fingers would allow her, Claire finished her simple toilet and started on her way. The robin was still asleep, with his head tucked under his wing, but a tiny wood mouse poked out his head from his nest in the foot of a hollow tree as he heard her footsteps upon the frozen snow. If you walk straight on, you will find your friends, he squeaked, and Claire thankfully followed his directions. Before long, she was warming herself before the glowing fire, and the brothers were asking, with much sympathy, why she had again been sent to face the cold. Apples? cried Brother January, when she had told them. Ah, it's your concern now, Brother September. Forthwith, September poked the fire, and lo and behold, it was cheery autumn, 
and the ground was strong with crimson and russet leaves. A tree of wild apples, close beside her, was laden with fruit. Brother September turned to the child with a kindly smile. Gather two of them, he said. Claire picked two of the largest and finest, and when she had done so, September handed back his staff to January. He stirred the fire, and ice and snow reappeared. Laura made no effort to disguise her disappointment when Claire brought her the two apples. She ate them, however, and finding that their flavor most delicious, commanded her to fetch her hood and cloak. In spite of all that her mother could say to dissuade her, she declared that she would go to the forest and gather some for herself. I shall find a much finer one than those you brought me, you greedy creature, she said to Claire, as she flounced away, refusing her gentle offer to go with her. The sun shone brightly on the sparkling snow, and she took the same path that her sister had done. The robin glanced at her from his bright dark eyes, but he did not attempt to sing. He was frightened by something he saw in her face. It was the spirit of greed and envy. After wandering about for some time, and to her great disgust, finding nothing whatever in the way of fruit, Laura at last caught sight of the fire, with the twelve little men sitting round. Without a word of greeting, she pushed her way into their midst and held out her hands towards the glowing embers. What do you want? asked the brother January, somewhat nettled by her rude manners. Nothing from you, she answered roughly, scowling as she spoke. The old man poked the fire in silence, and the sky grew dark. A heavy snowstorm began to fall, and Laura tried in vain to make her way home again for the great flakes dropping silently one on another made the path she had come by impossible to tread. She stumbled at last into a great drift and soon was buried in its depths. Her mother grew more and more anxious about her as the day wore on, and when afternoon came, set out to seek her in the forest. She also found her way to the glowing fire, and pushing aside Brother January, just as her daughter had done, proceeded to warm her hands. When asked what she wanted, she gave the same rude answer with the same result. The old man poked the fire, and the snow fell swiftly and silently. Very soon she too was buried in a glistening bank, and Claire had neither mother nor sister left. With all their faults, she had loved them fondly, and it would have been lonely for her in the cottage now if it had not been for her friends of the forest. As each month of the year came round, one paid her a visit, bringing flowers of fruit or glorious crimson leaves. The white bearded men alone came empty-handed, but these sat with her beside the fire and told her wonderful stories of winter in many lands. In the course of time, she became a good and beautiful woman and wedded a prince from a distant shore. End of chapter 11, part 1